That's all for us. We'll start with the prayer and quickly go on to the academic questions. The prayer song, please. Audio bit
Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mr. Election. I doubt that uh, let me wish you all a warm, warm morning, morning for this wonderful uh, uh, pedicard is being organized by the, the primary of Dr. Radha Krishna and the basket of YMB, Dr. Arikir Bhaskar, Dr. Mokos Bhaskar and the host of other accreditations. So my so knowledge is very simple because, because I am not a candidate at the admission, so it's basically a general candidate. But it's, but it's a, a little, little burning topic, topic as you all know. In this increasing so many behavior issues, autism on the rise. So, so, so I'm so going to and see this fitting that we should talk about the, 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 the screen addiction and the skin tag. As you know, the screen addiction is a group of issues with negative issues. Which can happen with use of too much of technology. And if you cut off an access, TV, iPad, mobile phone, or internet, and the child is faced with violent and aggressive behavior. So, this is ideally the definition of screen addiction. And as you know, this is the screen subject of this world. So much so, so addicted to so that it's like a digital drug or a digital heroin. And the internet gaming, gaming addiction itself is a mental disorder. I'm sure you must have read about the how PUBG has claimed so many lives. Life. So, I'm sure uh, most of you must have seen this uh, video on the WhatsApp, WhatsApp which is viral. Uh, the audio, audio. As, as you can see in this video, uh, video it looks it as, looks as, as if it's looking real only. I'm saying it's real only, but you can see how everybody is glued to some screen or other. Everybody in the family, all the three generations are glued. So the screens have invaded our house so much that uh, it, it doesn't uh, differentiate between any generations. So what is screen addiction? And as I said, so the too much usage of uh, screens in a very compulsive way, and it is disrupting, uh, disrupting the social uh, relationship, impacting the physical health and emotional well-being. But uh, there are no definite uh, diagnostic criteria, but suffice to say that uh, the excessive craving for being on the screen and the tolerance, like a, the child is not satisfied with just spending 20 minutes on the screen or a internet or a social media. So they want more, only then they'll be satisfied. Likewise, the withdrawal. If you take away the screens, the children show negative changes in the behavior and they may land up in depression, anxiety, or even violent and all. So it's like a, the craving becomes a life, a vicious cycle they keep uh, demanding more and more and uh, difficult to wean them off from the screen. So what are the possible reasons for uh, the so much of screen time being spent by children and leading to screen addiction? Nowadays, the parents are not spending much time with the children and child has a lot of unsupervised time on his hands. And children have technology-based amusement, like, you know, the People. Now, uh, even uh, months babies are being uh, made to watch videos on YouTube like uh, the Peppa Pig and uh, a Little Kingdom and all, I'm sure the most of you are aware. And in fact, now it is so much so that uh, the hospitals do not uh, provide uh, TVs at all because everybody has a phone in their house and while you do on the round, while you go on the rounds, you see a child is glued to the phone itself while mother is also glued to her phone at, uh, by herself. So, and also, Parents think, or they feel very uh, proud that the, the children are uh, having a technical process of their uh, words. Because they are so tech savvy, they become, they feel pr pride. And this kind of media addiction may be associated with other disorders like attention de deficit hyperactive disorder, anxiety, and depression. And in fact, uh, see, uh, in my practice for the last at least five years, I've seen that you take away the screens, at least the 20-30% of symptoms of autism can be really improved and, uh, and made a significant difference in autism. So what is uh, the screen time or digital engaging time? Screens have become an integral part of our life and uh, screen time is the total sp time spent on the, in a day in viewing screens such as TV, mobile, tablet or any handheld device or visual device. And it's the excess screen time is the normal essential activities such as sleep, physical activities, study, family, meal, 
and hobby times is displaced due to screen time, then it is known as excess screen time. So what is the prevalence? There are a host of studies, and in fact, uh, done by even the PGs also from uh, Chalameda Medical College and all. The studies across the world show that under five years, the screen addiction in high income group is as much as 10 to 90 percent. Whereas middle income groups, it's 21 to 90 percent in the middle income group countries. If you look at Australia, 40 percent of children below 18 months of age had a screen time greater than two hours per day, below two years, that is below 18 months. In a study from UK, you see, Children younger than one year had a screen exposure, which is as much as more than one hour per day at 14 months and more than two hours at 30 months of age. Excuse me. There are not many studies from India, but uh, there's a study from uh, <coughs> UCMS Middle College as well as Tej Bahadur Hospital done by the studies from India show the similar figures. One second. Uh, this is a study that has been done from Delhi, Tej Bahadur Hospital, as well as University of College of Medical and Research. And the conclusion from these studies are that most of the parents are not concerned with the screen, uh, children's screen time at all. And almost all young children are exposed to screen by 18 months of age. They've done a study in the 369 children uh, till 18 months of age. So uh, from a immunization clinic or well baby clinic, that's an ideal time where you can catch these uh, parents and children. And also the screen exposure to screen-based media is almost universal in an un un uh, urban setting in the total age group. And the surprising fact, as I told you, majority of the parents are not concerned that the children are spending excessive time on the screen. So what are the harmful effects of screen time? You're all well aware, let me just summarize. The deleterious effects on physical and mental health, scholastic and uh, social development, it leads to obesity by various, various means, as you all know, that the, because by being couch potatoes, they eat lot, they snack a lot, and also the ads which are they are exposed to, they end up uh, ordering more food and keep uh, eating more food, and no physical activity. Sleep disturbance. So ideally, if you switch, switch off the screen one hour before screen bedtime, may at least prevent sleep disturbances. The postural effects and visual disturbances, cognitive impairment, and body image perception and emotional disorders also. The screen addiction leads to drug and substance abuse. So these are all the deleterious effects. What about social media? Ideally, you know, social media is not recommended below 13 years of age. So it's not our pediatric age group because the children are not mentally ready to use the social media such as Facebook, Instagram, and other things. So I'm not going to go into the details of what are the disadvantages because they are not recommended. So strict no for social media below 13 years of age. Having talked about uh, the deleterious effects, let us talk about the beneficial effects. Uh, anything that can be in excess is dangerous. So anything that you can use in moderation can be really beneficial. In a healthy way, the screen usage has many benefits. It encourages learning and knowledge. It acts as a tool for uh, communicating with friends and family and promotes social interaction. Healthy co-viewing and using digital platforms with the uh, in the midst of, with the, with the help of parents, can really promote bonding, recreation, relaxation. So co-playing and co-viewing with the parents is definitely useful. And also digital media devices can promote social connections and interactions. So particularly in children and adolescents, if you use digital media properly, having a proper digital rules, it can really promote positive emotions and moral values. And as I said, the healthy behaviors, as well as it can even uh, counter the undesirable effects of excessive media. Also. 
So let's, as I said, the technology literacy without screen addiction. So media can really help us to become tech savvy and also help our learning. And uh, so if you introduce a child to learning apps, which are interactive instead of the one-way traffic, that is passive watching time. And they use gadgets to read books whose physical versions are not available. They can be used to learn new hobbies like yoga, music, painting. The COVID has brought in where you can have online classes for music, yoga, and other uh, the games and their hobbies. And the school children can really use the for research purposes to complete the school project. And also the, the proper usage of media can be used for journaling as well as diary writing as well. During COVID, you saw guidelines for our teleconsultation, likewise, they issued guidelines for online classes, but everything was online. Like, so every child suddenly went online. So, but uh, to control this, the Ministry of uh, Information Broadcasting in the, with the association with the NCRT, they issued some guidelines which are known as uh, Pragyata guidelines. In that they mentioned the pre-primary children should not be made to sit in front of the screen for more than 30 minutes. And children of one to eight class, only two sessions of 30 to 45 minutes. However, beyond nine, uh, the ninth class and up to 12th class, they can have four sessions of 30 to 45 minutes. So these were the guidelines that were used, but luckily after these two years of hiatus, the schools have opened, now back to normal. So how to break screen addiction in kids? Thinking, uh, keeping uh, the rampant obesity and uh, lack of physical activity in mind, the WHO has issued some guidelines as part of the global action plan. They clearly mentioned that no sedentary screen time for below one year of children. However, occasional video calling with the family members is allowed. That is what IAP as well as even WHO mentioned. And screen exposure of less than one hour per day in uh, two to five year olds. In fact, the lesser the better. Or if you eliminate further, if you eliminate screen time altogether below five years, it will lead to healthy adults. And as I said, infants should not be on the screen at all. As I said, limiting or totally eliminating screen below five years can lead make them into healthier adults. So WHO has clearly issued guidelines. IUP also issued, I'll come back to, I'll come to the IUP guidelines. But how to balance this? So balance the, the screen time with the other healthy activities such as reading books, games and sports, and other outdoor activities. There's a seven step plan to break the screen addiction, but the bottom line is you get the children to spend more outdoor in the park with the peer groups, with the interactive things. I always tell parents to bring the children the way their, their parents brought their, ch their children. So the traditional way. And uh, once again, with so much of online classes and every child is glued to laptop, so this syndrome, as you know, computer vision syndrome is there. There's a simple rule how to break this computer vision syndrome, that rule of 2020. Like use the laptop at a time for 20 minutes and uh, take break, breaks of 20 seconds and also look behind 20 feet uh, between uh, using the screen. So this all can help reduce the, the visual effects or the computer vision syndrome. Once you encourage the media for education purpose and uh, it will promote physical activity and also it creates uh, recreation and also chill, child becomes interactive. We should develop what is known as digital free zones in the household, like in the bedroom, no screens, no phones in the bedroom, dining table, kitchen, bathroom, or even motorized vehicles. So no phone, no, no family member should use gadgets in these places. Likewise, we need to have a digital fasting time. A digital fasting time is maybe before bedtime where no family member uses the screen. And that time should be used for family bond bonding, like at the dining table or before bedtime. And as parents, as pediatricians, we should be role model to have a healthy media and also formulate a family media plan. 
So unless you become a role model for them, so it's not going to achieve the results you like. So the, the pediatrician himself is preaching, teacher himself is preaching, but they're not following it. So we need to have a good example. CDC, the Center for Disease Control, also issues guidelines in various age groups. There are more or less on the parallel lines of WHO recommendations. And uh, the screen time of more than six hours, the deleterious effects are so many that so many studies have proven. So how to supplement that by outdoor activities, by play, by interactive games. Our own uh, Indian Psychiatric Society also has come out with recommendations. They are almost similar, except that the adult guidance or monitoring is very much preferred. And uh, so uh, the screen should be used for educational purposes and for the games. And ideally, no screen time one hour before the bed. And no devices in the bedroom. For children 5 and 18 years also, they said, the time monitoring is important, the screen monitoring. And also, they said that the gadgets should be used in the common area, the living area, than in the children's bedroom. With proper parental control, software and control filter, and also safeguarding your PIN and passwords can definitely help in children going to the wrong website and getting trapped or getting uh, uh, subjected to cyberbullying and all. So these are the guidelines issued by Indian Psychological uh, Psychiatric Society. Finally, the, the IAP recommendations. IAP has formulated an action group. They have come out with various guidelines. Uh, they said, avoid the use of digital devices in children below two years, likewise, uh, the, like WHO. Uh, healthy media usage can promote learning, creativity, social interaction, and holistic wellness. Unhealthy media usage, it affects physical, psychological, social, and academic well-being of a child. They implement digital rules as we discussed, the digital hygiene, and nurture responsible digital citizenship. If a child is subjected to addiction, consult a medical health professional, uh, the professional at the earliest possible time while detecting the red flag signs. And you should act as a pediatrician, every pediatrician should act as a role model for LD media usage. So finally, the, what are the key messages? Gone are the days when only silver screen was the screen. Nowadays, we have, thanks to the advent of IT technology, we have TV, cell, uh, handheld devices, video consoles, and whatnot. So all this have become an integral part of everybody's life. Any child compulsively using social uh, the media despite which, which affects academic as well as social well-being is screen addiction. Excessive screen time at any age is very deleterious for the physical, psychological, and scholastic development of a child, and particularly below two years. And limiting screen time as per WHO as well as IAP guidelines is very essential. The, the beneficial effects with judicious use are many, and we should take advantage of them. And I feel the prevention of cybercrime impacting children is very essential by the parents. Every pediatrician, pediatrician should pledge to spend time in educating parents, teachers, about excessive screen time effects. So, friends, families should ensure warm, nurturing, supportive, fun-filled, secure environment at home. This should be the goal. And also, one should monitor the children's screen usage to ensure that the content being watched is not harmful, age-appropriate, and non-violent, and largely educational in nature. Families and schools, pediatricians, should be educated regarding the importance of regarding, uh, regarding the screen exposure, as well as ensure digital wellness at any cost. So this should be the goal. Thank you for uh, parental, I mean, for your attentive listening to me. Uh, I thank the organizer for giving me a chance to be the first speaker. Thank you all. Dr. Arjun, it was an excellent uh, when we do rounds in our ward, I think earlier, we, uh, you know, five years, 10 years ago, we used to see a lot of toys on the patient bed. 
are you seeing any toys nowadays and less as you said uh, one one and a half year baby also now knows how to use youtube and how to play the cartoons and how how do you address this absolutely uh, when i began my hospital i used to have a televisions but subsequently with the advent of cell phones now everybody cell phone on the bed i have removed the televisions at the same time while i find uh, the phones in the hands of the children i always educate parents spend time in telling them and especially now i'm sure most of you are seeing so much of rampant autism almost uh, two cases per week i'm seeing uh, autism cases and most of them are so much addicted to cell phones another point i've seen is the nras they hand over their children to the parents who are in india and uh, in fact they are not so well versed about uh, the harmful effects of uh, screen so they think uh, they are becoming very tech savvy and also uh, they can talk to their parents on the whatsapp video call and all that they feel i said they, they take pride in that they are, they are developing so well so Probably that is where we need to educate the, the parents counsel the parents a lot thank you sir thank you sir sir we have took up a very good and interesting topic it's like an iceberg phenomena this problem is iceberg phenomena you are seeing the tip and yet to come and you have uh, rightly addressed iap and who is uh, uh, at the right time they have taken steps and uh, recommended for the uh, uh, prevention and uh, uh, decreasing this effects uh, because less than 2 years the development of a child uh, in the brain and other aspects is very important so thank you sir with this uh, i would like to call upon uh, the next speaker thank you very much dr neelam mohan thank you sir i think i set a trend by finishing before time before the buzzer dr neelam mohan is a well known uh, pediatrician she is specialized uh, di director pediatrics hod pediatrics in gastroenterology and hepatology and liver transplantation medanta city gurgaon and uh, she is uh, she has uh, won a bc rai national award by she took the honors by president of india and she has been named in forbes magazine and she is advisor for pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana advisor of uh, nb national board of examinations and she has got many more laurels and awards and rightly right now she is holding a post of uh, president uh, child society and uh, she was a executive member for central iip 2020 hello one more thing i want to say about dr neelam she is uh, telangana beti hai hyderabad yeah, beti she I is 2 years she is 2 years junior to me she is from usmania medical college <laughs> over to you dr neelam thank you so that's my introduction i'm a hyderabadi girl people say that you've not changed your language slight is that beach mein aayega ya udhar aayega okay so you've not changed your language i still speak hyderabadi kai ko how and everybody in north india they keep wondering that 30 years she couldn't change so i think i won't change hyderabad is a brand in itself uh, so it's a very interesting topic that they've given me which is called the liver function test now when we though we say liver function i think when we say lft the first thing that comes to our mind is bilirubin uh, liver enzymes and ggt these are the things that would come so it should have been actually liver chemistry test because when you say liver function you are seeing the function through so many other ways you are also seeing hida scan or radiology and all but we don't include that in assessing liver function so i think this should have been called as a liver chemistry test rather than liver function test so when uh, when we talk about slides chilling kya slides 30 seconds so when we talk about the liver function test what i would like to divide it into is the synthetic function so synthetic function is prothrombin time albumin and also a bit of bilirubin then we talk about the cholestasis part so in the cholestasis part we talk about alkaline phosphatase and gamma tt then we talk about the hepatocellular function that is going to be ast and alt and then sometime we talk about the anionic uh, there so like the drug metabolism and all so there again bilirubin will come 
and the bilacids. So these are the anionic transport part that we would like to talk. So that was greetings from my institute. I'm happy to share that I've still the talk time of Bala, and I've stilled the position and role of Bala too. I become the head of pediatrics at Medanta the Medicity. So not only that I established the first department there of peat gastro hepato and liver transplants, and we've done like 400 and plus liver transplants in small children with an overall of 4,000 transplants in. Uh, we have been the pioneers in transplant and all over India subsequently our students and young moved on to different places. So let's see how I take the role of developing uh, the entire pediatrics and other specialities. And I just took over from April 22. So this is just trying to tell you when you love somebody, you will have very rarely say dil ka tukra. You in Hindi, we say jigar ka tukra. That means you really love that person because liver is a very important organ. So as you can see, it's the largest organ, a lot of chemical reaction, 500, 160 proteins. But we are most interested in the clotting factors. It stores sugar and metabolizes and detoxifies and synthesizes. So you've seen children who are dark colored when the liver gets back. So whatever you, you know, it has an impact on your skin too. So I've already talked about the liver function test and there should be, I've already said that I would like to divide it into four, the parenchyma, hepatic synthetic, bile duct uh, obstruction of cholestasis, and ionic transport, which includes bile acid, visit, bilirubin. So when I talk about this synthetic function, the three important thing will be albumin, prothrombin time, and bilirubin. Usually, we will restrict it classically when we are tracing synthetic function in a patient who's a CLD and I want to know uh, is it decompensating or an acute liver failure. So we look at these two. And how do you differentiate? In albumin, there is one. Only in children, you will see even in acute viral hepatitis A, the albumin may go down a bit. And you might see myelocytes in 20%, which you won't see in adults. You will only see a cytis, you will have an underlying liver disease, dengue, etc. So though the half-life, we say, is 20 days, the issue is the albumin, either you're not taking so malnutrition or liver, or you're losing through gut or kidney, or there is increased volume of dist uh, a distribution. Like I said, even in acute viral hepatitis, you might find in some patients low albumin anasitis. So there is a little increased volume of distribution in them. And of course, when there is increased turnover, uh, you know, patients with steroids, burns, et cetera, you might lose your albumin. So in liver disease, usually we talk about CLD, cirrhosis, or ascites, which I just mentioned, that because of the load due to increased volume of dist uh, distribution, you might see in them. And maybe some of them are a bit malnourished, and that's why you tend to see lower albumin even in acute viral hepatitis. Now, prothrombin time is uh, like uh, in, in North India, we say, sari khudai ek taraf, joruga bhai ek taraf. That means when you see a people, your wife's brother, give most importance to him. Similarly, in the liver function, and uh, we give a lot of importance to prothrombin time. If you try to tell my enzymes are 8,000, the first thing I want to know is, what's the prothrombin time? If you say the prothrombin time is 1.1, like I'm relaxed, you, I don't think you're into failure. So very important prothrombin time just gives me an idea whether the synthetic function is gone. If the synthetic function is gone, of course, post vitamin K, then I am dealing with liver failure or deranged, uh, you know, there is extra load and the liver is not able to handle. Definition of liver failure is more than 1.5 with encephalopathy or more than two even without encephalopathy. So 
what we will be interested in is not the bilirubin and enzyme, but also the there. So you will never take a patient for transplant with 19 bilirubin and 16,000 ASD, but normal INR. You will only take a patient when the INR gets bad. And so therefore, the, all the clotting factors and factor seven is the shortest with six hours. And that is why whenever you give FFP, you wait for some time before you check your this. So we always give vitamin K before we proceed it. And sometimes you should remember that those who've had massive transfusion, road traffic accidents, et cetera, and you've given any surgery, and you're called for a visit uh, because the prothrombin time is deranged. And they think that, are you losing your liver? And so in that case, you remember, massive transfusion itself can give rise to, so that earlier on, we used to say that for significant pack cell transfusion, you should give some amount of FFP and some amount of platelets. That 531 ratio is gone, but we look at the reports and then we plan it accordingly. Then uh, uh, this we've talked about there. And then suppose it's a chronic liver disease, like say biliary atresia and cirrhosis. In that patient, uh, every time I may not decide to do a transplant based on the prothrombin type. You can have portal hypertension giving rise to need for decompensation, high bilirubin more than six, we say that it is decompensated. But any CLD patient, uh, even in an adult alcohol or a child, if the prothrombin time starts getting bad, that is the time there is no reserve left. Do not waste much of a time. That child will need liver transplant quicker, even in a cirrhotic patient. So hepatocyte injury is the enzymes. Simple two things I want to say. AST is produced in every other whole list of organs besides liver. So just looking at SGOT doesn't matter because it can come from kidneys. A kidney failure patient can also have, or the cardiac. Pan pancreatitis also you might get raised. And all the, uh, these. But when it comes to SGPT, that is only in the cytosol. And this is both in cytosol and mitochondria. Therefore, this will be there. So for us, that is very specific when we see there. But then sometimes, you remember, the half time of SGOT is shorter. So if you have a patient of acute hepatitis, you don't want to actually uh, do everyday SGPT. You want to see, is he improving? I see first SGOT. So SGOT falls first rises first and also falls first. So to see the trend, I would like to see SGOT rather than PT. Go and look at all your patients. OT drops faster than PT. So uh, the ratio, we all know that the uh, AST is more than ALT, and uh, the ALT is more, so the ratio is less than one. So this simple classification for teaching students Harrison's classification, whatever you may call, when less than three times is mild, three to 20 times is moderate, more than 20 times is uh, massive, sorry. Uh, sorry, that slide didn't come. So what happens is, this is very important for you to, especially in teaching purposes, somebody comes to me with an enzyme of I will think and trick with the chill. Lot more than 20 times of the normal. So that gives you a very good idea how to proceed with that. And as I said, most of the time, OT is more than PT and the ratio is less than one. But when is the ratio more than one? In adults, alcohol typically. But for teaching purposes for students, even if they say three, that is uh, Wilson's disease, because as I said, 
the uh, it has an effect on the erythrocytes, kidney, etc. So that's how it will have. And fulminant vulcans is a classic uh, uh, example where your the ratio is more than four. OT is much much higher than SGPT. Isolated raised enzyme is when you should think even of muscular dystrophy. There was a child referred to me uh, from Gujarat side. In fact, an adult had referred me this with raised enzyme. And I noticed only OT was predominantly raised. And like a typical pediatrician, we love to strip them and make them look at their calves. The calf was hypertrophied. So Duchenne's it was because the Gover's sign was positive. So sometimes you need to understand that, to me, I see the whole world through the liver. Even if I diagnose brucellosis or anything, I go through the liver's eye and I see it. So it's the way you look at things. And because I think the liver speaks a lot about all illnesses, and that's how I look at things. So when we talk about uh, the cholestatic part, is this three which we say, Usually, alkaline phosphatase has other sources, but GGT is very specific for liver. So we made you all now look into GGT because that is the one which is secreted by the bile ducts. So I'm interested in GGT as the synthetic function. Most of the time, it is increased uh, in all uh, cholestatic disorders like atresia, gallstones, etc. Very few conditions, it is decreased. Synthetic disorders and PFIC, when it is, these are the condition where it is decreased. Bilirubin, we all know, unconjugated, we keep talking about. Conjugated is through hepatocellular dysfunction or biliary obstruction. I'll give you some cases. So I'll highlight now liver enzymes, they lack specificity and sensitivity, but yet. If you look at them carefully, they do speak a lot. But you need, I, in the sense, you have to put the clinical situation and all, and then get. So ALT is very specific for hepatocellular injury. And uh, AST is there in, so, in the mitochondria and the cytosol. And it can be through so many other organs it can be raised. And both of them together do give a lot of information about hepatic dysfunction. The ratio is usually less than one. And if it is more than one, you should think of cirrhosis, ischemia, Wilson's, alcoholic disease. GGT is always increased in cholestasis. It is reduced only in very few conditions like PFIC or synthetic. Synthetic function is assessed by albumin and prothrombin. Prothrombin is more specific and has a better prognostic value than albumin. And in a setting of underlying liver disease, worsening of prothrombin time is suggestive of decompensation. Let's rock with answers now. So eight years, fever, vomiting, pain, abdomen, decreased appetite, jaundice three to four days. Uh, what does this clinical situation look like? Fever, pain, jaundice. What could be the DDs clinically? No enzyme. Sorry? So viral hepatitis, you thought. So now I'm just giving you, uh, liver was enlarged, spleen just palpable, enzymes with 3,000. So that's fine. Looks like a viral hepatitis, classic as you thought. Same scenario. Fever, vomiting, pain abdomen, jaundice, same liver, spleen. So we should think of viral hepatitis. But now I'm saying enzyme is this, which is three to 10 times. So what will you think? Will I think of viral hepatitis in this? Right, so I'll think of enteric, whatever, dengue, malaria, all Bala's favorite. All those kit will come into this, because so what the clinical situation was same, liver was also enlarged same, but the enzyme spoke to you. You immediately decided to decide to send your viral marker, or you decided here not to spend your money on hepatitis A, E, etc. You want to spend your money on looking for enteric, malaria, dengue, viral, depending on whichever situation this uh, should be, and this was a blood culture proven enteric fever. Three years old girl, same situations I'm giving. 
fever, uh, this thing, and then jaundice one day. But now what is very important, I want to take you to history. History is very important. You never asked me in the previous two patients. Here, there was past history of two times raised. So your attitude changes towards that child. You will just not think viral hepatitis or that, because past history also, there was twice raised, which sadly was missed by the pediatrician. Same pediatrician, they went twice. So first, it was 150, 190 with bilirubin. Then uh, I'm giving you three years, yeah. So that was the trend. The patient went in 2007, and he was diagnosed as some non-specific viral because AE everything was negative. Then he was diagnosed as paracetamol induced. So my message here is, if you see a second time raised enzyme, with, without you understanding all viral markers are negative, what should you think? What should you think? And underlying liver disease, chronic liver disease, they may present you with hepatitis, like classically autoimmune hepatitis. So when do you suspect underlying liver disease? Family history, past history, firm liver, splenomegaly, more than three centimeters, clubbing, wasting, this thing. Uh, so these are all the markers. And in this, the history. She had twice history, which we could not explain. I should not look into viral, uh, drug-induced, paracetamol. No, 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 no. I should spend money in looking at underlying liver disease and did autoimmune markers or Wilson disease screening, autoimmune was positive, biopsy proven, treated with steroids for autoimmune. So what did, again, the liver enzyme spoke, but with a history. Individually, you could have said it could be viral, it could be that. So that is very important. This is a classic case where you see your it's sleeping two thing, days sir. history. So I have just one minute. Even the go. most essential things for the life, like Water, yeah. if you are taking in large quantities, can cause hyponatremia and you can die of even drinking a lot of water in small... Is somebody stomach. talking to me? Similarly, we all know oh, hyperbaric so oxygen. oxygen. So, is in this case, for the life. only one thing, the prothrombin, the prothrombin so, time. The prothrombin time was increased. Everything is poisonous, it all depends so on how much you are taking. So, because of that, you diagnosed it, it as... Yeah. It's the last case, I have 50 seconds to go. So same scenario, same fever, jaundice, everything same I'm giving you, but here I am showing you INR deranged. If your INR is deranged, you will not just simple say viral hepatitis they're giving you, you are on fire, it is liver failure. So this markers were negative, it turned out to be Wilson's, and whenever you have Wilson's with deranged INR and liver failure, Majority do not improve without transplant. So this child had liver transplant. This is the old slides I'm taking out. We finished 400 now. So metabolic is 30% of our total transplant. And in the metabolic in India, Wilson's is the, the first case of liver failure that I did, or is the first liver failure in India is a child of Wilson's disease, who's now a handsome boy. 17 years plus post-transplant. So we have a lot of milestones that we achieved uh, by the grace of God globally also. A uh, lot of first in global level and a lot of first in India level. We were the first one to do cadaveric, first to do liver failures, first to do ABO incompatible, first to do swap, first to do hepatopulmonary syndrome, etc. There are a lot of challenges in small babies and that's my USP doing transplants in less than 6 kgs with a success rate of 90%. Uh, it drains you out because it takes a lot of time to work on small children. But at the end of the day, my children have produced children. So that's really a nice thing that we have come a long way. And I would like to just sum up by saying, uh, yeah, so that way the highlights we gave the... Thank you so much for having me over. It was really a pleasure. Hope my simple short messages 
would be useful in clinical practice. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neela Mohan. So the topic is very uh, interesting and challenging because no single test can tell the complete function of a liver. You need a battery of tests. So you made it uh, uh, understand the, from the basic to clinical scenarios within a short time. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, we in Telangana, we did one niche, uh, for niche in Rome, we did a liver transplantation recently, last week. Uh, it was a fourth case. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Dr. Uh, Vamsi and Dr. Uh, Lakshman, sir. Uh, now I request uh, doc, uh, Dr. Y. V. Rao from Kamam and Dr. K. V. Rao to chair the next session. The next topic is MISC Mimics by Dr. S. Balasubramanyam. I request Dr. S. Balasubramanian, sir, to come to the dais. I request. Next speaker, Dr. Subramanian Garu. Uh, he is well known. <coughs> Dr. Balasubramanian uh, is a senior consultant pediatrician and a course coordinator in IAP, IDC, and PID fellowship, Kanchi Kamakoti Children's Trust Hospital and is an honorary pediatrician, South Southern Railway Headquarters Hospital, Chennai. Thank you, sir. Uh, a very good morning to friends of the Central Zone. Uh, the topic today is not a burning topic, but it was a burning very much a few months ago and last year and the previous year. But I'm not sure whether it's going to be a bur uh, burning topic again. In the next 15 to 18 minutes, what I plan to do is to just talk about the definition of MISI, the fallacies in the diagnosis of MISI, and the challenges. I'm going to discuss with you a few case scenarios which we had, where we made a diagnosis of MISI and we were wrong and also share with you briefly our own data from our hospital, from a study which we have completed on Missy Mimics and we are about to publish. And I'll end up my talk with the difficulties I face, you are likely to face, which are futuristic you. If you look at the definition of Missy, this is actually called PIMS-TS by the Europeans first, then the Americans called it Missy, the WHO called it Missy, Namakarna was changing. And each of them gave a definition. If you look at the definition, you know it's a multi-system disease. It's like Kawasaki. It doesn't have any specific diagnostic clinical feature. Single feature is not there. No single test is available to confirm Missy. It's a beautiful clinical diagnosis, like for clinicians like me, I like diagnosing Missy because I am proud that I am a clinician who is making a diagnosis with some lab support. Supportive features only are there in the laboratory. If you see, the problems in the diagnosis is that any fever more than 24 hours, you know, in the midst of COVID pandemic, you start suspecting Missy. And any inflammation, you know, CRP going up, ESR going up, you're going to start thinking of Missy. And more than two organs involved, lungs, abdomen, CNS, renal, two or more, or two more than two are involved, you're going to start thinking of Missy. And the definition says no other plausible diagnosis. How do I rule out all the other conditions which mimic Missy? And to confuse you, they tell you if there is a positivity of the antibody or PCR positivity, you can diagnose Missy. That is where the problem occurs. Let me share with you one of the cases we had. This is a five-year-old child in the midst of COVID pandemic, Missy pandemic. We have seen 200 cases in the last two years. So imagine our index, my PG first diagnosis Missy rather than measles. 
if there is a rash today. That is the awareness today. So five days fever in a five-year-old child, both parents had COVID, who has not had COVID, including many in the audience, including me, in the last three years. Toxic, spleen tip, total count 4,400, outside pediatrician does, P60, L40, E0, CRP50. Immediately referred, sir, this is Missy, parents had COVID two months back. COVID antibody, the practitioner has done, positive, PCR negative. And my PG has already diagnosed Missy. Sir, shall I start IVIG? Shall I start methyl prednisolone? He calls me in the middle of the night. Looking at the scenario, no, child is not toxic. Spleen is palpable. And see here, eosinopenia is there, leukopenia is there. CRP is not very high. 50 doesn't frighten me. Is this Missy at all? So, blood culture, next morning, Back tech, my microbiologist tells me gram negative bacilli, enteric fever, no IVIG given, no steroids given, septraxone, child settled down. This is a typical scenario which has happened more than 10 times in the last six months. It is not, it is an enteric fever mimicking Missy. Case two, two year old child, four days, rash on th the day three, and diffuse erythematous rash. The moment you see fever with rash, other than HFMD today, we all start thinking of Missy. Entire family had COVID three months back. Toxic, liver and spleen palpable, total count 18,000, polymorph 90, platelets 80,000. CRP was around 80, SGPT 400, CRP 80, COVID antibody again done positive. PCR negative. Is it Missy? And the outside practitioner has also done D-dimer 10,000. Ferritin he has done 1,000. Missy, diagnosis made, referred. Prednisolone already started. About to start IVIG. At that point, my junior most resident calls me in the morning, 4 o'clock. Sir, there is an SCR there, sir. This is not Missy, sir. This is Cryptyphus. And doxycycline, 24 hours, no IVIG, no steroids, child is well. Again, everything looked like Missy, isn't it? High CRP, COVID antibody positive, family history of COVID, etc. The biggest problem in the diagnosis is that there, the definition says no obvious other microbial cause of inflammation, including bacterial sepsis. And in the West, toxic shock syndrome is a common DD. In India, we have not seen many cases. We have seen only one case in, during the Missy epidemic. And you see here what literature says. They have reported dengue mimicking Missy. Dengue. We have seen dengue with CRP of 50, 60. We have seen dengue with D-dimers of 20,000. Every disease has D-dimers of 10,000, 20,000. We were not doing D-dimers. Now we have started doing D-dimer. D-dimer tells you where blood vessel is inflamed. It can get inflamed in any damn infection, not only in Missy or COVID. And they reported a series of cases of appendicitis in the West. They opened up. Thinking it is appendicitis, it turned out to be Missy. Both sides had been reported. Current scenario, we tend to depend on COVID antibody, make a wrong diagnosis of Missy. And as the prevalence of antibody positivity goes up from 70 to 90 percent, now it must be somewhere around 90 percent in the uh, pediatric community in India. You know, if you make a diagnosis only on COVID antibody, every fever is missy today. That is a problem. So to solve the problem, we went ahead and did the retrospective study. How did we plan it? At the time of admission, two senior pediatricians were asked to give a diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, where it could be missy. And we took all the cases and we followed them up. We did all the investigations and we did bacterial cultures, Krupp typhus IgM, dengue, NS1 IgM, ultrasound abdomen for appendicitis, echo, and Missy workup. And we analyzed these cases. The data was very interesting. And this is from one month to 18 years of age, 205 cases. Missy mimics at the end. Final diagnosis made by two senior pediatricians after looking at everything. 
and we excluded BC with bacteriological proof in the, or the viral, virological proof in the other cases of BC mimic or histopathological proof of appendicitis in those children who were operated. So we had 135 cases, Missy was 64 and Missy mimics were 71. And we analyzed, what did he find? Amongst the Missy mimics, majority were enteric fever, typhoid fever mimics Missy today. Scrub typhus, viral illness, dengue can mimic, appendicitis is the commonest mimicker of Missy and vice versa, abdominal pain mimics appendicitis in Missy. And you look at the age difference. In the age, what we found was that children who had Missy probably belonged to a higher age group when compared to children who had Missy mimics. And we found several rashes in those children, erythema, rickettsial rashes, and you know, HFMD, Coxsackie viral infection, chikungunya rash, all these we had in this series. So any rash which was present, you had to be careful in making a diagnosis of Missy. You had to think of other conditions. And if you see the clinical features, one thing that was obvious was that if you have a rash, if you have a rash, the possibility of Missy is higher higher, particularly the child is toxic. If you have hepatomegaly, Missy is unlikely. Most of those children who had hepatomegaly or hepatosmegaly had Missy mimic rather than Missy. Organomegaly was not common at all in our series. That's well reported. If you have hemodynamic disturbance, shock, it favors the presence of Missy rather than a non-Missy illness. It is very rare for a child except dengue with uh, uh, enteric fever or scrub typhus to present with shock. That is more often seen in Missy. Coming to the cardiovascular system findings, we did echo for all these cases. Wherever we found the LV dysfunction, LV dysfunction or minimal pericardial effusion, Missy was more likely. If you have a normal echo, normal echo with all the other features of infection, Missy is unlikely. That is what we found. Fortunately, in our series, there is no coronary involvement. Look at this data of differences in the lab parameters. This is very, very important slide. Here, CRP. You see here, if you find a CRP today in India, a child having CRP in whom you don't have a diagnosis, if you suspect Missy, if the CRP is more than 100, it has got very good specificity. Okay, if the CRP is more than 100 today, infection is less likely than Missy. On the other hand, if you have a leukopenia, leukopenia, again, leukopenia is very unusual in Missy. Leukocytosis is more common. Thrombocytopenia, again, unusual. Thrombocytosis, 14% had. Low albumin, Dr. Neelam was telling. Albumin being low, sodium being low, again, Missy is more likely. Coming to the other features, we saw the literature series of several cases. The same series of findings have been observed. And the other conclusions we had from this study was that if you have hepatosplenomegaly, if you have a CRP less than 100 milligram per liter, and if you have leukopenia, this triad, if it is present, Missy is extremely unlikely. You will have to start thinking of viral infection or a typhoid. Similarly, if you have shock or hemodynamic disturbance, if you have a rash, or if you have LV dysfunction, particularly if the CRP is more than 100, BC is a likely diagnosis. Recently, in the Arcasa disease, there is a beautiful letter written by a pediatrician criticizing the entire definition of Missy. What did she write? This Missy antibody test as a criteria for diagnosis of Missy is not correct. And the author says that a positive COVID test that means antibody test, should not be included in the Missy definition. This causes more of 
confusion. I think this is a very right statement. That is what we found. In fact, all these cases, all of them are antibody positive, both the Missy mimics and the Missy cases. And there are several gray areas in the diagnosis of Missy which we must be beware of. Number one, the weakest link is antibody. It's a waste of money. In fact, I have known doctors who have carried out antibody tests on themselves and their family members more than seven, eight times with different reports, before vaccine, after vaccine, before disease, after disease. It's a waste of money, absolute waste of money. It only tells you that you have had exposure to the infection. It doesn't have any diagnostic value at all. Antibodies test should be stopped by practitioners today in the midst of COVID and the Missy pandemic. In a country like India, even today, with decline in the incidence of uh, 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 Miss C and COVID-19, I think tropical infections, they will continue to remain and cause confusion. And there have been many instances where people have made an erroneous diagnosis of febrile inflammatory state. Fortunately, the term has been removed. What happened? There are a few children who look like having Missy, who continue to have fever, who continue to have high CRP, and they labeled it as febrile inflammatory state. And many a pediatrician administers steroids for those cases. That's a dangerous diagnosis. In fact, Wittaker in the first series of PIMS TS from Europe, she reported that 22% of all Missy recovered spontaneously without any treatment. In, even in our own series of 200 cases of Missy, six children, we diagnosed Missy, but we didn't give any medicine because children became all right the very next day. All was needed was follow-up and an echo diagnosis and echo follow-up for six, two weeks and six weeks and three months. That's all we did. No steroids were given. And the other gray area, giving steroids to somebody with entry fever, without antibiotic, giving immunoglobulin to somebody with fever, with scrub typhus, or viral infection, that may be dangerous. It may end up resulting in perforation or secondary bacterial infection. IVIG is expensive. In fact, we are waiting for the recent trial comparing IVIG and steroids. I, I'm told that steroids have been found to be as good as IVIG. Costly IVIG may be preserved. And in fact, me, along with Professor Ramanan, a British rheumatologist of Indian origin, we wrote in the Lancet Rheumatology Journal a provocative article that in low middle income countries like India, we need not be using IVAG at all, even if there is a diagnosis of Missy, we can get away with steroids. Methyl prednisolone is good enough, as good as IVAG, we can preserve IVAG for more severe conditions. In summary, I am here to plead to the audience. I am making a fervent appeal. Please do not perform COVID antibody tests. Even if the COVID antibody is negative, it can be missy. Even if the COVID antibody is positive, it need not be missy. That is a strong message I want to give. And for efficacy of vaccination, again, there is no need to do COVID antibody tests at all. And no diagnosis of Missy should be based only on one criteria of antibody positivity. Presence of a rash, presence of a hemodynamic disturbance of any form, including third spacing, with a combination of CRP of more than 100 milligram per deciliter. And if you have supporting evidence in the echo suggesting some LV dysfunction or pericardial effusion, Yes, it could be Missy, but beware, don't miss Missy mimics. On the other hand, if you have a child who has what looks like Missy, but if the child has a hepatomegaly with or without splenomegaly, and you do a blood count if there is leukopenia, CRP is less than 100, and if there are other clues to multi-organ dysfunction, I'm afraid you'll be wrong in making a diagnosis of Missy based on antibody. In future, I do fervently hope that with the decline in COVID cases, we will see less 
and less of Messi and COVID. Inflammatory causes, nowadays I give more steroids to my patients in the wards than antibiotics. Incidence of JRA, incidence of uh, uh, your Kawasaki, incidence of SLE, everything is on the rise. Maybe in our own series of cases where Omicron was identified, there had been less missy than with the previous variants. In a lighter vein, I appeal to the audience saying, please do not miss to see other infections or infections and the clues for them amidst the deluge of COVID-19, recognize them appropriately. In fact, recognition of enteric fever is crucial. Antibiotics like subtrax and suffixim will make the child all right. Recognition of scrub typhus by looking for an SR, a combination of several lab and clinical findings is crucial. Thank you very much. Let me thank my colleagues for all the assistance in the study. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Thank you for enlightening us regarding the MISI. So we have to see more of tropical uh, disease than the post-COVID uh, problems. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. The next, next, the next uh, lecture is by Dr. T. Usharani. Re re I respected Dr. teachers T. and dear delegates, our next speaker is Dr. Usharani. She is from. Um, Nilofar Hospital, is a professor of uh, pediatrics, Nilofar Hospital, and she, she delivered uh, lectures in uh, so many conferences, uh, including our uh, state pedicon. She is an excellent speaker, and I, I want Dr. Usharani Madam to continue her, her, with her speech. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank the organizing chairpersons for the kind introduction. A very good morning to all the senior uh, APNs, senior pediatricians, my colleagues, and uh, students in the audience. Uh, really, COVID has revolutionized the use of HFNC in uh, pediatric care. Actually, as a medical college faculty, as we become seniors, we tend to lose skills. We are more into administration and more into teaching. But COVID has really forced us to learn a new technical uh, intervention that is respiratory intervention, HFNC. So in the next 15 to 18 minutes, I would like to discuss on basic aspects of HFNC, what is the status and current evidence on HFNC use in pediatric centers, and also our experience with HFNC in the last one year. Though HFNC was introduced in the year 2002, the use of HFNC has tremendously increased from 2015 to 2020. But before COVID, it was extensively used in neonatal units, though there is no robust evidence uh, of its use, which is, is it superior to CPAP or not. But it, as a post-extubation intervention, it is being extensively used in neonatal units. But only after the COVID pandemic, most of the adult and pediatric centers started using HFNC extensively. If you go into the history, in early days of oxygen therapy, mainly rubber catheters and metallic cannulas were used. And the present day oxygen delivery is a low flow oxygen delivery with mainly nasal cannulas. And the flow can be increased by using venturi masks and also we extensively use uh, NRMs, non rebreathing masks, with which we can increase the uh, uh, FiO2 delivered. But if you look at the limitations of the present day oxygen therapy, what we use is a dry and cold gas. The temperature which is delivered with oxygen is around 15, uh, 10 to 15 degrees centigrade. This cool and dry gas is uh, extremely damaging to the mucous membranes. And also it causes a lot of uh, discomfort to the child. And this dry cold gas we cannot deliver at high flows. But in a child with uh, respiratory distress, unless we, uh, we give high flows, the work of breathing will not reduce. So at the same time, if you start with invasive ventilation, we know the side effects of invasive ventilation. There's a lot of barotrauma, volutrauma, and also ventilator-associated pneumonia. So there is definitely a need for a very safe and effective mode of uh, oxygen delivery, which is easy to administer, and which can be used widely in all the centers. So let us see, can HHFNC be the answer for this? So what is HFNC? Though it is, uh, for simplicity, we use H HFNC, it is actually HHHFNC, which means the delivery of oxygen, which is heated 
to 34 to 37 degrees centigrade, humidify it to a relative humidity of nearly 100%, and high flows of nearly 2 liters per kg per minute are used. And the interface is a very soft cannula, which occludes only 50, it is a non-occlusive interface. And if you look at the machine, you can see there is a humidifier and also a flow generator. The flow generator can deliver flows starting from 2 liters to maximum of 60 liters per minute. Now how does HHFNC act? The main uh, uh, goal of the HFNC is to optimize the spontaneous breathing. The two major, uh, uh, what to say, advantages of HFNC is one is heating and humidification of the gas, and the second is the higher flows it delivers. So because of the higher inspiratory flows, what happens is the physiological you know, de dead space, which is there from the nasopharynx till the respiratory bronchioles, this is all filled with the oxygen-enriched air. So the patient breathes in oxygen-enriched air, so the dead space is washed out because of the higher flows. And this higher, if you look at the graph, the green one, with HFNC, the flows are higher, pharyngeal pressures are higher, nearly 4 to 5 centimeters of water, whereas with low flow, it is less than uh, 4, less than 4 centimeters of water consistent. So these higher flows, what they do is they overcome the inspiratory resistance and they, they reduce the work of breathing. So the distress in the child comes down rapidly with HFNC compared to low flow oxygen therapy. And another greatest advantage is heating and humidification of the gases. So this heating and humidification of the gases is extremely soothing. It does not dry the mucous membranes and also the epithelial ciliary clearance is better, ciliary function is better, so the secretions are cleared, there's no thickening of the secretion. And also you can deliver a set FiO2 because of the high flows, there's no dilution with the room air as it happens in the low flow. So if you can see the other graph, the graph on the left side, so the whole of the, the you can deliver set FiO2 and there's no dilution with the room air. And the nasal cannula, which we use in HFNC, is very soft. So both heating, humidification, and the softness of the cannula, they're extremely comforting to the patient. And as we do not occlude the mouth, as in a mask-based NIV, the patient, uh, the developmentally supportive care, as well as the feeding, can go on uninterruptedly when you use HFNC. If you go into the physiological basis, when to use HFNC? So you cannot use it in all cases of respiratory failure. It is useful only in early stage of respiratory failure when there is hypoxemic respiratory failure. So when a PaO2 is falling, but compensatory mechanisms of the body are maintaining the PaCO2, that is the time where you can use HFNC. But if uh, compensatory mechanisms fail, carbon dioxide is increasing, then you have to go for invasive ventilation. So if the PaCO2, PaO2 trajectories are unpredictable, we cannot use HFNC in such cases. Coming to the clinical application, in pediatric uh, critical care, the one condition which is extensively studied is bronchiolitis. So there are several studies, and this is a very recent systematic review, which has included nearly 1,700 children with bronchiolitis below the age of two years. And this has concluded that uh, HFNC, if used early, can reduce the rate of intubations and also rate of mechanical ventilation significantly in these children. The other indications for HFNC are pneumonia, asthma, and also in children with obstructive sleep apnea, it has shown to improve the apnea and hyperapnea index. And if HFNC used in critically ill children during transport, on retrieval, the rates of invasive ventilation and as well as NIV were significantly less. And also HFNC is used as a modality for extubation, post-extubation respiratory support. In our unit, we are regularly using HFNC as a post-extubation respiratory support rather than the standard oxygen therapy, which we were using earlier. And also, in, uh, for a difficult intubation, for pre-oxygenation, we can use HFNC. And as, because of the high flows, the, these high flows, what they do is they stent the upper airway. So there's no collapse in, child, in children with laryngomalacia and bronchomalacia. You can use HFNC to prevent the airway collapse. And also, in children with neuromuscular diseases like SMA, those who get admitted to us repeatedly for respiratory compromise, HFNC can be a better, better mode of uh, respiratory support than ventilation. Coming to COVID, in early days of the pandemic, there was a lot of apprehension about the 
aerosolization due to NIV and HFNC. But if you look at the picture, if a surgical mask is placed over the HFNC cannula, the aerosol spread can be significantly reduced. And coming to the efficacy, there are a large number of studies in adults because fortunately COVID has spared children, not many studies are there. But these studies have proven that the mortality and length of hospital stay is significantly less in HFNC group compared to the ventilation. And another very great advantage of HFNC compared to mask-based or low-flow therapy is the comfort, patient comfort and also the parental satisfaction. We have seen that children are very comfortable when they are on HFNC because of the heating and humidified gas, it causes comfort and also the soft nasal cannula which doesn't occlude the nares. So children can eat while uh, having HFNC. And when to start? What is the modality to start? So if you use this table, if you look at the green zone, this is the normal respiratory rate at various ages. If the respiratory rate is in yellow or red zone here, that is the stage where you have to start with that is the indication for HFNC. So HFNC is useful in mild to moderate cases of respiratory distress and also if there is persistent hypoxemia in spite of giving low flow oxygen therapy. So how to start? Once you have identify the indication, you need to choose the correct interface. So this is a chart which guides us to use, uh, to use which interface to be used, which size of the cannula to be used. The size, as I told earlier, the diameter of the cannula should not occlude more than 50% of the nares. If you use too big a cannula, you may deliver higher pressure, it can lead to air leaks. If you use too small a cannula, you may not be able to uh, deliver the required pressures. So after fixing the interface, first thing to be set is the flow. The flow should be set at uh, nearly 2 liters per kg per minute, but usually in infants we never exceed 10 liters. Though it is, if, so if you say 10 kg baby, 20 liters if it comes, if you calculate 2 liters. But usually what we found is 1 to 1.5 liter per kg, kg per minute are uh, more tolerated and very effective uh, in our experience. So usually in infants we ne never exceed 10 liters and in older children we do not exceed 20 to 25 liters per minute. And uh, FiO2 should be set at 60 percent and within two hours you should be able to reduce FiO2 to less than 40 percent and set the humidified temperature at 37 and you need to closely monitor the respiratory rate, heart rate and also the chest indrawings and SpO2. If you are able to reduce FiO2 by 40 percent, respiratory rate and heart rate by 20 percent and there is improvement in the chest indrawing. Then, then SPO2 is maintained, then you can say the baby is responding and you can continue. If you are not able to achieve these targets, that is the time where you, where you have to escalate the therapy to invasive ventilation. Are there any contraindications? So you can give only to a child who is spontaneously breathing and has respiratory distress. You cannot give to a child who is comatose, who has bradypnea and also air leaks are a contraindication. If there is a mid-facial trauma or any other uh, malformation, then also you can you can give HFNC. HFNC is a very safe mode of respiratory support, very few complications, very rare cases of uh, air leaks have been reported. Coming to Nilofar experience, before uh, COVID pandemic, <coughs> we had only, H only one air machine with us and we hardly used it. But actually in January, January uh, sorry, June 2021, with anticipation of third COVID, a third wave of COVID to be more severe in children, we were supplied with nearly 200 HFNC machines. After a series of uh, training programs for both our faculty and residents, we started using HFNC from July 2021 onwards, and nearly 500 children have been treated with HFNC so far. Uh, we used both Airbo machines and also Inspire. And uh, a data of uh, five months, we have done a prospective observation study of nearly 362 children who were admitted between August 2021 and November 2021. And most of the cases were uh, pneumonia. The most common indication for uh, HFNC was pneumonia followed by bronchiolitis. Other conditions being dengue, also asthma, and also congenital heart disease. 
So this is the analysis. What we found is out of 362 children, only 20 children did not respond to HFNC at needed escalation of therapy. And among the diseases, uh, congenital heart disease, children with congenital heart disease, bronchi uh, bronchiolitis and pneumonia, there was more than 95% response. Whereas in asthma and post excavation, there was around 80% response with the HFNC. We analyzed the data. This was a prospective data. And we, we compared this data with the retrospective data before COVID. That was in 2019, same period. The intubation rate in our unit was nearly 17%. Whereas in 2021, after the introduction of HFNC, the intubation rate is only 5.4%. The significant reduction in the intubation rate and also there was significant reduction in the mortality in children with respiratory distress. Of course, there's no, we can't compare head to head because, because it is not an RCT. We have compared only with the retrospective data. Very few complications we encountered. Five, of, uh, five out of 362 children developed uh, little erythema near the interface, whereas only two children developed pneumothorax. So hence, with the current evidence and the, with the, our experience, I would uh, like to conclude, HFNC is a very safe mode of uh, oxygen delivery, very easy to administer. The intubation rates are significantly less compared to standard oxygen therapy. And uh, the most important advantage being the patient comfort and the parental satisfaction, and also the comfort for the staff. Staff are also our nursing staff as well as resident are very comfortable with HFNC. Um, we, are, we do not have any experience with other modes. Like we try to do CPAP for bronchiolitis, but the patients do not tolerate. They wiggle and they remove the interface. Whereas with HFNC, we do not find all those problems. At this juncture, we can say it is a very safe mode of respiratory support, but each unit must have definitive criteria for initiation as well as escalation. We are continuing to use and uh, in future, in the coming years, definitely after one or two years, we'll be able to produce more robust evidence uh, with uh, properly designed RCTs. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Madam, okay, for your nice presentation. Yes. And uh, congratulations to the team of uh, Nilofar Hospital for bringing and compiling such uh, data on uh, HFNC as an alternative to ventilation, Madam says it is a, playing a good role and uh, reducing the need for ventilation and uh, helping the many children without ventilator, hardly 5% needing ventilation. Any questions and experiences from the audience? Yes, sir. Actually, we were given 600 machines, sir. Uh, for all over later, they were distributed to peripheral pediatric centers and PSUs across Telangana, and we have 200 HFNC and also 200 ventilator machines with us. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, please collect your memento. Uh, the next topic is uh, panel discussion, optimal outpatient management of epilepsy. The moderator, Dr. Lokesh Lingappa, I request Dr. Lokesh Lingappa to come to the dais. And the panelists are Dr. Prashant Utej, Sashmita Devi Agarwal, Dr. Sai Chandra Reddy, and Dr. Ramya Bandi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Central Zone Pedicon organizing team, uh, for uh, giving us this opportunity. Uh, so epilepsy is something or a paroxysmal event in children. When they come, the diagnosis of epilepsy is always at the foremost of our consideration. And uh, we'll go through how, when we tackle this problem in outpatient basis, what is the best service we can provide to these children. Uh, we'll go through this in this uh, uh, panel discussion.
Sure. Thank you. So uh, I'll first quickly introduce uh, the panel. Uh, Dr. Prashant Utage is a consultant pediatric neurologist uh, who also runs the Utage Child Development Center. And one of his important, uh, uh, this one is, he is uh, uh, the co CEO and founder of the Umang Institute uh, for uh, Autism, where he is uh, in working in collaboration with the government and is doing a lot of uh, good uh, collaborative work. And uh, he has a lot of publications as well. He's also associate uh, member of uh, Board of Genetics of Telangana, apart from being a uh, part of neurology chapter. And uh, Dr. Sasmita Devi Agarwal uh, is working as uh, uh, pediatric, uh, professor of pediatrics and uh, consultant pediatric neurologist and epileptologist at uh, ITEC uh, Medical College, Bhuneshwar, Orissa. And uh, she is a national executive board member from East Zone, AOPN and a national tutor on autism and uh, CNS infection, and uh, has many national and international publications to our credit. Thank you. And Dr. Sai Chandar Reddy, uh, who is a consultant at uh, Sai Chandar Child Neuro Care at Anumakonda, Telangana, and uh, is assistant professor at KMC and uh, MGM uh, Hospital, Warangal. So he completed his fellowship from Ames, Kochi, and he has various publications up to 20, and he has many best paper awards to his uh, uh, credit, and uh, he established one of the first pediatric neurology center at uh, district level in Karimnagar and Anamakonda. And his special interest is uh, pediatric epilepsy. And Dr. Ramya Bandi, who was our uh, pediatric IAP fellow student, recently uh, completed her training and is working as the Ankura as a consultant pediatric neurologist. And uh, she has various national and international publications. And uh, she received a special mention prize in the last Neuropedicon at this venue. Uh, three years back and uh, our special interest is neurocritical care and community education so we will uh, yeah. small, small announcement tea and coffee will be served in the basement floor uh, uh, there is no tea break separately thank you thank you yeah. so i think uh, epilepsy as we know uh, is a disease of brain and the definition is at least two unprovoked seizures the unprovoked is extremely important two unprovoked seizures occurring more than 24 hour, hour apart. So that is why you will have to have that definition fulfilled. Or if you have a child with one episode of seizure who has a, like a perinatal asphyxia or neonatal hypoglycemic brain injury, and then you sh demonstrate on EEG there are very frequent EEG discharges, there is a gliotic lesion in the brain, even after first episode, they have a similar rate of risk of recurrence of epilepsy. So you treat them as epilepsy even after first episode. So these are the two criteria you need to establish before considering a, a treatment of epilepsy. And you need to try and make a epilepsy syndrome diagnosis. So what are the questions? So once we start with questions, we'll try to get these answers in the case formats. Is it an epileptic event? Any paroxysmal event, you need to see whether it's an epileptic event. How do we confirm it's an epileptic event? What is the etiology of the event? Can we know? And does it need medication at this point of time? What medication and how long to give and how to stop? These are the questions we need to answer, which we'll go through with the case formats. So this uh, first uh, child, a 10-year-old boy who went to school normally and suddenly fell down with uprolled eyeballs at the school, stiffening of limbs, there was generalized jerking of all four limbs lasting for five minutes and had frothing from mouth and he was postictally confused and had a severe headache after the episode and went off to sleep for next four hours. So this is the first child. And another 10-year-old child standing in the school assembly, f after 15 minutes while standing in the hot sun, developed a blackout, fall associated with pallor. The, uh, when the teacher was asked, they, they noted sweating and uh, there was some stiffening and few micro jerks were noted. And then he regained conscious in five minutes. He was a little bit weak but there are no other symptoms after that. Dr. Sasmita, uh, what are the differences which will help us to know whether it's epileptic or a non-epileptic event and how do we differentiate, I think? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the kind yeah. introduction. And I am really thankful to the organizing committee, particularly Dr. Arakala Bhaskar sir for having me here today. Now, coming to the two case scenario, if you'll go to the uh, previous slide, please. Uh, first one. Uh, both the children are 10 year old. In the first case, you can see the onset is quite abrupt, okay? Followed by, uh, there is loss of consciousness which is associated with upward rolling of the eyeball and some kind of paroxysmal event in the form of st 
stiffening and shaking for five minutes, and there is uh, frothing from the mouth. Okay, so all these four points: sudden onset, loss of consciousness, frothing from the mouth, and a generalized activity. And along with that, Dr. Lokesh told that the child was having some headache and something for a long period. That means there is some post-ictal state was there that indicates most probably the first one is an epileptic event, right? Now coming to the second one, the child was 10 years old, he was standing for 10 minutes, right? So there is a precipitating factor here. It is not sudden onset. There is a precipitating factor which was associated with pallor and sweating. That means there is some prodromal symptoms. There is a loss of consciousness or something, some jogs are also there, but the child regained the consciousness after five minutes and there was no any post-ictal state. He can recollect everything very nicely, okay? So that indicates the second one, most probably a non-epileptic event, most probably a case of syncope. Now coming to uh, uh, the point how to differentiate an epileptic from non-epileptic event, you can see here, most of the epileptic events are abrupt in onset and non-epileptic event can be gradual onset. Precipitating factor, immediate precipitating factor we may not get in epileptic event but we can get in non-epileptic. Prodromal symptoms we can get in the non-epileptic event, not in the epileptic event. Aura, particularly if it is a focal seizure or focal onset generalized seizure, we will get the aura which will be absent in non-epileptic event. Most of the durations of the epileptic attack or epileptic seizures are very short, unless and until they are entering into the status epilepsy. But uh, if you look at the non-epileptic event, particularly the um, uh, PNES and other things, the duration may be slightly prolonged. And uh, loss of consciousness usually present in an epileptic, absent in non-epileptic, Upper rolling of eyeball, uh, bowel and bladder incontinence, frothing and tongue bite is a feature of epileptic event, which is usually absent in non-epileptic one. Post-ictal state you will get in epileptic event. It will not be present in non-epileptic. And thought paresis uh, we can get in the uh, epileptic, epileptic event if it is focal in onset and which, which will be absent in non-epileptic event. By this way, we can differentiate an epileptic from a non-epileptic event. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I think it's one of the important uh, thing for us to uh, first difference, the dichotomy starts at whenever the paroxysmal event, whether it's epileptic or non-epileptic. Once you have a clarity, because most of the information is based on the history what you take. And till today, whatever the tests we do, none of them will diagnose epilepsy with 100% uh, clarity. So you'll have to have that history. If you see a video, that will be obviously very helpful because the sensitivity of EEG is very variable for each epilepsy syndrome, which will come through later on. So that is one of the important points. So first dichotomy. I think we'll have to look at precipitates, prodrome, and position, and post-event phenomena, what uh, Dr. Sasmita Devi has uh, pointed out uh, in uh, things. Uh, so we'll have to look at the duration of non-epileptic events can be brief as well, especially in infants. But when you look at paroxysmal non-epileptic events, PNES, there the episodes are generally very prolonged. Eye closure is a phenomena. Most of the epileptic events have eye opening as a phenomena, whereas paroxysmal non-epileptic events in children, adolescents especially, or school-going children. So there it will be, eye closure will be there. That is one of the clue to say it is a non-epileptic event. I think we'll uh, go skip these things. So unprovoked seizures. So whenever we have unprovoked seizures, this is an 18-month-old child, one episode of unprovoked seizure, blood investigations, EEG, brain MRI were all normal, normal development, normal perinatal history. That is 18-month-old. Uh, Another one-year-old child with febrile illness and then had a febrile seizures on right side of the body and he had already early onset left-hand preference and MRI brain had revealed perinatal left MCA territory stroke. So parents are worried about the recurrence of the seizure and the need for anti-seizure medication. So these are very common scenarios. How are we going to handle Dr. Ramya? Good morning, everyone. So in the first scenario, we can see that uh, it's an 18-month-old who is having a normal development, normal perinatal history. 
and in the second case, the child has an underlying uh, a developmental issue and then has a seizure, which is precipitated by fever. So in general, how to go about with the first episode of seizures? Here we will uh, put the febrile seizures beside and uh, for the rest of the seizures, initially history is very important. So in history, we can divide it into three parts. Uh, we can take history of the pre-event, event and the post-event. Uh, in pre-event, what the child was doing? Was the child awake, alert? Was the child playing? What was the child doing? And then during the event, how was the semiology? Whether the child had uproll eyeballs or was there any change in color? Was there any focality? So this will, tell, uh, this will uh, give some idea about localization of the event. Uh, obviously, the first step would be diagnosing it as epileptic or non-epileptic, and then these all come. And then uh, post-event, um, post-event what the child was doing, whether the child was extremely drowsy, uh, post drowsiness was for a prolonged period. Uh, so this will tell us the, uh, uh, how the event has gone. And next we should ask for perinatal history. A uh, major perinatal history would be generally, um, they only will come forward and tell us. Uh, but some, sometimes a very one uh, mild episodes, like one episode of hypoglycemia in the newborn period, and then the child was all right, the child is developing normally. Uh, these children can present at a later date with remote symptomatic epilepsy. So these are the subtle history points that we should be taking in the perinatal history. And then uh, any family history of seizures we should ask for. There are many autosomal dominant inherited uh, uh, epilepsy traits that run in families. And some uh, idiopathic epilepsy will have uh, polygenic inheritance meaning the family members, the cousins, they might be having epilepsies. So this family history is very important and we have to ask for that. So after uh, taking account into history, we have to examine the child for microcephaly or microcephaly and then any neurocutaneous markers which will point out to diagnosis such as uh, neurofibromatosis or uh, tuberous sclerosis complex that will uh, lead to diagnosis. And then uh, any focal deficits, for example, in this uh, child in the second case, the child has uh, uh, right uh, left hand preference, meaning the child has some amount of right hemiparesis. So these two should be uh, noted down. And then we'll, we should go for investigations uh, to rule out dyslytemia, that is the first thing, hypo, hypernatremia, hypocalcemia, those things we should rule out. And uh, if this child has a fever and then the fever has triggered and we know that it is not simple febrile seizures, then infective markers would help in this case. And then EEG. EEG is indicated in all unprovoked seizures. Uh, to know the focality, we, if we, uh, to know the EEG abnormalities. So what about the timing of EEG? So there is no set guideline that at, by this point we should do, but uh, the earlier the better. In an adult study, uh, roughly they have quoted that uh, below 16 hours after the first unprovoked seizure, the yield of EEG is little higher. So uh, earlier the better, and then the yield of EEG in a uh, whole, uh, uh, if we take the whole set of unprovoked seizures, it will be around 30 to 40 percent. But uh, it will change depending upon the type of epilepsy or the seizure. Suppose there was a focal seizure, the yield of EEG might be higher. And uh, in case of syndromes like Beck's or uh, which are self-limiting uh, childhood epilepsies, there also the EEG yield will be higher. So it will depend upon the condition, but overall the rate will be around 30 to 40 percent. So the next investigation that will come into our mind is MRA brain. So where is, where is it required? Uh, in case of unprovoked seizures with focal findings and EEG abnormality and then abnormal neurological examination, MRA brain is definitely indicated. But uh, routine epilepsy protocols are not, not required. Only if you are suspecting that there is a routine epilepsy protocol means they are mainly focusing on the temporal lobe. So if we know that the semiology is of temporal lobe or if we are suspecting it strongly that the seizure origin is from the temporal lobe, then only we can ask for, uh, then only we need to ask for epilepsy protocols. Otherwise a routine 1.5 Tesla minimum and 3 Tesla would be better, that MRA would be enough. And then after the initial evaluation, we should be able to categorize it to whether it is an unprovoked seizure or it is an acute symptomatic or an acute on remote symptomatic, like in the uh, second case, it will come on acute on remote symptomatic because of the febrile illness it might have triggered the uh, seizure uh, part. So we should be able to uh, categorize it into that. So unprovoked seizure is uh, occurring 
in the absence of potential, uh, uh, potential responsible clinical condition, uh, which is an underlying thing, then we call it as unprovoked seizure in the absence of that. So next question comes is when we have to start off an anti-seizure medication and how to start. So in this first case, uh, long-term uh, seizure medications are started basically upon the, uh, depending upon the recurrence risk. Generally, a recurrence risk of 60% over 60-month period is considered to be epilepsy. Uh, this is a, a, a definition given by ILAE itself. So if we know that uh, this child has an underlying neurological abnormality, EEG is showing some focal, focal disturbances, and MRA is having some structural lesions, we know that the recurrence rate will be higher for the second seizure. In that case, we would start off an ASM directly. Whereas if the child is uh, having a normal development, healthy child, then the recurrence rate in one of the studies about, uh, most of the studies is about 40%, 30 to 40%. Uh, so in that case, the uh, recurrence risk is not up to 60, so we can wait. So in this scenarios, in case one, I would wait to start uh, anti-seizure medication because it's the first episode and all investigations turned out to be normal. But in the second episode, because there is underlying neurological uh, uh, developmental delays there and preferences also there, hand preference, I would start off an ASM because I know that the recurrence risk is high. And uh, how to start? Suppose if the seizure load is very low, it is only one seizure and then the child is all fine, then uh, we can uh, um, start slow and go slow. And because uh, to prevent the idiosyncratic reactions and the other reactions of the uh, uh, drugs. But if it is an emergency, we can load the child and start off with uh, maintenance dose. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, so. Uh Evaluation of the child, yield of investigations, the trigger to start off medications. All of those things have to be critically analyzed because starting anti-seizure medication, it's quite easy for us. But as a parent, it is a quite a stigmatized condition. A lot of questions start arising. Can I allow my child to play again? Can they do all activities normally? Are they going to be, uh, uh, should I inform the school? Should they carry the uh, acute, uh, like midazolam spray in their school bag? Should we inform the bus driver? So a lot of questions start arising once you offer them anti-seizure medication. So that's why we need to be very critical and clear. Yes, this child has a very clear high increased risk of recurrence of seizure. I need to offer anti-seizure medication. So that decision making as a pediatrician, we should be very clear. Then we go ahead and offer the anti-seizure medications. Dr. Prashant, I think uh, these are the few important things while uh, deciding the anti-seizure, uh, the medications. Uh, so semiology and choice of investigations. Like what is the importance of it? A five-year-old who comes uh, while playing suddenly fell down, had uprolled eyeballs, all four limbs jerking for five minutes associated with loss of consciousness. And another six-year-old who had a fearful expression initially with oral automatisms and poor response to oral commands and after two to three minutes, child resumes to play, but he was a little bit dull than earlier. So what are the two different uh, uh, things you are looking at here? And uh, what is the importance of analyzing this and uh, documenting them? Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, if I am sitting in an OP and I get uh, these two scenarios, so we have, it's very important uh, to classify the seizure and then uh, classify the epilepsy, which type of epilepsy we are dealing with. And uh, the key uh, point, again, the localization of the lesion and uh, obviously treatment. And last important part is the prognostication. When they ask you for seizure, you know nowadays parents are so anxious. So we need to look for these five points. So taking first scenario, it is a five-year-old child. Uh, it's uh, obvious that while uh, playing, suddenly there is a fall up rolling of eyeball. So obviously it is a generalized tonic-clonic convulsion. No doubt about it, and there is a loss of consciousness. So this is a motor seizure. And if you see a uh, second uh, scenario where it is always confusing because if there is a no video present with us, whether this is a seizure or non-seizure, or sometimes abnormal behavior, uh, they will think. In this child, a uh, child is playing and suddenly comes running to the mother with some fear expression, and then some oral automatism. So this is a non-motor seizure and there is a poor response to command, means there is a behavioral arrest. Sometimes it may get confused with the absence epilepsy also. But this is an aura, so this looks like a more of a, a focal epilepsy, 
uh, involving non-motor component and more of what? Automatism. So moving towards the, uh, so these are the first scenario, it is a generalized tonic clonic conversion and second one is the focal, but it is a non-motor. Yeah. So, think, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the new uh, ILA classification uh, is, a, it is a Caesar type focal, generalized or unknown. Uh, and epilepsy types are uh, focal, generalized, then it is combined, focal with secondary generalization and unknown, and there are few epilepsy syndromes separately categorized, and these are always associated with comorbidity, especially the epileptic uh, syndromes. Yeah, I think using this as in your day-to-day -day practice is extremely essential because it covers most of the important things. So whether it's focal, generalized, sometimes you may not know in the first event or even second event whether it's what is the onset. So it can be unknown onset, it could be focal onset. Uh, so you can keep it uh, for the first or one or two events until you see the event or document the event on video. Uh, you can keep it as unknown many a times. The etiology will have to try and find out as much as possible, although with all the investigations, many times you may not find in, uh, etiology in many of these cases. Comorbidities, as Dr. Prashant said, is extremely important to be documented because your choice of anti seizure medication is going to also differ, which we'll come to later on, and epilepsy syndromes. Just uh, one more slide, sir. Yeah. Last, one more, next slide. Mm -hmm. So, this is a detailed ILE classification uh, type of expanded version. So, I won't go into the details, but uh, focal, we should be, there should be a consciousness whether it is impaired or child is aware of the things whether it is a motor or non-motor. So our second case fits into the non-motor onset. And uh, generalize again motor and non-motor. So motor comes of uh, tonic-clonic. And non-motor, uh, uh, most probably uh, absence epilepsy, that may be the typical atypical or my myoclonic epilepsy with uh, eyelid myoclonias. And unknown are the, again, motor and uh, unclassified. Sure. Thank you. So treatment obviously depends upon the uh, etiology. If it is a focal, so most probably we are dealing with any structural uh, lesion of the brain. And the treatment differs, like uh, if it is a focal, then we move towards the oxcarbamazepine, uh, carbamazepine or lacosamide. And nowadays the newer antiepileptics are the uh, like uh, parampenal and uh, uh, duracetam. Sure, okay, thank you. So. Epilepsy syndromes, do, why do we need to make a diagnosis of epilepsy syndromes? So that is the second question. So we looked at the semiology that makes a difference in the investigations we choose and drugs we choose. Most of us even today use semiology and then leave it at that, but attempted syndromic diagnosis is important. Uh, a one-year-old child with previous three episodes of febrile seizure presented with left-sided clonic convulsion lasting for half an hour associated with fever, normal perinatal history, and history of febrile seizures in mother. This is the first child. And another child, four-year-old boy, woke up from sleep, had severe retching and vomiting, followed by deviation of eye to left, which lasted for half an hour. So, and EEG showed occipital slides. So, what are the things which will help us to get to a syndromic diagnosis, Dr. Sai Chandra? So, good morning, everyone. In this first scenario, this child, before one year of age, have three episodes of febrile seizures. Now also presented with prolonged hemiclonic status epilepticus, and in the history, mother also have febrile seizures. So most of the time, epilepsy diagnosis and epilepsy syndrome diagnosis based upon the history only. So in this case, we have clear-cut some clues, recurrent febrile seizures, prolonged seizures, and family history. So this is, these features are suggestive of, highly suggestive of febrile seizures spectrum disorders, that is Dravet syndrome. So which is falling under developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. Up to now, we have clear-cut diagnosis and with genetic etiology also we have for this syndrome. So, next coming to the second scenario, age of presentation at four years of and have, wake up from the sleep, have some GI symptoms like retching and vomiting. After that, a gaze deviation is there. That is also prolonged seizures. In this, we have take the help of EEG, that is aspical size. So, these all features suggest you of the one specific focal syndrome that is panitopolis syndrome. So panitopolis syndrome is which most common focal epilepsy in childhood. This is coming under the self-limited focal epilepsis. So these two scenarios, different scenarios, in these two scenarios we came with the one specific epilepsy syndrome diagnosis which will help in future for our management. Yeah, so in... 
So epileptic syndrome classification is very, very important. According to this ILAE, after identification of seizure type, focal or generalized, next step is the epilepsy type. So whenever possible, try to classify the syndrome. So in the pediatrics, we have, we are able to classify syndromes. Most of the, uh, that is also age dependent. So what is the meaning of epilepsy syndrome? So this epilepsy syndrome means cluster of features with seizure type and EEG findings and some e uh, imaging findings. And this is also age dependent. In new newborn, we have some specific syndromes and infancy, we have specific syndromes and childhood, have, we have specific syndromes. So syndromic classification is very, very important in the view of management. That is when we need to start the anti-seizure medications and how much duration we need to continue any need of multiple anti-epileptic medications and prognosis. And we can expect desired uh, the comorbidities like behavioral issues and psychiatric issues, intellectual disabilities. And so we will give the proper guidance to the parents and how to prepare the parents for the further management. So this is about the epilepsy syndrome classification and syndromic diagnosis very, very important, especially in pediatric patients. Sure. Thank you all. As you can see, both the children had half an hour focal status. So, but the etiology and outcome we are going to prognosticate are completely different based on a syndromic diagnosis. In first child, you made a diagnosis of dry eye syndrome, where it's going to be a lifelong epilepsy, poorly controlled. You cannot control the seizures most of the times completely. It's an optimal control what we are trying to achieve. Whereas the second syndrome is self-limited, age-limited epilepsy syndrome. But initial presentation was both of them had status. Both of them had some, some discharges on the EEG. But your interpretation of syndromic diagnosis makes a difference in the long-term outcome and counseling. I think we have next four questions, only 14 minutes, so we'll have to finish quickly. Uh, so Dr. Sasmita, when choosing anti-seizure medications in these two scenarios, a two-year-old with autism and comorbid hyperactivity presented with two episodes of JTCS. Other one is adolescent girl with over eight and uh, has uh, two episodes of JTCS. How do we choose the anti-seizure medications? Uh, we'll have to be crisp two to minutes. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so to, uh, before choosing the anti-epileptic drugs, we have to keep three things in our mind. First is the seizure symbiology. Is uh, Dr. Prasan Dutake and Dr. Sai Chandra told Closer, you Mike, to closer, please. You have to classify whether it is a focal epilepsy or uh, generalized epilepsy or any syndrome. Uh, uh, the, the, that is the first one. Second is for the patient, you have to see the age of the patient, okay? So in the newborn, uh, certain drugs uh, like uh, phenobarbiton is the drug of choice during the neonatal period. Below two years, uh, we will like to um, uh, avoid uh, 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 sodium valproate. And uh, in older children, like in the in adolescent group, adolescent girls, we will try to avoid the sodium valproate and uh, phenytoin, okay? So age of the Mike. patient, second is socio-economic status, socio-economic status, co-existing medical and neurological problem. These are the three, uh, three points uh, regarding the child. And uh, ex the drug one, yeah. so for the drugs, you have to see the efficacy and tolerability. Which drug is more efficacious and which drug is more tolerable? Availability of the drug and ad adverse uh, effect profile, okay? Next slide. Next one. Yeah. Next, next, next slide. Yes. So these are the parameters to be considered. If the child is overweight or obesity, you have to avoid sodium valproate and oxcarbamazepine. In that, we can uh, prefer lacosamide or levetiracetam. If the child is having failure to thrive, then try to avoid topiramate and jonisamide, which are the side effect is topiramate and jonisamide causes loss of appetite. And uh, you prefer oxcarbamazepine and levetiracetam. If the child has language delay or intellectual uh, delay, then try to avoid topiramate, prefer lamotrigine, levetiracetam, and lacosamide. If the child is having ADSD, then go for levetiracetam, uh, try to avoid levetiracetam and benzodiazepine, go for lamotrigine, lacosamide, oxcarbamazepine, and dipalfric sodium, okay? Next slide. So now we'll discuss about the two cases. The first case, the two-year-old child with autism and the comor comorbidity is hyperactivity, right? So the hyperactivity is mainly due to the lack of communication, speech problem. So we have to address the speech issue there. So for the speech issue, try to avoid topiramate and jonisamide. And for hyperactivity, in that particular case, you have to avoid levetiracetam and benzodiazepine. And for the GTCS, we can go for divalproic sodium, which has a mood stabilizing effect. Next slide. 
And second one is an adolescent girl uh, who was overweight, presented with two episodes of GTCS. So, because uh, the child is overweight and adolescent, we have to avoid sodium valproate. Sodium valproate, the side effect is obesity. And, um, uh, and he has GTCS. Ideal, uh, we can go for uh, bivaracetam, which has less behavioral issues. And second choice is lamotrigine and uh, lamotrigine and lamot lamotrigine, okay? Yeah. Next. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, so. It, these cases exemplify, although you have broad range of medications to treat a generalized epilepsy and focal epilepsy, but depending on the profile of the patient, your choice of medication is changing. So that is important to be aware of. And it is not just, okay, it is GTCS, let us start levotriastam. Let us start topiramate, just a child is uh, overweight. Sometimes a child with or, uh, autistic spectrum disorder is overweight. So you might think that because topiramate reduces appetite, that might be a good choice. But that causes significant language issues, cognitive issues, name calling difficulties. So all these things can w exacerbate the problems. So that is why knowing the side effect profile of the drug, knowing the comorbidities of the child, you'll have to match them and then uh, prescribe appropriate anti medication. Thank you, Dr. Sasmita. So, this is a child, uh, refract, refire-year-old with neonatal hypoglycemic brain injury, developmental delay, epileptic spasms in the past. Now he has everyday morning frequent head drops and falls. And he's on three anti-seizure medications, sodium valproate, topiramate, and clobazam. So what is the treatment and plan? What is the target we need to have, Dr. Prashant, in this sort of situation? So now this patient has come to uh, from pediatrics to pediatric neurology OP. So already uh, we are dealing with refractory epilepsy as uh, more than two antiepileptics on and still there is a uh, not control. And uh, we need to see the aim of the treatment for us is now to optimum seizure control during the day and uh, with minimal adverse effect uh, of the polytherapy. So what is ideal polytherapy in a child uh, like this? Uh, so what is the diagnosis is lenox Yasu syndrome, so epileptic encephalopathy we are dealing with. So valproate with uh, lamotrigine will be one of the good combination of a polytherapy where there will be an optimum control of the seizure. And you can add on clobazam. Uh, there are many newer antiepileptics coming up, but the evidence still lacking into this. Next slide. Uh, so as uh, uh, one more the important point we need to highlight to the parents that there may be a, a chance of SUDEP in this child and the incidence is 1 in 4,500. But these are already developmental delay child, intellectual disability and hyperactivity along with refractory epilepsy. So we need to counsel them and monitor during the night time. Next. Uh, now important point uh, for the pediatric OP, how can we prevent the uh, neonatal hypoxic uh, birth injury and by preventing this hypoglycemic brain injury. obviously uh, yes so we can prevent the learning disability intellectual disability cortical visual impairment inattention and epilepsy although this is not part of usual but yeah, there are so many pediatricians here who can make a huge difference in preventing neonatal hypoglycemic brain injury this is something which leads on to huge lifelong disability so you, as a, new, a neonatologist, pediatrician, you can make a difference here because once they come to us, you know that already damage has happened, it hardly anything, we can make a difference. So I think monitoring aggressively in appropriate children, avoiding a symptomatic hypoglycemic brain injury makes a significant long-term outcome difference for these families. They can have a normal brain, they are born with normal brain, they suffer a hypoglycemic injury on day three of life and they're devastated for life. I think all of us should make every attempt to prevent it. After that, we can't treat you. Treating the hypoglycemia after the child had seizures or encephalopathy is not much of benefit. So we need to make sure we uh, prevent these things. Okay. So Dr. Ramya, normally once you have diagnosed the child is on treatment, when are there instances where you require a you need for repeat EEG? When do we request them? Yeah. So uh, repeat EEG, in a case of one non probe seizure and the child is doing well, we generally don't do. But there are certain situations where we have to think of EEG and repeat it. Uh, suppose in this boy, this child has BECTS, which is relatively easily controllable uh, uh, epilepsy. But then child started having some worsening of school performances. Uh, then in such situations, we should think whether the spike burden has increased and causing electrical status epilepticus. 
previously which was called as continuous spikes in slow wave sleep. So this possibility should be in back of our mind and uh, because the treatment implications vary and uh, treatment will uh, change the behavior and cognitive uh, effects on the child. So this is one case where we think of. And in a routine uh, setup, if there are any, uh, if there is any unexplained increase in frequency of the seizures while the child is not missing on any medications, then we have to repeat the EEG. Or change in semiology, if the child was having focal and now the child started having spasms or started having myoclonic jerks or GTCS, then that is one situation. And uh, if there is uh, one unprovoked seizure and you know that the EEG is normal, but then there is a second event, uh, we should not think that the first EEG is normal and should, uh, we should not repeat. No, that's not the way. Why? Because the repeat EEG will increase the yield. In a study, they have shown that 39% was the yield for the first uh, EEG to be abnormal, which has increased to 68% after the third one. So though the increase might not be very great, but definitely we will be able to pick up more uh, abnormalities. And to see the responses in uh, kids uh, with epileptic spasms or landu or uh, electrical status, there also we need to repeat an EEG and see for the response, how the child is doing. Last so, four minutes. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, the need for repeat EEG is limited, but I think there are specific situations where it is extremely useful and then we need to request in those situations as uh, Dr. Uh, Rami already highlighted. So when we have completed a successful seizure-free period, so when are the situations where we can actually consider anti-seizure medication withdrawal? So this is a four-year uh, for boy with uh, four episodes of GTCS at the age of three years, was on single medication. For past two years now, there are no seizures, is developmentally normal going to school. Can the anti-seizure medication be tapered? Yeah, this is the case scenario usually come to our OPT. So we are used two years of anti-epileptics and no seizures since last two years. So in this case, there is three episodes of four episodes of seizures before three years of age. So we can taper, start the tapering of anti-seizure medications now. So this child is on single medication and no seizures from two years and normal development, everything is normal, we can start tapering. So any prerequisites for this tap before tapering. So if any old EEG is available and that is also abnormal, we can go for the repeat EEG if required. But not in all cases, no need of repeat EEG, already she mentioned. But in this case, there is no recurrence. So only we need repeat EEG in case of absence epilepsis and remote symptomatic epilepsis with some underlying brain abnormality and focal epilepsy, that is specific focal epilepsy, BECS. In these cases, we need repeat EEG. How can we taper? If this child used at least for two years, so different uh, 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 associations mentioned, but usually we will taper minimal seizure free for two years without any comorbidities and without any causes. So in that tapering also, we will taper very slowly, we will need to take three to six months, slowly tapering. So this, in this case, we can taper within three to six years, six months. So next slide, sir. So some rules to tapering. So minimum seizure free for two years, that is also depending upon the underlying diagnosis syndrome and disease. And slowly taper over three to six months if seizure medication used for more than two to three years. If child was on multiple drugs, we need very slow tapering compared to a single drug. And don't taper the two drugs at the same time. And while tapering of the seizure medication, if seizures recurred, we should continue this medication with previous doses. And while we tapering the benzodiazepines and phenobarbitone, because recurrence rate are very high compared to the other medications. So we, so we can, before tapering, we need to explain there is high risk of recurrence. So when, while we are tapering this, repeat EEG is abnormal and remote symptomatic epilepsies, absent seizures, very high chance of recurrence is there absent seizures and longer duration of epilepsy, multiple seizure types and used more than one seizure medication. In these cases, there is recurrence is high. We need to explain to the parents before tapering started. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, so those are the principles to be followed while uh, reducing the anti-seizure medications. We need to explain them. There is a small risk of recurrence. So if everything is normal on tapering, there is 10 percent of recurrence. Uh, risk of recurrence within first one year after withdrawal. So that needs to be explained. It doesn't mean that there is a zero recurrence. So and then give, prescribe them uh, midazolam's nasal spray, have, let them have it for next one year. If uh, even after one year there is no recurrence, the risk of recurrence is going to be extremely low. So that is what 
what we need to counsel and the high risk of relapse already Sai has explained. So our point is to first dichotomy, you make sure that it is epileptic event, what is the type of seizure and what is the syndrome, what are the comorbidities and what is the best first choice anti-seizure medication. Give it for sufficiently longer duration of period and then once you do not get a seizure, then you, for 2 years or 3 years depending on the syndrome, we can taper it and stop. So why do we use 2 years as a cutoff, not 1 year? Because after, if you taper at the end of 1 year, there is a 40 percent risk of recurrence. If you taper at the end of 2 years, there is 10 percent risk of recurrence. So that is why the 2 years was chosen as a cutoff to taper the anti-seizure medications. Thank you. I thank all my panelists and uh, thank the Central Zone Pedicon team. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, nice discussion and it was on time. Uh, I would call Dr. Raghav Rao sir and Dr. C. N. Reddy sir to chair this session and uh, the next presentation there is a little bit change. Yeah. Yeah. And all the faculties can collect their mementos and certificates in the desk near at the end of this hall. Dr. Raghav Rao sir, Dr. C. N. Reddy sir and the next presenter is Dr. Anup Verma. I request all the presenters to keep it in time so that uh, we will be able to uh, finish it on time. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We have a first topic by Dr. Anup Verma. He is a pediatric neurologist and specialist in clinical genetics. He is the editor in chief, Pi Textbook of Pediatrics, editor in chief, first and second edition of IAP Textbook of Pediatric Neurology, author, Spotters in Pediatrics, Pediatric Secrets, editor IAP Textbook of Pediatric Radiology. He got so many awards, like Doctor of the Year Award by National IMA 2015, FIAP in 2003, FIAMS, F FCGP 2007, honorary, is a honorary fellow of Academy of Pediatric Neurology and is a great orator. He has given so many orations, like D.S. Devi oration, C.G. State in 2017, and many more orations. And uh, he is affiliated to National EMB, EBM, IAP 2000, 2005, 12, 14, and 15, National Vice President, IAP 2005, and uh, CWC member of Central IMA, CG State President of IAP 2006, CG State President of IMA 2007, IMA Constitutional Committee member, he was from 19 to 20. He is a Central Zone co Coordinator presently, 2022 and 23. Uh, Thank you very much, sir. Over to Dr. and uh, before that, Dr. Raghav Rao Sarvishan. Good morning to all the delegates. At the outset, uh, I'm extremely thankful to the organizers for organizing, uh, for asking me to chair the session, especially in Dr. Vaisi Mathur Lecture Hall, who is one of the legendary pediatricians with whom I had very, very long association. In this session, we have three important topics. One of them is, just now you heard the bio data of Anu Varma, very eminent, very senior, neurologist, pediatric neurologist. I think he is going to, his lecture is going to great benefit. I think he is going to speak about movement disorders. I think uh, without wasting much time, I now request Dr. Anu Verma. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Chairperson, sir. Again, very, very thankful to organizing committee, especially Dr. Sankoj and Dr. Arakala for a very grand show. Uh, we are very, very happy to be here and to be on this very prestigious floor. 
my topic is my topic is uh, uh, moment disorder and we all know this is a very important clinically relevant and is faced by every pediatrician in the office. A picture is worth a thousand words. A video is worth a thousand pictures. You cannot diagnose a case of chorea just by reading the textbook, unless you have witnessed or seen once. And this is the basis of whole of the presentation here. It all begins in the basal ganglia, and you can see that there are hyperkinetic moment disorder, there are hypokinetic moment disorder. In pediatrics, we usually deal with hyperkinetic moment disorders, and these are the various uh, uh, hyperkinetic moment disorder you are seeing in the uh, lower region. And this is the spectrum of whole of the uh, moment disorder, maybe from tremors to ticks to stereotypy. Everything is displayed in this spectrum of moment disorders. Is this, uh, if we plot the whole of the videos or moment disorders from uh, uh, fastest to slowest, you can see that myoclonus is the fastest moment disorder and uh, dystonia being the very slowest moment disorder and rest all of them uh, in, are in between. I am going to talk on uh, autoimmune chorea, which is the most common. I will totally focus on uh, the autoimmune chorea that is the rheumatic chorea. We will, we will go with the approach to a case of moment disorder with a particular reference to Sydenham's chorea. Pattern recognition, we will have a current understanding what we are having and we have different case reports. It all begins, we are seeing this particular sort of conditions since last 300 and around 20 or 32 years. The most important thing is the phenomenology is, is still not changed. In 300, 300 century, we will see, we will see that the fresh bottling of this ancient disease. The general approach of any case of moment disorder begins with a classical uh, examination and very, very important is the history. History, history, and history forms the plinth of the, your clinical diagnosis. We are totally focused on our clinical diagnosis. Definitely family history have a very, very important role, which, which gives the end, of course, the consanguinity. We have very important drug history. In any case of abnormal movement, history of drug is very, very important. Then the perinatal event, then the age of onset. We have to uh, clear cut, dissect it out the what type of pattern the child is exhibiting. Is it fitting into the chorea? Is it fitting into the choreoathetosis, balismus, and so many? Then we have to examine in the form that these are the neurological examination and these are the non-neurological examination. Just to dissect, you, you are dealing with a primary, secondary, or psychogenic. Any case who is front of you exhibiting abnormal movement, just to try to focus on the head, the trunk, and the upper extremities. You can see that there is no more difficult art to acquire than the art of observation. The basic clinical funda of any clinical medicine. Just focus on the face, the trunk, and the upper limb. The phenomenology will be in front of you. All, see the all videos, absolutely unusual facial grimace you don't expect normally. So unusual facial grimace is very important clinically and should be focused on examination. Any patient who is in front of you and is approached to a moment disorder, you have to typify whether it is a hyperkinetic moment disorder or a hypokinetic moment disorder. What type of dominant it is, where is the distribution, associated features, and the diagnostic workup. 
So in case of uh, type of moment disorder, you can see there is a hyperkinetic and these are all hyperkinetic moment disorder, the videos you are seeing in this slide. Dominant, in this particular case, chorea is dominant. We know that the, the uh, most of the moment disorders are associated with each other. There is overlapping. So which type of moment disorder is dominant? What is the distribution? Is it a generalized or it is exhibiting a focal or uni uh, unilateral one? Non, these are the associated features. Just important, focus on the eye. Lot of information can be generated from the eye examination. Maybe a telangiectasia sitting there, maybe a ring sitting there, maybe abnormal chaotic moment is there. So, and these are the diagnostic workup. Uh, you can go ahead with the type of uh, youth think that you have to go in this direction. You can see that chorea, athetosis, and bellismus are in the same uh, uh, spectrum. It differs only in the range and amplitude. You can see that bellismus is, is a violent, flinging moment, whereas the athetosis is the slight writhing movement, small over the distal part of the area. And you can also say that bellismus is the severe chorea. And here is the birthplace of this autoimmune condition, the throat. We know that there are more than 700 bacteria in the th throat cavity. But it is the Streptococcus beta hemolyticus lens field group A. These are all strep throat condition. And as a general pediatrician, we have to identify and treat it absolutely uh, uh, perfectly. But use, make use of perfect antibiotics for adequate length of time. So you can sterilize the throat. What is this? This is a very classical signature of strep infection. This is the donut sign. No culture is required. No other bacteria, no other virus gives this condition. So this is a very classical donut sign of gas. And future horoscope lies sometimes in the throat. We should that should be kept in mind. And accordingly, we should treat this patient. One finger in the throat, one in the rectum makes a good diagnostician. So what is changed? If the phenomenology has not changed, then what is changed? You can see out of the throat, this uh, anti out, uh, streptococcal antigen has been uh, taken by the plasma cell and there is a generation of the uh, autoantibodies that you are seeing. There is a lot of uh, autoantibodies and these antibodies circulate and they find basal ganglia as a foreign body and from here all the uh, problem starts. So you can see that all these plasma antibodies are going and hitting the basal ganglia. So these are all post-streptococcal, neuropsychiatric condition, sidenams, Tourette, OCD, and PANDAS. It is a most common autoimmune condition, and around 26% uh, patients, uh, they, they turn out to be in chorea in cases of rheumatic fever. Usually eight to nine years, and female preponderance is important. It all begins after the four to eight weeks of a strep infection. 20% uh, of these cases, have, you will not see a bag of worm tongue. Friends, these are the uh, videos of years of collection. Please don't try to miss. You can see that recurrences, once you have treated the patient, but still there are chances of recurrences. 20 to 60% of the patient, they can have recurrences, especially when the pregnancy, during pregnancy, or there are certain drugs which can give rise to uh, phenytoin and estrogen as well. You can see the chorea can be mild, it can be moderate, and it can be severe. Severe to that extent, the patient is even not able to sit, even not have the anti-gravity movements. And this is known as the chorea mollis or chorea gravis. Just look the video. Absolutely restless, impersistent. There's a lot of reduced motor, motor tone. And due to this, there is a, a speech and motor incoordination. That is, again, a very important feature of chorea. Friends, these are the subsequent four slides will be a classical sign of the chorea. And you can see that this is the piano, piano sign or the spooning sign. You can see the abnormal movement at the wrist. 
there is the extension of the metacarpophalangeal joint. This is a classical darting tongue. This is a pronator sign. There is a hyperpronation. It is a good test to test the hypotonia of the upper limb. And the milk made grip. An examiner can personally feel it. This. So friends, always remember these signs are chorea specific and not the etiology specific. A drug induced chorea will give rise to this. A different etiology of the chorea will give rise to these signs. So these are very important. High prevalence of tics and psychiatric symptoms are seen in rheumatic chorea. That is again a very important condition. <coughs> These are the tics. What is known as simple tics? All these patients just see the face of this child. And if it persists less than one year, they are termed as a simple motor tics. And if these tics persist for more than a year, they can be said to be a case of chronic tic disorder. Here, Stidacidenham's chorea or Tourette syndrome can have an overlapping pathophysiology. And you have to dissect it out whether you are not dealing with a Toure. You can see the motor tics and water tics if it is more than persisting for more than one year, age if it is less than 18 years, and there is a no tic-free interval of less than three months, uh, classically favors the presence of Tourette syndrome. We know that the definition of pants has been changed. And it is not the streptococcal which is responsible for production of the pandas, but it is the non-streptococcal uh, cause. There are uh, viral causes, there are environmental causes which can give rise to these uh, uh, pediatric uh, acute onset neuropsychiatric symptoms. And just to differentiate the sedanams and the pandas, uh, pandas appears uh, uh, from three to puberty, more in male, more motor tics, more vocal tics, Chorea is less seen in uh, uh, pandas, and uh, <coughs> temporal relation with ASO titer is seen in pandas. That is important. And large molecular weight antibodies like 60 dark Dalton can be seen in uh, pandas, and so on. Just see the video. The patient is exhibiting an unstable gait, lurching quality, dance-like, and you have to differentiate from the ataxia, which has a broad base gait. Always, always auscultate the heart because you are otherwise going to miss a carditis, a systolic murmur of the carditis, which is a very important diagnostic feature of rheumatic fever. So never ignore the auscultation of the heart. And if the, there are three patients exhibiting abnormal movement, you just by seeing uh, phenomenology, you cannot differentiate whether this is a case of rheumatic or SLE or apps. Just in SLE, it is uh, multi-system involvement. ANA will be positive. In APS, we have a classical history of epilepsy, can have a transverse myelitis like that. So coming to the treatment, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted, and there is a no replacement of the clinician own experience. You cannot count the experience of one sitting for 20 years in the clinic, 25 years in the clinic. You cannot replace the experience. That is very, very important. And there is a no globally accepted protocol to treat traumatic chorea. Even in spite of its existence in more than three centuries. Confirm the causative etiology first. Valpret and heroperidol considered first for at least two to four weeks. Tetrabenazine and IVIG proven, but not maybe very effective. Treatment should be continued for eight to 12 weeks, but sometime it may need to continue eight, six to nine months. And this is the uh, protocol of the penicillin we all know. These are the search. Last if you search minutes. to treat the literature of the rheumatic fever, there are so many literature. Everything has been, um, uh, uh, there are so many drug, group of drugs, neuroleptic drugs, anticonvulsant drugs. So I am going to rush for some cases. This just see the video. Classically detected to have a rheumatic, uh, in origin, acute rheumatic chorea. See the stability after four weeks, su such a stability. This is again a patient having acute rheumatic chorea. And you can see the, the uh, response after three months. You can see this patient with 
abnormal movement detected to have rheumatic chorea. This is the follow-up at two months. This is the follow-up at four months. Responded well with the chorea. This is again a patient with acute rheumatic chorea. See the follow-up of these patients and see the stability what he has reached. But be aware of the relapses as well. And here is the, see the face of the child abnormal and this patient had a carditis, systolic murmur was there and <clears throat> he had a relapse as well. Just observe, he is, she is exhibiting hemichoria, unilateral, and detected to have a rheumatic in origin. And see the stability, see the, after three, one month, after three months, Lo lot many times we see the hemichoria, it is almost uh, seen in 20 to 25 percent. And this is an important case, very severe hypotonia to that extent, anti-gravity movements was absolutely not. Detected to have rheumatic in origin, this is severe chorea mollis, difficult to treat. Again, a patient having eight-year-old progressive clumsiness, severe rheumatic chorea. This is the sequence of photographs, videos during the stay. And you can see at the time of discharge and at the time of the follow-up, uh, absolutely, and still the, she has not no relapse. Not every patient who is exhibiting coriform movement is a rheumatic chorea. There are other etiologies as well. This is the case of Wilson's disease, presenting with the case of similar to um, phenomenology of uh, rheumatic uh, sort of chorea phenomenology. And here you can see <coughs> series of its video follow-up present. Another patient who is again exhibiting a coriform movement, chorea movement. But what was another detected ICS? Two, three slides more. You can see ataxia, telangiectasia was there, classical opt oculomotor apraxia is there. You can see the truncal ataxia, what was important for a weak clinician, they never, never ever afford to miss the examination of conjunctiva. You are going to miss a very important clinical condition which can give you and your patient a benefit. Lot many HIE patient which basal ganglia and thalamic lesion produce. So friends, what we have learned, systematic approach should be followed in any patient who is exhibiting abnormal movement. Pattern recognition is very important. Is it a chorea? Is it a hemibalismus? Is it a tics? Is it a stereotypy like that? We have covered almost most common type of autoimmune chorea and video uh, documentation is very important even at the late night at three, never miss a chance to take the video, especially when he is exhibiting an abnormal movement which you, at that time you are not able to grab it. Just circulate to your uh, colleagues and make the diagnosis. So friends, learning disease is never complete and presentation of disease is never final. You have to churn you have to churn your experience with the available science you have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anu Parma, for your excellent presentation on movement disorder and especially as we are running time short, I know there will be many doubts. I request the audience to interact with him during lunch time. Thank you, Dr. Anu Parma. Okay. Next will be Dr. Samir Hassan Dalwai. Uh, I request the speaker to come to the desk. The topic is behavioral issue in children post lockdown. Morning. Can you? Krishna. Resume. Good morning. Very nice topic we are going to have by Dr. Samir Hassan Dalwai. He is a <coughs> consultant pediatrician and a specialist in developmental and behavioral pediatrics, founder New Horizon Child Development Center, Nanavati Hospital, and 
he was he is treasurer of iap 22 and 23 past president iap chapter of neurodevelopmental pediatrics over to speaker respected chairpersons respected dr radhakrishna dr ravi dr sudhendra ji dr arkala bhaskar ji sir dr sankoj bhaskar sir respected secretary general of indian academy of pediatrics dr vinit sir who has graced us all my senior dignitaries and senior friends yama ji all of you and respected delegates thank you very much for the honor to be part of the first uh, pedicon which is a central zone pedicon of this year so thank you very much and thank you for this topic uh, fortunately as we know the children have not been seriously affected by the virus it has affected their mental health and confidence and it has shaken them very badly as we know and this has impact this impact is also seen in our clinical practice every day just a brief assessment of why we took up this topic this is some of the data at new horizons child development center for neuro developmental children which we have been seeing across the last 11 years but please notice the increase the steep rise in increase in the number of cases being referred for developmental pediatrics consultation just across the last one year and the numbers have almost doubled way back in december 2020 just after the first wave dr bukul parekh sir and myself wrote a paper or an editorial in indian pediatrics on the psychosocial impact of covid on pandemic and we were always talking about that these issues of prolonged isolation disruption in daily routines a sense of gloom and loss of lives and livelihood uncertainty in children's life stress all this would lead to a disastrous effect of paranoia what irritability inattention and boredom being seen by children post the lockdown sleep disturbances are being seen in so many children there is acute panic which is being seen there is lots and lots of anxiety and depression obsessive behaviors and finally we have been left with post traumatic stress disorders if you look at the numbers this is from a study done in india and the numbers are huge and if you go and look at just that one thing just the increased screen time one because the school was online and also because the parents and the children had nothing else to do at home has given rise to so many physical complaints so much poor attention span academic underperformance gadget addiction cyber crime cyber bullying so on and so forth and hence if you go ahead and see there are so many red flags that we must remember in our clinical practice every day and i have divided into three groups below 3 3 to 12 and above 12 so this is a 3 year old child who came with complaints of fever and viral infection to you but mother says he has become more hyperactive aggressive keeps clinging to the mother usko washroom bhi it does not allow her to go he has started thumb sucking he does not like to have visitors at home gets irritated very easy and he calms down only when he is shown the screen so we must see that children below 5 years of age are showing attention seeking behavior and they have shown regressive behavior like clinginess thumb sucking bed wetting they are not able to play the way they were able to play earlier they become fussy and demanding and they want to be carried around or fed by the parents so as pediatricians what will we do with these children what will we advise them one is to advise the parents that please make a schedule that's the most important thing we have seen in our clinical practice that is helping parents make a schedule put all the activities of daily living in the schedule all the activities that the child needs to do have to be written down as per the time and parents have to set rules and be consistent and it's very important to limit the gadget used to a particular time in the schedule and if you put it in a particular time say 4 to 4:30 or 6 to 6:30 pm as a schedule only then will parents be able to control this request parents to participate in children's games or activities and help in the studies but don't stress too much for academics because children are coming back after a two year period stressing on academics is only going to worsen the problem this is a older child 9 year old girl child came with history of secondary enuresis neurological examination was normal she does not want to attend school or meet peers keeps crying her mother complains that she has become more clingy does not want to sleep alone wants to sleep with the mother even keep the lights on if she wakes up and she finds that the mother is not there or the lights are off she would be very very scared now children between 6 to 11 years dear friends please note they are showing certain specific problems there is a huge addiction to gadgets in this age group there is oppositional defiant behavior temper tantrums bad behavior severe mood swings crying excessively sad withdrawn very important to note 
change in eating pattern and sleeping pattern and sleep disturbances not able to fall asleep on time waking up in the middle of the night crying while waking up all these things are getting very commonly noted and weight loss as well as weight gain so simple suggestions to my fellow pediatricians what you can do in your clinic these are simple charts just a child is not able to express at 5 years 6 years 7 years they may not be able to express how they are feeling even adolescents so simple chart like this and the child can point out what the child is feeling and you can record it on your opd paper similarly what they call as a moodometer this can be easily ordered from amazon you can keep it on your clinic on your table and you can ask the child to move the pointer to show what the child is feeling this is a quick method this was developed by uh, dr cp bansal's team in the covid all the school going uh, school covid program that we were doing so basically we need to know four things amongst the children is the child doing psychologically okay is the child struggling is the child unwell or is the child in crisis so this kind of a psychological thermometer is something you can use to monitor what's happening in the child's life what will you advise it's all about advising the parents to spend more time with the child to engage the child in small household tasks let me tell you at new horizons especially even children with special needs one of the most important things that we find in improving their interaction is getting the child to do household tasks watering the plants carrying the plate to the table for lunch keeping the plates back bringing daddy's clothes or mummy's clothes or giving them the watch or carrying their bag these simple things help the child to feel a sense of self esteem that he is participating in the house he is contributing to the house so all this is very very important promoting hobbies letting the child help other children all these things are helping these children in the adolescent age group now this is a child who came with poor appetite and some weight loss his parents said that the school is saying he is playing truant doesn't attend the classes even when he is in the class he is lost in his own world even if something is asked to him directly he seems disinterested he does not want to participate academic performance which was earlier average at least is now declining and is able to barely pass in the class after the lockdown in the school has opened and at home the parents will tell you he is locked in his own room with his gadgets all night adolescents especially have faced a great impact because of the lockdown with severe mood swing swings irritability anger poor self esteem poor self care they are neglecting to take a bath they are neglecting to cut their nails and parents are fighting a lot with them about it of course we know about the gadgets academic underperformance and many children have even started substance abuse so all these things we must note but we must never forget to note whether there are any signs of suicidal ideation of self harm or any talk which talks about self harm and this is extremely important to red flag as a pediatrician because any of these signs are very important because all across the country especially i can quote you from maharashtra there is increase there is a child from a school close to our house 10th standard child mother just scolded him for not studying well took away his mobile phone he just went and jumped in front of a moving train and committed suicide so these things are getting more and more common and which is why iip has come out under dr piyush gupta sir with these wonderful guidelines focus on the good behavior is what you have to tell the parents ignore the bad behavior at least for the next one or two years till this covid effect goes away talk about what the child should do what they can do as a family rather than what not to do and they need to be more praising the child rather than criticizing it is very important to tell the parents not to overreact not to be too dramatic about everything for those of you who are interested in indian pediatrics december 2020 we had published this study on arch which is helping children a lot arch is nothing but an acronym for attitude to attempt building in resilience in the child teaching the child collaboration of with other children but collaboration along with care and humor and humility have to built into the child's life so this is an acronym which we had developed at new horizons child development center we did a study at jj hospital and just talking about these few values to the parents and the child is helping the child much more now there are some more interesting cases which are very similar to what we have presented again a boy of 3 years comes to you with mild viral fever has been hyperactive and aggressive parents now tell you or you notice that he does not speak but recites nursery rhymes alphabets good morning good evening the whole day flaps his hands when angry or excited the only time again he comes down is with a screen similar to the previous 3 year old child this is very very important and i'd like to ask you are you seeing this parents will tell you doctor he is doing it 
only because of the lockdown, because he did not meet other people, he is not able to speak. Once he starts going to school, he will start speaking. Are you seeing such children? Are you seeing these children coming to you and parents are in this complete denial? What is very important to note few things. In this child, in addition to the irritability, restlessness, he has poor eye contact and no social smile. And as Dr. Anup Bhai said so beautifully, we have to have our own clinical signs. So I call this the Shah Rukh Khan sign. Shah Rukh Khan sign in this child is absent. What is Shah Rukh Khan sign? All of you know this is Shah Rukh Khan's favorite pose. And when he does, he puts his arms outstretched, the heroine comes running and jumps into his arms. If the father or the mother spread out their arms, not at each other, but at the child, and if the child does not come running into the arms and hug the mother or the father, this is a sure short sign of poor social interaction, poor social reciprocation. So in this child, Shah Rukh Khan's sign was absent. He had patterned meaningless speech. Repeating good morning 500 times is not normal. Repeating nursery rhymes, looking at the wall is not normal. And these repetitive behaviors like flapping of the hands or spinning is not normal. So friends, what was this? This was missed case of autism, which existed in this child even before lockdown, or would have been there even if lockdown had not been there. But all of you will say, how do we convince the parents? The first thing to do is do MCHAT, which IAP, ECD has been doing the workshop, workshops, and MCHAT has been explained to all of you. Below 30 months, you can do an MCHAT and show the score to the parents. But it's very important to counsel the parents that, see, I'm seeing poor eye contact. Do you find the same thing? I find he's not reciprocating when I put out my hands to hug the child. When I smile, he does not smile back. Do you also find the same thing? Just involving the parents with this makes them understand that there is a problem. And I tell them a simple thing. If this was because of the lockdown, every child who you know would have faced the same thing. It's not that. So that means there is some extra problem in your child. And what will you advise them? If nothing else, please tell them to completely stop all kinds of screen time especially while eating food, because that's a common thing. And instead of screen time, what you have to tell the parents to increase is increase interaction, increase interaction, increase human interaction at all times with the child. Make the child look at you, play with you, hug you, cuddle you, kiss you, play peekaboo, play, have a pillow fight, whatever. But it has to be human interaction. And this is a new theory we are proposing from New Horizons, how human interaction is actually making the child more normal. Look at this nine-year-old girl, again, similar to the previous girl, episodes of palpitation, sweaty palms, fainting, ECG is normal, EEG is normal, examination is normal, does not want to meet peers or go to school, cries easily. There is a difference between the previous nine-year-old girl and this girl. She was always below average earlier, but a happy child. Teacher said she was a dreamer, which actually means she was inattentive, she had inattention. Teacher thought she's daydreaming but poor at reading and spelling. Parents blame the lockdown and say, because she was on online school, she has suffered, which is not true, because this is missed, earlier missed ADHD with learning disability, which was never diagnosed before. So dear friends, please ask parents detailed history of pre-lockdown behavior and pre-lockdown academics. Ask the child to read their textbooks in front of you. Ask them to write something or look at their notebooks, and you will find patterns of error. Don't interpret or miss the inattention as a present, it, because in girls especially, ADHD may present only with the inattention part. Don't mistake it for daydreaming or creativity or whatever. And the impact of lockdown on this child was even earlier missed as ADHD was not treated, was not intervened for LD. It has, the impact has been 10 times worse and now that has pushed this child into anxiety and depression further needing treatment. Final child, and this is a case or a child from Hyderabad that I saw last month on an online consultation. And it is very, very important to share this with you. This child was referred for the parents had a complaint, Mera bacha baat nahi kar raha hai, in spite of giving him all the therapies for the last six months. Six months back, post lockdown when the things opened up, the parents noted poor speech, thinking it was because of lockdown, they didn't do anything immediately. Finally, at three and a half years, they went to a consultation. The child was diagnosed with hearing loss. 30,000 rupees of hearing aids were sold to the parents. And intervention is being given to this, parent, this child for the last six months, six sessions a day for the last six months. And the child is only repeating nursery rhymes now. 
on just when i switched on the screen and the child parents came in front and the child was behind them it was just a momentary glimpse to know that this child had poor social interaction poor eye contact no social smile shahrukh khan sign was negative restless running around and screen addiction all this you can see in a matter of 10 to 20 seconds in the screen developmental history when we took this child's history online it was classical of autism he was called for assessment to the center because well if some doctor has said he has hearing loss i'm just seeing on the screen how can i be so over confident that i am right we had to call him down and we did his assessments and obviously he had no hearing problem he had only autism and hence friends this slide may be a little provocative some may not like it but please pay attention to it this is not a misdiagnosis only this is wrong information and wrong diagnosis and hence please remember these few clinical tips as anup bhai was so brilliantly explaining to us some clinical pearls indian knowledge make in india speech delay dear friends is a symptom not a diagnosis you will refer to a particular therapist and the diagnose when they come back yes the person said your child has sleep i has speech delay let me speak in hindi mother bacche ke leke aati hai doctor ke paas bolti hai mere bacche ko bukhar hai doctor sahab so doctor sahab nods and says yes your child has fever is this right is this translation is this the diagnosis is this etiology aap bukhar ko english mein fever bol rahe ho to maa bol rahi hai bachcha baat nahi kar raha hai aap bol rahe yes yes speech delay is this a diagnosis please do not accept diagnosis like this send the patient child back to demand the fees back because nobody should give a diagnosis of speech delay they need to know what is causing the speech delay speech and language delay most people will come back with a with a report like this if at all they come back with a report in the first place most will not even have that please remember to ask for a diagnosis very very important to note child goes to a therapist for not speaking six you send refer him bachcha baat nahi kar raha refer to speech therapist comes back 3 months later does not stop speaking keeps repeating all the time good morning good evening good morning uncle good morning doctor are punjabi ke bacche ka accent punjabi hota hai marathi ke bacche ka accent marathi mein hota hai uh, hyderabad ke bacche ka accent hyderabad mein hota hai ye kaun sa problem hai sab bachcho ka accent good morning doctor kyunki ye india ke speech therapist ka accent hai so these children are only copying they are only memorizing please remember this is not treatment this is punishment of the child hyperactivity is a symptom oh your child has hyperactivity what is causing the hyperactivity and lastly dear friends there is too much of focus on par for parents focus on child's activities focus on intervention focus on swinging balancing mai puchta hu anup bhai ki aap gaye kyu the nahi bacche ko baat nahi aa raha tha to kaha ki xyz therapy kariye mai state se naam nahi lena chahta hu अब बच्चा सीढ़ी चढ़ता है बैलेंसिंग करता है स्विंग पे बैठता है बॉल पे बैलेंसिंग करता है मैंने कहा आपको बच्चे को सर्कस में डालना था इसलिए वहाँ ले गए क्या बैलेंसिंग सिखाने के लिए ले गए नहीं नहीं ऐसा प्रॉब्लम था कि आपको घर पे कि बॉल पे बैठता नहीं है नहीं हम गए तो थे बात नहीं कर रहा है लेकिन ये सब लेके आए लेकिन जो समझ नहीं रहा था बात नहीं कर रहा था उसका क्या हुआ उसका अभी भी वही है सो ऑल दिस काइंड ऑफ फोकस ऑन स्विंगिंग बैलेंसिंग मोटर एक्टिविटीज रेड कलर ब्लू कलर शेप शॉर्टिंग is not don't focus on it it is all hocus pocus and it is not an improvement it is a worsening of the child and across india thousands of such centers are setting up which only this thing is being into the child please remember there is definitely a role of pharmacotherapy which as pediatricians we must keep in mind of course you need to refer if after trying whatever we have discussed one month two month please do this in your clinical practice in spite of that if there is no inter- improvement please refer to a certified developmental pediatrician or somebody who can give you a diagnosis and writing who can make a plan for the child and don't forget that this is your child this is your patient whoever you may have referred to it is your job to keep monitoring the child and seeing whether those impre- improvements are coming up or not because very often lot of our children unfortunately are in this situation सुबह से थेरेपी जा रहे हैं स्कूल जा रहे हैं ये एक्टिविटी कर रहे हैं वो एक्टिविटी कर रहे हैं सब चीज़ें मिल रही है सिर्फ इंसान नहीं मिल रहे माँ बाप नहीं मिल रहे लोग नहीं मिल रहे सो इफ दिस इज फ्रॉम कैलविन एंड हॉब्स इफ यू कैन फाइंड इवन वन पर्सन यू रियली लाइक यू आर लकी इज वॉट चिल्ड्रेन आर सेंग एंड हेंस दियर फ्रेंड्स एज वी एज आई पी एंस कैन वी बी दैट वन पर्सन सो फाइनली टेक होम मैसेज इज आर 
COVID-19 lockdown has had a great impact on children's behavior. This includes children who are previously absolutely well, as well as children who had some kind of neurological behavioral problems earlier. This is very difficult to recognize, and parents are thoroughly confused about it because they are going on Google, they are going on YouTube, and there are activities given by the dozen. So please understand that our simple words, whatever we have discussed today, don't worry. I will monitor your child. Come back later. Make the schedule for your child. Interact with your child. Stop screen time. Don't show the child mobile. Play with the child. Hug the child. Kiss the child. Make the child laugh. Just saying all this to the parent is going to be very, very beneficial in, for you. And more than you, it's going to be beneficial to the child. Keep a high level of suspicion. Red flag things, whatever we described today and take an opinion unless you solve these red flags. But finally, it is your child, your patient. You have to keep monitoring till the child is out of the woods. Thank you very much for a very patient listening. Thanks. Mic up. ये शायद पहली बार हुआ कि आई फिनिश्ड ऑन टाइम। थैंक यू डॉक्टर मिया फॉर योर एक्सेलेंट प्रेजेंटेशन ऑन चाइल्डहुड बिहेवियर पोस्ट कोविड एंड हाउ द इम्पोर्टेंस एंड टेकिंग द हिस्ट्री एंड मिस डायग्नोसिंग ऑटिज्म। थैंक यू वेरी मच। आई नो मेनी डाउट्स विल बी देयर, बट इट स्टार्ट आवर टाइम। आई रिक्वेस्ट Now I request uh, Dr. Vineet Saxena, Honorable Secretary General of uh, Central IAP, uh, to deliver about what is new in NRP. So uh, from Central Office of Indian Academy of Pediatrics, our tribute, our shraddhanjali to our legion past president, Professor Y.C. Mathur, and I congratulate, I appreciate uh, Central Zone Pedicon team to uh, uh, de dedicate this hall on his name. So I was listening last presentation of Samir and in the last slide was take home message. For, but for all of you, take home message, don't refer patient to New Horizon or Samir by, even by online because mother will never come back to you. What happened? I referred a patient to Samir it was autism. So father said, no sir, follow up, you will go Mother said, no sir, New Horizon mein online to show you. Respected chairperson sir, respected Bhaskar and Bhaskar sir, uh, by constitution, Dulha of this central zone pedicon, Radha Krishnan sir, my dear EB members, Three uh, 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 already here, and uh, so many friends. So NRP is a flagship program, and uh, I must acknowledge presence of this state as well as uh, Hyderabad to this program, Dr. Jagdish Chandra sir, then my dear Ajay, and now Dr. Surendra, Dr. Nirmala, uh, state academic coordinator are working hard, and as usual, without any post, Dr. Himavind also. So friends, those who are involved in resuscitation or have been trained knows this fact. But what I'm going to tell in next few minutes are we have to adopt some science. It needs some advocacy. We have assets. We have means. But we are not using it. So a lot of changes in the last four or five years uh, with the, this neonatal resuscitation happened. Uh, and <clears throat> still it is in books, but in the middle class cities, small cities, we are not following it. So, okay. okay. Not moving. So 
लाइक सो लाइक यूज ऑफ ऑक्सीजन एवरीबॉडी नो ऑक्सीजन इज हैजार्डस बट स्टिल वी आर गिविंग ऑक्सीजन डिलेड कॉर्ड क्रैम्पिंग एवरीबॉडी नोज बट स्टिल इट इज नॉट इन प्रैक्टिस इन मैनी ऑफ द सेंटर्स सो दिस इज अ स्टैंडर्ड एल्गोरिदम ऑफ दिस न्यूनिटल रिसस्टेशन सिक्स मेजर पॉइंट प्रिपरेशन ऑफ बर्थ दैन इनिशियल स्टेप्स then bag and mask ve ventilation chest compression intubation and medication so i will start with this uh, preparation of birth preparation of birth the new concept is key of success of resuscitation is team of expert not expert in team so it is a team work and a good preparation good coordination and that too tailored to that situation so with a good history taking a team can ante anticipate what is going to happen in next few uh, minutes so a good team work and good coordination is key of success how many personnel should be present during a resuscitation this was a totally gray area but now american academy of pediatrics with come with uh, some solid concrete suggestion that at least one person that is also a mission of our nrp program actually what people say that we follow western world or america but for nrp us is following us so a concept of basic and advanced uh, nrp was long back in our program in our system in the same name they they now came with essential neonatal resuscitation and full new re re resuscitation so at least one person with basic neonatal resuscitation should be should attend every delivery when there is any risk factor there should be a 2% and if scene is complex a team of at least 5% should be there and what basic question should we ask to our obstetrician or who, who is going to deliver uh, baby there is little change earlier it was gestational age amniotic fluid any risk factor and how many babies but now emphasis on umbilical cord management so with obstetric team or our colleague we should plan it beforehand that we will uh, when we will clamp this cord immediately or after 30 second of after 1 minute because there is, is a definite ben uh, benefit of delayed co uh, co cord clamping by ap it is recommended by 30 to 60 second but indian mothers there are high chances of maternal anemia so we recommend it after 1 to 3 uh, minutes so these are the 10 key behavioral skill a good team work good leader effective communication then <clears throat> where we should deliver abdomen we proposed it long back when uh, nssk was launched that baby should be delivered on mother abdomen similar observation similar recommendation came from aap last year only that baby should deliver on mother's abdomen on skin to skin contact then quick assessment of baby on mother abdomen only that baby's term he has good muscle tone is breathing or crying if any of three is no then we have to proceed for next step and uh, if baby is not breathing then quick initial steps we can in perform this initial steps on mother abdomen and there is a change in sequence earlier it was immediately cut cord position airway suction dry and stimulate now perform some st steps on mother abdomen only you can dry there you can stimulate there and still baby is not breathing then you can cut cord and place baby on radiant formen and suction should if very much needed then only suction should be performed how to stimulate during initial steps earlier two uh, methods were there either you flick the sole or back uh, rub the back but 
flicking of soul is now out for stimulation better way is uh, just gently rubbing on back and that uh, can be easily uh, done by on mother abdomen after this uh, performing this quickly with the initial steps then we will observe that baby is breathing if uh, breathing well then only we will check heart rate so this is the uh, how we need two person because one person is performing resuscitation work and other is to check heart rate and vital so at this stage if after initial step baby is not breathing then there is a need of second person so how to check heart rate our earlier teaching was just pul uh, feel cord palpation uh, palpitation and uh, count it but now recommendation is changed heart rate should be checked by stethoscope only stethoscope is available everywhere so this is this is a little change at this stage also then a great debate on how to check cyanosis because cyanosis is a very much subjective disease and it depends on color of baby thickness of his skin ambient light and as we see, saw any cyanosis or any dark color baby we just push off oxygen and start full flow of oxygen so this is a not good practice after covid pulse oximeter is everywhere a good quality pulse oximeter is everywhere even in a maternity home small nursing home but our priority is not for newborn so a vision a mindset or attitude changes mandatory for newborn if pulse oximeter is there neonatal probe cost not too much and for every delivery it should be there in the newborn area so uh, we should not immediately start giving uh, oxygen a target saturation table is there on 1 minute it is 60% then 2 minutes 65% and 85% uh, saturation reach at 10 minute so if oxygen saturation is even uh, after 5 minute it is 85% there is no need to give oxygen so bk oxygen is a drug and uh, there is a serious toxicity and this also this was very earlier recommended by dr ramji but uh, there was a very large study published but ap recommendation came very late i think in seventh edition so oxygen is guided by pulse oximetry only and uh, we should not use 100% oxygen or extra oxygen so question where to place this uh, uh, pulse oximeter uh, probe it is on right wrist or thinar uh, eminence and how much percentage of oxygen should be give so if blender is there start with room air and gradually uh, increase oxygen but if oxygen is not there we can achieve by moving close or far from nose and if uh, this uh, your oxygen tube is 5 uh, uh, cm away this is will approximately give uh, 36 or 40% of oxygen so oxygen toxicity and uh, uh, a low oxygen is a method to give then there are uh, three methods but one can give oxygen by tail end of our this ambu bag if your reservoir is a corrugated tube you can even give oxygen by that and only then whenever there is a meconium stained baby apneic or depressed our teaching was immediately intubate and suck the all meconium but science has changed it is not good to see a dead baby with clean trachea just clear that meconium and start bagging with your self resuscitation bag so no need it is not mandatory to intubate every baby or clean trachea of every depressed meconium state baby just clear uh, trachea by your uh, suction uh, catheter and start uh, bagging by your self resuscitation bag then these are the devices how much oxygen should we give when we are going to start this positive pressure 
ventilation by ambu bag. So for preterm, uh, for term, we should start at room air. And for preterm, it should be uh, between 20 to 30 percent uh, if baby is less than 35 uh, weeks. So how to give, give this uh, little higher oxygen? The simple way, or you can say jugad is connect oxygen to your ambu bag but remove reservoir. That will uh, uh, deliver a, a, approximately 40% oxygen and uh, nearly match recommendations. So <clears throat> now you have started bagging positive pressure ventilation by self-inflatory bag. What is the sign of uh, uh, that your ventilation is effective? What our Simple thought is, if chest is moving, everything is good. But if it's not like that, uh, one assistant should continuously check the heart rate. If ch heart rate is rising, then ventilation is effective. If heart rate is not rising, then only you have to check that chest is moving or not. If heart rate is not rising, chest is not moving, then you have to perform ventilation corrective step. Some more clarity in recent rec recommendation. Earlier, MR SOPA is the, uh, the steps, mask reposition, mask adjustment, reposit airway, then suction mouth, open mouth, increase pressure, and intubate. Earlier, it was written as give some breath, but now a concrete recommendation is there that after uh, perform two ventilation corrective steps, Give five breaths, then two more, then five breaths, then two more. It is like this. Then something about intubation. Intubation is now mandatory if you are going, if your positive pressure ventilation is not working and you are approaching for uh, this, this uh, chest compression. So how to check this length of endotracheal tube? Earlier, very simple formula, six plus weight, but this is not a correct practice. We should use a measuring ta tape and we should keep it in uh, our delivery room. So a distance from uh, uh, nasal septum to ear tragus is the length uh, which we should insert. So six plus uh, one formula is not no more recommended. No. Now, chest compression with positive uh, pressure ventilation. We have intubated baby and went to check and started uh, this chest compression. Then was, went to check heart rate. Earlier it was after 45 seconds, but new rec recommendation after 60 seconds of coordinated chest compression and positive pressure ventilation, then only we should check heart rate and uh, it is very much desirable to intubate before performing this uh, uh, chest compression. And a new recommendation from AAP that when you are going to intubate baby, because perfusion is low and pulse oximeter probe may not read uh, that uh, readings of uh, saturation, at that time it is very desirable to place a probe of uh, cardiac monitor on baby chest. If cardiac monitor is there, so at this stage we should place a probe of uh, this cardiac monitor uh, on baby's chest while intubating. Earlier it was when we are going to perform chest compression. So <clears throat> a little change in method of chest compression. Earlier two techniques were there. One was two finger technique and second was pressing chest or sternum with two thumb. But now, two finger technique is not recommended because pressure is not actual or very from each stroke. So right technique is two thumb technique only. And uh, after 60 seconds of this job, if baby is not breathing well or heart rate is below 60, then it is time to give uh, umbilical cannulation and give some uh, cardiotonics, that is epinephrine. Some good recommendation now, because earlier dose of this epinephrine, IV as well 
uh, endotracheal dose was variable. It was uh, 1, 0.1 to 0.3 millimeter per kg, but now it is fixed 0.2 ml per kg. Adrenaline available in our country is 1 to 1,000, so we have to make a stock solution. 1 ml of adrenaline and 9 ml of uh, this normal saline and take uh, uh, 0.2 ml per kg from uh, this solution as a dose for endotracheal uh, uh, installation of adrenaline doses 1 ml per kg earlier it was 0.5 to 1 ml per kg uh, range was there after giving this uh, umbilical dose of uh, adrenaline we have to give some um, saline for a push dose is now fixed earlier it was 0.5 to 2 ml per kg now it is fixed that we should give 3 ml of normal saline after uh, this thing after giving to uh, each dose of epinephrine or adrenaline volume expander is the same 10 ml per kg with 30 or 50 ml syringe over 5 to 10 minutes and now the last is when to stop this resuscitation earlier recommendation when you start resuscitation effort wait for two minutes after 10 minutes after every four efforts is babies is still asystolic then you have to stop but there was confusion between birth and time to start resuscitation because as soon as baby came out person start resuscitating so now uh, uh, this recommendation is more concrete, more solid that there is a good time after 20 minutes after birth, you have performed all your work, all efforts and its baby is still apneic, then you can stop resuscitation. So that's, this is all about uh, this and uh, NRP after COVID is doing very well. It is a flagship program and we are, uh, we are, we are getting a very good appreciation from every state government, government of India. In fact, on the last to last uh, Sunday, NRP state program for UP was inaugurated by Deputy Chief Minister. So my thanks to organizers for uh, keep, keep putting this uh, topic uh, for the centers and petition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vineet, for highlighting the important changes in the 8th edition of NRP compared to 7th edition. Thank you very much. This is one of the important things for uh, reducing neonatal mortality. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Th thank you, sir. Uh, the next, uh, we are going to have AK Dikshit oration. I request the chairpersons, Dr. K. Raghav and uh, uh, C. N. Reddy, sir, and Dr. Vinit Saxena to take the mementos. Next, Dr. I request uh, the, um, President TCB, Dr. Sunkoj Bhaskar, and uh, Secretary, Dr. RSV Sri Krishna, to take over the dais. A request. The next section is uh, Dr. A.K. Dikshit oration of uh, AP, uh, IAPTCB. I request uh, President Dr. Sunkoj Bhaskar and Dr. R.S.V. Sri Krishna of TCB to chair the session. And I invite the the speaker, Dr. Sanjeev Upadhyay from UNICEF. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, this plenary session is Indian Academy of Pediatrics Twin Cities branch oration. I request our uh, orator, Dr. Sanjeev Upadhyay, Health Specialist UNICEF, to please come on stage. Request our president, Dr. Sunkoj Bhaskar, to join as we garland uh, Dr. A.K. Dikshit and 
recall him in our fond memories today. I request the chairpersons to start the session. Yeah. Good afternoon all and uh, once again I welcome you all to this uh, prestigious IAP Central Zone Pedicon 2022 and as well to the prestigious oration of IAP Twin Cities branch. This is uh, Dr. A.K. Dixit uh, oration. Uh, Dr. A.K. Dixit bio sketch is as follows. Dr. Aravind Kashina Dixit was born on 19th May 1923. It is uh, school education at Shantiniketan, college education in Pune, medical studies at Mumbai. Trained for medicine and pediatrics with uh, Dr. Kohelo, established practice in Hyderabad, and honorary appointment in Usmania Medical College and Usmania General Hospital. Nilofar Hospital for Children and Women, where he headed Unit 3 as honorary chief, and he was really busy having had a roaring practice and presented a number of scientific papers. For example, Tremor Syndrome, foreign body in respiratory tract in children. He was very meticulous in maintaining the medical records and case papers during those times. He was a great humane and sympathetic and empathetic. He was very punctual and devoted to his professional work. His hobbies were social beauty and painting and music lover. His wife, Srimati Jayashri Dekshit, and he had he has a son, Dr. Uday Dikshit, and Dr. Anita Rao, Mrs. Arati, and all settled abroad. Uh, Uday is in Australia. And uh, the list of the eminent doctors who delivered the Dr. A.K. Dikshit oration earlier were Dr. K.G. Deshai from Karnataka in 1987, Dr. S.M. Merchant, Bombay, Dr. Y.K. M. Dekar, sir, Mumbai, Dr. Ambada Spartak, USA, Dr. C.M. Habibullah, Hyderabad, Dr. Y.C. Mathur, sir, Hyderabad, Dr. O.P. Gai, New Delhi, Anand Pandit, Pune, Dr. Kwang Singh, Hawk, Singapore, Dr. R.N. Srivastava, New Delhi, Dr. Swati Bhave, Mumbai, Dr. Jacob John, Vellur, Dr. Nageshwar Reddy, Hyderabad, Dr. J.M.K. Murthy, Hyderabad, Dr. Meherban Singh, New Delhi, Dr. Tapan Ghosh, Kolkata, Dr. Veena Karla, New Delhi, and Dr. Natarajan, Mumbai, and presently a renowned personality who is none other than Dr. Sanjeev Upajay from UNICEF. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's my pleasure, my privilege, and honor to welcome the orator today for the very prestigious Dr. A.K. Dikshit uh, oration. Dr. Sanjeev Upadhyay, he is a public health specialist with experience over two decades and expertise in the field of child health. He did his post-graduation from uh, uh, Vartha, the Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, 
and soon after that he worked in uh, UCMS and Lady Harding Medical College in Delhi. Later he started his public health career with USAID and he has uh, managed projects worth over 27 million and a majority of them have been on urban health and also on maternal and newborn child health. In 2009, October, he joined UNICEF Hyderabad field office and he has been with the field office for more than a decade. And over a decade, he has changed the face of public health, especially in the field of maternal and child health. A few significant achievements of his have been the special newborn care units, wherein the transformation of newborn health, as you see now, across the country and especially so in Telangana has been one of his major achievements. He is also credited with introducing midwifery into the domain of public health and we now have midwifery as a mainstream in obstetric care. He has also assisted Government of India and has gone on international assignments as well. He has many international papers, publications and presentations to his credit. And it's our pleasure to welcome Dr. Sanjeev Upadhyay Health Specialist of UNICEF Hyderabad Field Office to deliver the very prestigious Dr. A.K. Dikshit oration. Over to you, Dr. Sanjeev. You can continue. A very good afternoon to all. Thank you very much, organizers of this conference, uh, for inviting me for this very, very prestigious oration. I was just going through the list of those who presented in the past, and they, most of them are very, very eminent. I'm sure all of them are very eminent. And I feel myself so humble and so thankful to all of you, to including me in that list. So thank you, uh, Dr. Bhaskar, and the whole organizing team of uh, the Central Zone Padicon. When I got this invite, I mean, the thought which was coming to my mind, what to present, what to share with all of you. Is there something which comes with my experience, with this very prestigious, very reputed organization? And I have a long association with Indian Academy of Pediatrics and its other sister associations, professional bodies. And for the sake of this oration, I'm clubbing my most of my experiences in this presentation. Uh, please take it with a little pinch of salt because this is an outsider's view. I am not an insider, but I did little research, little work with Indian Academy of Pediatrics, and I'm going to show you in my subsequent slides. So I have just divided the whole span of my professional life that I spent with Indian Academy of Pediatrics uh, in th three or four different phases, and I'm just sharing all of those with you. The first is the early age, like most of us when we are under doing graduation or during our post-graduation days. And there we know any academic body or professional body because the seminars, the symposium, the different health talks which are being organized by Indian Academy of Pediatrics. And those were the days when the universal immunization program, the breastfeeding, with a famous program of child survival and safe motherhood, what we call as a CSSM. Some of old timers who are sitting in this hall, I could see Dr. Rangaya, Dr. Ajay Kumar, uh, Dr. Srin Nath, uh, Prof. Ali Melu, Prof. Hima Bindu. Um, I know most of you from last 10 years plus. 
So, and I'm sure they would know that these were the programs which were led by Indian Academy of Pediatrics in past. Medical colleges used to be in lead, and they used to take these sessions across the country for students, uh, different cadre of health workers, uh, nursing students, and at times with their interaction with public as well. And we know the role of Indian Academy of Pediatrics as a professional body in pulse polio, so I need not to say that. The second phase, which I just want to share with all of you, very interesting part, which is somewhere close to when NRHM being launched in 2005. And I was being hired by one of the international agencies to undertake a research on all professional bodies who are in India. And I did a study, went to IAP headquarters, many state offices. Uh, I remember Dr. Raju Shah was then the president, Bharat Agarwal was the, the secretary general in Mumbai, Nitin Shah and others. They were the people who were in leadership that time. So I did the study, and it is not just Indian Academy of Pediatrics. The study included Indian, Indian Medical Association, FOXI, uh, Association of Physicians of India, Surgeons Association, Chemists and Druggists, Nursing, means all uh, these professional bodies I thoroughly studied. And when I sub prepared the report, I shared with the headquarters central office, they liked it so much that Dr. Bharat converted that, that document into a report properly printed it and shared it with all members. Yesterday, I was just doing little Googling on Indian Academy's website, and interestingly, what I found, the document which I wrote long time back, that's the, still the document which is connected to the link which actually talks about the organizational structure. It's the same document, the font is same, with little changes here and there. So it's still the same document on and it was uploaded in 2012, though I wrote it in 2005. It, it, it hasn't changed. Now the third phase, I can say that IAP as an organization where I recognize them as a technical partner. I worked closely with IAP for programs like Zinc and ORS, and that was the time between 2006 to 2010, uh, when several national programs were being launched uh, they were rolled out across the country. I was part of uh, a big donor agency called U.S. Agency for International Development. We used to have large projects, and there we were interacting, and they were like part of consortium. So someone is implementing the project, but IAP was a technical partner in that. And during that time, they helped, or I worked on issues, for example, on urban health, because their presence largely urban areas, polio program, and of course, zinc ORS campaigns. And the last, but the most important, probably most intense engagement of mine with IAP was last 10, 12 years, from 2010 to till 2022, or till date. And that was the time when I joined UNICEF, I moved to Hyderabad, started with working with a lot of you at different points of time, whosoever in the leadership position. And this is my longest period of association with Indian Academy of Pediatrics. We worked in areas such as a lot of new vaccines. Measles rubella was launched during that time. The inactivated polio vaccine, uh, pentavalent was launched. IAP was a very close partner during these launches, those campaigns. And several of you are present during our sessions with media and also with training, training of different, different cadres. Polio eradication was very important achievement during that time. And as Dr. Sri Krishna mentioned about the newborn care, uh, we saw a sea change in newborn care in India. That was the biggest achievement of the country and IAP, I can say proudly being a part of that. Diarrhea, the current program, what we call as uh, intensified diarrhea control fortnight. Uh, when uh, for pneumonia, we have a new program called SARS. Uh, I'm very happy to say that we also worked very closely with IEP's 
infectious disease chapter where uh, the organization came out with uh, a new position paper we call as a hyderabad declaration on amr probably one of the front runners in india and there are many more the list is long is 12 years is a long period so i mean now these are some of my observations and uh, these are purely from you know an outside perspective uh, the areas where i found them very good their nation wide presence is a national organization you have lot of state offices you have lot of zonal offices you have city chapters you have different uh, specialties you have different sub specialties uh, is quite well organized uh, between different chapters city chapter state chapters specialty sub specialties you have large number of members more than 25000 when i last counted maybe more i'm sure dr bhaskar me know the exact numbers now uh, i think this was the only organization out of all i studied and i found which was most closely associated with national programs whether it was a cssm or where it doing the design of reproductive and child health rch1 or then subsequently rch2 navjat shishu suraksha karyakram imnci fmnci facility based newborn care so this is the organization who is very closely associated with national program iip is another proudly can say that they are part of several policy making groups they have a seat on those technical committees those technical groups which advise government to design new programs and roll them out and this is just a small list i know there are several for example uh, inep india new one action plan for the new vaccines adverse events following immunizations different kind of campaigns where iap was a very very integral part of it off late uh, iap has been closely associated with developing different standard treatment guidelines on multiple health conditions and they have a position paper also academicians researchers of national international eminence they are the members of iap uh, they have a huge influence on parent community by virtue of the work they do a uh, very important thing they do their public dealing that made them so important when it comes to their influence on different kind of communities and societies the scientific journal that they uh, publish which is indian pediatrics is probably the only scientific journal which has got highest impact factor against india journals uh, so that's again uh, you know uh, something which organizers should be proud of and of late i can say last two and two and half years and this showed their adaptability they adapt themselves so well to a new normal when covid hit us organization moved to virtual platforms there was series of webinars by indian pediatrics they came out with a very special channel what we call as a diap and they delivered highly technical sessions on you know on different sort of health conditions health problems so these are the things where organization is really very good now coming to areas where organization can do better and this is what i found that members though they are too many is a too big a number but they are loosely connected they are not connected as strong as we see in most of business communities or business organizations uh typically people they have a short term goals and they are largely limited to annual conferences zonal conferences sometimes uh very few workshops or very few programs even the business development is that's also around conference and the events that's also i think an area where they can work further uh i worked with different state chapters i also worked with the national central office what i found that they lack on several statutory compliances which are very important for any organization 
activities typically are not sustainable beyond a year. Every president comes with a new agenda and during his or her tenure it is rolled out and then they are closed. So they are not sustainable, they are not long enough. Then, though they have a huge impact, influence in the society, but if it comes to outreach, I see that they, has, they used it in a very, very limited fashion, primarily limited to only urban areas, though they have such huge number uh, of members all across the country. They, have, they are very strong when they talk to people, they have a huge following, but again I see there is scope to strengthen media, including social media. The engagement is limited. And these are some of the recommendations I would suggest if I have to make any changes, these are the things I would like to see in the organizations going for new accreditations, and there are several. There are many which are applicable for civil society organizations, for any not-for-profit organization. They can go for those and certifications. Fulfilling all statutory compliances, which are again mandatory, more so in current environment, especially if you are trying to seek grants from the government and also from different international donors. So you need to have those statutory compliances in place. Design and implement long-term projects, means beyond conferences. It can be anywhere between three to five years. Let's not have a short-term projects, have medium to long-term projects. We should develop a business plan, develop long-term projects and activities, we should train our people how to write a good research grant, or in fact these grants can be extended to students, postgraduates, and at times to different colleges or the member states. Then we can have a dedicated team whose job is to actually just to make sure that we have sufficient educate funds available for us. Their performance should be assessed based on how much money they mobilized. And my way to look at it, if the organization has a potential to mobile, or organization has mobilized 10 crore for some event, and I see a potential to mobilize 25 crores, I see that as a loss of 15 crores. That's how I see this. So knowing this community who's so strong, who has such a strong influence on people, societies, bureaucracy, and also governments, in spite of that, we are not able to make best use of this strength. This is point number four, largely I am coming from UNICEF side, where I see there is a huge influence on parents and capacity for engagement with the parents, where IAP can play a huge role in multiple areas. Just to give you an example, responsive parenting, and Samir was making a presentation a little while back, and there I see a huge role again, um, a big role for organization where they can play in the domain of early childhood development, which is still poorly understood even amongst doctors. I'm not counting parents here. So this is the time where organization should put its foot down, foot down and see that we have a good pool of resources who can guide societies, governments, and also academicians in this area. The point number five is, again, I'm coming from a donor's perspective. There I see a lot of restriction. I need to put a lot of efforts just to make sure that funds are transferred. I am a donor, and I am putting my effort that funds are transferred. And it's purely because of organization does not have right sort of structures in place. For managed funds, either there is no financial manual, there is no HR manual, there is no procurement policy. These are the things where every donor typically looks at before giving any funds to any organization. So it's very important, it's a high time that organization should look at developing these capacity within the organization and try to set up those structures. Capacity building of key people, at least people, those who are in leadership, they should remain there for some time they should understand simple management tools, and they are not too difficult. Doctors, most of us, we are cream of the society after plus 12 when we entered in medical schools. We were probably brightest in our classes. And these tools are not too great. An ordinary MBA knows. So it's not too difficult for us to have at least some understanding of these tools, what we call as 
log frame analysis or results based management where we can actually look at our performance then building capacities on grant management and this is not only important for the central office and i'm making this statement samir is sitting from central dr vinith is here and many senior people who are from executive board just to make them understand these are the things which are need of the time so in a nutshell if i have to say something knowing an organization who has who has such brilliant minds who has such a strong influence on different stakeholders knowing so much but still this country is looking for a good model for child health we don't have unfortunately so my dream is that this group of people such a brilliant organization should come out with a model for a perfect child health and development for our people in india so that's my dream for this organization and i'm sure uh, with all of you sitting here certainly take this message from this my small speech there are many ways to do it and dr samir your attention means if i am sitting as a treasurer i will bring either mckenzie or price water coopers or any of these big consulting companies just to hire them for 3 months and they will give me a road map what we can do and what potential we have in future and that will pave way to take this organization from great to greatest so i stop here and thank you for your attention uh, thank you very much sir you have given a, a useful uh, precisely gave us a great information thank you so much sir yes sir uh, thank you thank you dr sanjeev uh, wonderful insights i know i'm one leg here and one leg into unicef and these are extremely useful insights and these help us as an organization to dream big go far forward as well thank you so much for delivering a wonderful oration uh, request you to please uh, come forward uh, for honors satish thank you very much next session i request the chair persons dr p durga prasad and dr k uh, dr ranganath to come to the dais the speaker is dr k radha krishna who is the vice president of central zone and uh, the topic is my experiences and your gains
I request Dr. Sunkoj Baskar to chair the session, sir. Who is the other one? The lunch will be served from 1 to 3 p.m. There is no lunch break. It's at B1. By lift, you can go there. Dr. Radha Krishna doesn't need any introduction. Dr. Radha Krishna is from a student of Andhra Medical College. He did his MBBS from Andhra Medical College and he did his post graduation also from Andhra Medical College. Later on, he joined government services and worked as a teacher and a very good treatment person and having a lot of respect in Vishakapatnam, you go and say Radha Krishna, everybody recognizes him. For 12 years, he was in government service. Later on, he started his own practice where he is a successful person and he has done a lot of service to the other uh, Vaisak people. And he is a committed teacher and he continued to teach while he was practicing in a private practice. Over to Dr. Radha Krishna. Thank you, Ranganath. Good afternoon, one and all. Am I audible and clear? Yeah. <clears throat> no. Uh, okay. Now, um, if one learns from his mistakes, it's great, but painful. But if you learn from others' mistakes, that is the experiences, without experiencing the pain, it is just fantastic. Iron mics, yeah, got it, got it, yeah. Thank you. Now, all modern lectures are in the form of cases only. Pediatricians usually like a small presentation of a case, diagnosis, treatment in two minutes. That's what they like. These are all the interests of a practicing pedi pediatrician. So today is a T20. Already two minutes have been wasted. Okay, I'll present eight to ten cases and eight take-home messages. Now, look at this one and a half year old child who was brought with bow legs on examination, except for the bow legs, you did not have anything. Investigations were all normal, X-ray, calcium, except phosphorus, which was elevated, 6.2 milligrams. Even alk phosphatase was normal. So, I looked at the causes of rickets, and what did I find? Renal failure. I, uh, I had only renal failure in which alkaline phosphates could be elevated, but we did the other investigations in which everything was normal. So this child had a mild bow legs, except that nothing else was abnormal, and elevated phosphorus. So what could be the cause of this elevated phosphorus in this case? I did not know. We had seen similar cases for 10, 15 years, but I did not know what was the reason for this. I shouted at the lab people saying that you were doing idiotic investigations. A normal child, how could you have a normal elevated phosphorus when everything was fine? In one of the conferences which I attended 20 years ago, I knew my folly. What was my folly was, the speaker told me that in the age group below six months, age group below 12 months, in the age group below five years, Please remember, remember, phosphorus is very high. It could be as high as uh, the 8 milligram, 7 milligram, or 6 milligram. So, what is the lesson learned? Attend conferences. Attend conference. Had I not attended that conference, I wouldn't have known that phosphorus in an infant and child can be as high as 6 or 7 milligrams. But there is again a caveat. When you attend a conference, sit in the lecture hall, not in the dining room or in the stalls. Okay. What is this? Hemangioma. 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 Okay. Basically, hemangiomas are classified as capillary, cavernous, mixed, and strawberry. That was 20 years ago. Okay. I'll tell you how you classify hemangiomas and the lesson learned. Look at this red lesion observed in the second week of birth and grew rapidly, similar case, 
look at this red lesion on the forehead. Present from birth, no progression or no regression. Look at the same history, red lesion present at birth, no progression or regression. So please comment, you had two lesions. One on the left, which were present from birth, no regression, no progression. One on the, two on the right, where you had a red lesion in the second week, which grew rapidly. So basically, all these were, I was calling them as hemangiomas. Anything which was red was called as hemangiomas. So basically, these are all vascular lesions, which are divided as vascular malformations and vascular tumors. So let me, there's a lot of classification, but just let me take the prototype of a vascular malformation that is a port white strain and a vascular tumor that is of infantile hemangioma. So vascular malformation are developmental disorders of blood vessel formation. On the other hand, tumors are, vascular tumors are from, result from endothelial or hyperplasia and proliferation. So anything that is red is not a hemangioma. So the vascular lesion which I had shown on the left are present at birth. They do not progress. They do not regress. On the other hand, hemangiomas have three phases. They progress rapidly in the first three, six months. There's a stationary phase and then finally a then they regress. Okay. So all the three which I had shown here are vascular tumors. What will happen to them? They will Gra gradually increase and finally they regress. On the other hand, a vascular malformation, she had it from birth, a mother who had it from birth, that is a vascular malformation. It will not disappear, only is you can camouflage it. So some, look at this child of six months, with time at the age of three years, 50% improvement, at the age of five years, practically everything has disappeared. Now. 30% of newborn babies have these hemangiomas. What is it? Is it a vascular malformation or a vascular tumor? None of the above. So that was none of the above. It is nevus simplex will disappear spontaneously. Some and summary, everything that is red is not a, that is not a hemangioma. You have, that is a vascular lesion which can be a vascular malformation at the left side, a port wine nevus, and a vascular, uh, and an infantile hemangioma that is a vascular tumors. Vascular tumors, they disappear. Vascular malformations, they don't disappear. Many practical things are not mentioned in books. If mentioned also, you do not grasp it. Listen to good experienced speakers. One of my senior, 20 years, gave this lecture and tell, told me, Radha Krishna, anything that is red, don't label it as hemangioma. I've shown you vascular malformation. I've shown you vascular hemangioma. So everything that, re that is red is not a hemangioma. Look at this video. This fellow is dancing. Whenever he gets a sense of defecation, he will dance. Whenever he wants to defecate, he will dance. So please remember, any the constipation, functional constipation between one and three years, 99% of the mothers say they defecate in standing position. Functional constipation, only one question I ask, between one and three years, they stand in defecation. So that was the typical example of a retentive posturing. They hold a chair, they dance like this. So the question is, do they dance like that to encourage defecation? or do they dance like that to discourage defecation? For 20 years, I thought they were doing it to defecate, but my son-in-law told, they do this to hold defecation. They do this to hold defecation. So many times in life, we have a misconception which goes on and goes on until somebody tells this is wrong. I had a misconception that these children dance like that to hold defecation, no. To, uh, to, to defecate, but that is done to hold defecation. Look at this child. Now, whenever a child comes, we always speak to them. So I was asking, hi, what's your name? You look smart. I asked her at school, you don't like me. She doesn't answer at all. I asked the parents, the parents say, 
whenever she is house at house she speaks so well but whenever she is outside she will never to speak with anybody okay what is the diagnosis now in my first 20 years of practice i saw so many cases 10 or 20 naaku kuda koopam vachi gillisi vaanni kai ani erchevar i didn't know the diagnosis they speak well at house actually and the sound rattle the sound is not coming okay the diagnosis is selective mutism selective mutism is a condition in which children do not speak they speak only with family members more frequent in girls these children are negativistic poor socialization over dependence and with times they improve they speak well at house they don't speak in the community now how did i get this 20 years ago i was asked to give a lecture on delayed speech approach to delayed speech so when i went through this topic i got the answer so try to give lectures wherever possible yeah and can i have the uh, okay sound is not coming my senior rang me up it's okay it's okay i am quite thankful that i see a lot of audience here delegates that are sacrificing their lunch and staying back but definitely it will be useful my senior rang me up on fine morning and said his smart little grandson is 9 months was having abnormal episodes each episode lasting 5 seconds okay 2 to 3 episodes per week onset term termination of the event was abrupt he was not sure the best thing is send a video abhi uh, look at that look at that look at that okay was that a seizer i also did not know okay they were typically shuddering attacks now what i did i also did not understand i sent this video to ramesh konanke of hyderabad and he said it was shuddering attacks these are non epileptic obviously confused with epileptic seizures will improve spontaneously alila bigusta like that shudder you take a bucket of cold water you splash on a person vunukutar mir that is a typical shuddering attack what is the lesson learned somebody's doubts are also our doubts somebody's doubts are also our doubts look at this case two year old child brought for general checkup he was already he was a healthy normal child given uh, he was due for mmr i convinced the parents same the mmr is going to i gave the vaccine the patient went out the mother brought back the baby dead doctor you kill my child i was terrified okay i took the child i put the child on the couch he was not moving breathing hardly heart occasional beat my heart rate went to 180 the, his heart rate was hardly there took the child into the pacu i knew it was an i knew it was an anaphylactic reaction we resuscitated the child heart rate gradually went from 5 to 102080 respiration started and discharged him we did not charge anything i was upset then i decided that particular child who came for a general checkup i convinced them ace kon vaccine ace kon manchi manchi man i thought the child this time i missed the child i almost killed the child i attended uh, the hope program many years ago and in the hope program unfortunately they to told us there was a topic on anaphylaxis okay let us see yeah in this anaphylaxis they showed us breathing increases pulse rate increases then i told my story that i had a child whose respiration stopped heart rate stopped then they told me that child had syncopal attack and not anaphylaxis in anaphylaxis respiratory rate increases noisy breathing heart rate increases they'll be sweating in your case heart rate decrease respiration decrease so he had a syncopal attack so i went through the literature and found that practically nobody died of vaccination nobody died of vaccination so please remember encourage vaccination i am a strong encourager so what is the lesson learned whenever i have a doubt ask whenever you have a doubt ask so in that conference i asked them did i really kill the child nearly kill the child they said that was a syncopal attack 
Okay, that was a 12-year adolescent child, swelling of uh, two months duration, mild pain, anti-inflammatory drugs, no satisfactory improvement. Last consultation, orthopedician put in a needle, there was a bloody tap. So, we did a PT, PT, everything was normal. On examination, you can see the right knee was slightly swollen. X-rays was normal. Whenever you get a difficult case, please remember to take a list. Please remember to take a list or use a flow sheet. Hypokalemia you have got, take a list. Hyperkalemia, take a list. Metabolic acidosis, take a list. You will get the answer. You get only one thing. So in this particular case, what did we do? We took the list of arthritis. So what was the approach to the arthritis? Multiple joint, single joint? That was a single joint. So in the single joint, was the child ill-looking, well-looking, well-appearing? So here, was it post-viral, post-CGRA, hemophilia, when they put in a needle, they had blood, so it turned out to a pigmented willow nodular synovitis. So the lesson learned is, whenever you have a difficult case, one or two clues you have, you take a flow sheet or list, you will get the answer many times. Now, 20 years of, 10 years ago, I used to, have, whenever we had a hypoglycemia in a neonate or an infant, I used to get terrified. My postgraduate just said, don't get worried, there's a wonderful flow sheet. So, whenever you have hypoglycemia in an infant, look for ketosis, look for lactate. By this combination of ketosis and lactate, which is possible in any place, we'll have a combination of four headings. Look for ketosis or look for lactate. You'll have a combination of four. So always use algorithms, always use flow sheets. Okay, 10 year old child Deepthi was brought uh, for, with a normal height parents. Then, when I went, told to the parents, Emanti Deepthi chili leda anan, leda anti maak chala bayam anti, ilat potipil mala rundo sar puttasa anti, nonsense anti, meeko. Genetics and then explain just and explain just this is autosomal dominant condition. If one of the parents are affected, the child will be affected. Ikkada miru idharu normal height unna rani me papa de novo mutation and a condition and the which in the rundo sar guarantee ga meek radu and chip pen. So they were very happy with my explanation and went away. I said thumbs up guarantee. After two years, they came back with another child who was an achondroplasia. I was really upset, dumbstruck. Guarantee lo, warranty la nichi sen I was really dumbstruck. After five years, I attended a conference at SGPGI. After then, they said there was an entity known as mosaic exam. In mosaic exam, you have a peripheral blood mosaic exam, normal cells, abnormal cells, two, three variety of the chromosome. In germline mosaic exam, what happens is only the ovaries will have abnormal combination of abnormal cells, normal, abnormal, or two, three varieties of patterns. So, in that particular case, it was a germline mosaic exam. So, the lesson learned is never guarantee or warranty. 100% are bound, don't use the word. Me dictionary learns guarantee, warranty, and it is a value. Okay, in my experience of 37 years, having seen 5 lakh children, I've seen so many times children, parents out there, bond God and in the Bhagundi and Chip in 5 minutes, so they have died. So, no warranty or guarantee in medical literature. Okay, 7 year old child brought with mild headaches, parents insisted on CT. We did a CT, exactly we got a lesion, granuloma, exactly in the midline. Okay, then. What I did was, we were worried, is it NCC or tuberculoma? If NCC, should we treat, avoid treatment? If tuberculoma, how many days to treat? So I did not know, so I did a referral, and the neurologist said, it is not a NCC, it is a colloid cyst of third ventricle, seen in 0.5 to, 0.5 to 2 percent, harmless, just leave it. So lesson learned, whenever you don't understand, refer. Whenever, after all, in cricket, what has happened? There is a third umpire also. If this umpire is not able to understand, he is taking the referral, third umpire. So, whenever dirt, whenever you have a dirt, refer. Ainsley said, I have no particular talent, I'm merely inquisitive. Sometimes we see mothers with, mothers or parents having such abnormalities. Try to learn what it is. Many times we see these lesions. Mothers having these lesions. What is that? Did you, 
Chala sal, my PGs are there, they don't even have the interest. Sheila, mother of Sad, what is this lesion? Anybody, one can tell me? Anybody shout? No, that was a typical syringoma. That was a typical syringoma. Okay, it's a harmless condition. Okay, once, one more case, will I be given time? Okay, last case, two, two minutes. Three-year-old child brought with disturbed episodes of seeps, cries and talks. It appears as if he's throwing a tantrum, confused. Okay, that's it. Each episode lasts for 15, 30 minutes, six episodes. And whenever he gets this episode, when a grandmother bite gal pota di, then ki nemakai cuttingo, uppu dishti, neela dishti. She comes back after 10 minutes. Everything is controlled. She thinks she's a hero. Pediatrician suspects threadworms. He gives the treatment. What was that? We see so many children like this. They wake up in the night, dance, they see half asleep, half awake. Anybody, one can tell me what is that? So common. Okay. Confusional arousals. So common. I've seen hundreds of cases. Confusional arousals. So, mo most common in children uh, last for 15, 30, 40 minutes. Don't confuse it for a night terror or threadworms. What is the lesson learned? Use technology. Because the parents brought the video to me, I could see the video and tell that it was a confusional arousal. Last thing, how do you stop a sneeze? Now, I was a post I was a house surgeon in 1980. The ophthalmologist after surgery told to the PG, Are scatrack surgery tarot tomokonda dagu konda chodandi and the PG asked, sir, I can ask him not to cough. How, how can I say not to sneeze? Yes. You can stop a sneeze. Many times we see, we get a sneeze when we are eating or with a super VIP or in a procedure. You can stop a wheeze. Next time you try, I've tried many times. Just press on the upper lip. Thank you one and all. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Radhakrishna. You are unique in presenting the cases. You take up the cases which they apparently look simple, but they are so informative, so useful for the practicing pediatricians, probably even for the academicians. A wonderful topic, wonderful presentation. You had given us the 10 guidelines. Thank you so much. Evidence-based medicine not evidence-based teaching what we had till now. Thank you. The next topic is by Dr. Rawat. I request the chairperson, Dr. B. Venkateshwar Rao, Burma Venkateshwar Rao Garu, and Dr. Shekhar. The topic is the GINA Guidelines 2022 updates. <laughs>
I request the speaker, Dr. Rawat, to come to the dais. I request Dr. Rawat to come out to the dais. Asthma is a global problem. In 2019, asthma affected more than 250 million people and caused nearly half a million deaths. Jinnah is an independent organization funded solely by the sale and licensing of its reports and figures. It was established by the World Health Organization and the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute in 1993. It aims to increase awareness about asthma and to improve asthma prevention and management through a coordinated worldwide effort. effort. Now I request Dr. Rawat to continue the session. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Chairperson, for your kind introduction. I bring greetings from IP National Respiratory Chapter. Thank you, Dr. Arkala Bhaskar and Dr. Sunkoj for inviting me for this very important session, GINA 2022 updates. As we all know, asthma is, is a very important topic in our day-to-day -day clinical practice, and uh, we are really thankful to GINA for looking at huge uh, literature and then updating this every year and giving it in a ready-made platform which you can use every year. So the beauty of GINA update is that once you know it, you can use it in your practice right from the day in which they are there. So I'll be presenting in short what is there in GINA 2022 uh, updates. Uh, first update is regarding asthma and COVID-19. Uh, As you all know, uh, if it is mild to moderate asthma, there is no increased risk of COVID and uh, the, the patient does almost the same as other, other people. But in case if it is a serious asthma, or if the child is on OCs, because you know oral corticosteroid child when he is in severe asthma, the child is put on OCs. So all children with severe asthma and on OCs, they are at high risk for COVID-19. So children with severe asthma, if they get COVID-19, they're going to deteriorate faster and they're going to develop a lot, a lot of uh, symptoms. Then spirometry, traditionally it has been thought to be an aerosol generating procedure, where we try to avoid spirometry in, 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 a in COVID times or a child who's having COVID. But now we have got inline filters where if you use those inline filters, we can do spirometry in a place where uh, the risk of transmission of COVID is, is less. But still, you know, when you do spirometry, the child has to take a deep inspiration and then followed by deep expiration. Sometimes he gets a cough. So even you use inline filter, child, if child coughs, then they can uh, transmit uh, aerosol. So what Gina Carlin says that, you tell the child to cough in the spermeter itself so that he doesn't spill the, the infected secretion outside. So as far as possible, try to avoid spermetry during COVID times, but now you are getting new equipment where you are to use inline filters and you can always tell the child, if you are having cough, please cough in the spermeter, please don't cough in the room. Then as regarding uh, vaccination, it is very clear that People with asthma, they, they, they should take all the vaccines, COVID-19, first, second dose, and precaution dose, they should take. There's absolutely no contraindication. Then, a lot of biological drugs are being used in, in asthma. You know, in all stage five, you've got comalizumab, mepolizumab, dupilumab, all those things are used in stage five, although we don't use very often. But all pediatric pulmonologists, they use a lot of biologics in asthma, very severe asthma. So the present guideline is that whenever you're having a child with severe asthma, you're going to use biologic. Don't use vaccine and biologic on the same day because both can have side effects. And in case if there is some side effect, you cannot differentiate whether it is because of biologic or it is due to the, the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So whenever you are using biologic, please don't try to vaccinate on, on the same day. Try to uh, stagger them. Then all children with asthma, they should get their annual influenza vaccine because as you know, influenza can sometimes lead to acute asthma attacks. And that's why it is a guideline that all children with asthma, they should get their regular, uh, uh, regular influenza vaccine. So I think COVID-19 and uh, asthma manage your asthma very well because if it is severe asthma, he's, he's, he's going to develop more symptoms with COVID-19. And very importantly, uh, get all the vaccine as they have been done. 
Then very important diagnosis of asthma. Gina now is very clear that apart from symptom, till now we have been discussing that only symptom is very is enough to, to diagnose asthma. But no, that is not so. Gina really clearly says that you should have some objective evidence of variable expiratory airflow of uh, obstruction. So once you suspect asthma clinically, after that you must ask the question whether the child is on controller or not because the child is on control already he has he is taking some medication and you don't know whether the diagnosis is not so the approach differs whether you are treating a child who is on controller versus a child who is not controller a child who is not on controller is come to watch the first time straight away you must do his pyrometry or do his peak peak expiratory flow rate and confirm there is a variable expiratory airflow obstruction then only you are justified in treating, treating asthma so once you clinically suspect asthma, he has got typical clinical symptoms of asthma. There is a family history of ATP, recurrent wheezing, and he responds to bronchodilator. later. You suspect asthma. If he is not on controller, you must do his spirometry or peak expiratory flow rate, confirm asthma, and then, then only treat. Sometimes you get a child who is very sick, very serious, lot of symptoms. You don't have a time to, you don't have that much time to do spirometry. Again, you are justified in treating this child because he is sick. But after that, it is very important that after say about two or three months, you must do his pyrometry, try to uh, 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 keep his bronchodilator uh, away for at least for four hours, or if he's on lava for 24 hours, do his pyrometry and confirm. So very important to understand that Gina tells very clearly that don't treat asthma empirically, always try to prove that there is variable expiratory airflow of obstruction by spirometry. In case the child is already on controller, again, uh, Gina is very clear that there, are, there is a set guideline in which you have to stop the bronchodilator or lava for a particular period of time, or if she is on controller, you have to step down for 25% and then do his uh, spirometry, confirm, and then prove. So the what learning is that always, always document airflow obstruction by spirometry or peak speed flow rate before you treat us. But so this is very important guideline which, which has come this, this, this particular year. Then again, we are always in a doubt that if it is like, like ours is a poor country where we don't have access to spirometry very, very often. So this is a very common reason what the doctors they give that since we don't have spirometry, how can we do it all the time? So now GNI has come with a very clear guideline that in case you don't have spirometry, you can use peak expiratory flow rate to diagnose asthma. Till about two, three years back, we used to consider, consider that peak expiratory flow rate is only used for monitoring. Child who is on, already on asthma, we then we tell, give him a peak flow meter, you monitor your peak expiratory flow rate, and we see whether the attack is going to come or not. But now Gina this year has told very clearly that peak expiratory flow rate can be used to diagnose asthma, although it is not as good as parametry, but in resource limited settings, you can de de definitely go ahead and, and di diagnose asthma. In fact, WHO in its package of essential non-communicable disease intervention, this is known as PEN packages, they have listed peak exploratory flow meter as an essential tool because in all countries where wherever they are going to tackle respiratory diseases, this tool is, is very important and, and what do they say is that if you give two puffs of albuterol and you do peak exploratory flow rate before and after and if you get a 20% improvement in peak exploratory flow rate, this almost confirms asthma. So WHO also tells very clearly that you can use asthma, you can use peak split flow rate to, 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 to diagnose asthma. Very simple, do his peak exploratory flow rate, give him two, two puffs of albuterol or, or salbutramol. After say 15 minutes, again do his peak exploratory flow rate. If there is a 20% rise, this almost confirms, uh, confirms asthma. So Gina also tells that if you are using a four weeks of of ICS, like if you are in a doubt, you put the child on ICS for, for four weeks and then you do his peak expiratory flow rate. So if there is again a 20% rise in his, peak, his, his PFR, again it confirms asthma or a child is put on one week of oral corticosteroid, if you uh, document an increase of peak expiratory flow rate, it confirms asthma. So again, learning from this particular year is that 
you can use if you don't have access to spirometry or you're not good in spirometry. It's a very simple instrument costing about 500 rupees and it's very simple to use also. So once you do peak expertise flow rate and you document a 20% rise in his peak flow rate after, after 2 plus albuterol, it almost confirms asthma. But again, a caveat is that this is just an arrangement Whenever you have access to spirometry, always do that because that is more reliable and that is more con con confirmatory for asthma as compared to peak, peak expertise flow rate. And Gina tells that there is a need for more and more access to affordable tools, more and more peak flow, peak flow meters and spirometry and proper training for these instruments in, uh, in LMIC. So again, Gina is very clear that if you don't have spirometry, do peak expertise flow rate confirm that, can, that, that there is uh, airflow absorption and, and then you treat asthma, but don't treat without pr proving it. Then fourth, uh, fourth, I think, was how to assess symptom control. Again, this is a very important step. Whenever you going to treat asthma, you assess what is the level of symptom control, and that decides whether you have to use controller or not, or you have to sum up the con con controller. So, so, how, so how do you do that? You ask the symptoms in the past four weeks, and you ask whether the, what are the symptoms of asthma in the days per week, whether they are more than two or, or less than two times per week, any nighttime uh, awakening, any limitation in activity, and now how many times he is, he is, he is using Saba? More than two weeks, more than two or less than two times per week. So this is the classical way in which we assess the uh, symptom control. So if there are, if all four, of all four are negative, it is well controlled. If two are positive, it is partly, and if all are there, it is un uncontrolled. But this is to be used only when you are using Saba as a reliever. So in current, in, 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 in Jina 2021, we are using in adolescent, we are using track one, uh, track one method in which uh, ICS and formaltrol, they are used as a reliever as well as, as, a, con 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 as, as a controller. So wherever you are using track one therapy and ICS formatrol as a controller, you cannot use that, that particular guide as a guide to uncontrol. Why? Because in that case, you are using formatrol, which is also as a controller. So a child you, who are using three or four times, times uh, ICS formatrol for, for his control, he doesn't come in uncontrolled. Why? Why? Because he is already using uh, formatrol and he's always using a con controller. So Gina 2022 says that for assessing of symptom control, whenever you are using Saba as a con controller, you can use that if they are more than two times in a week, you have to step up your controller. Whereas if he's using ICS form 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 at all, you don't, you don't need to step up. So I think this is a change which you, you should uh, remember. Then definition of mild asthma. Now, you think that mild asthma is indicating that child is having a mild disease. No problem. You tell parents your child is having mild asthma, parents are happy and you are happy. No. Gina is very clear that this is a term which has to be used very carefully. Why? Because, you know, diagnosis of severity is made retrospectively. Like you, you, you put a child on a, on, a, on a particular therapy, after three months you see that his disease has been controlled at, at step five. Probably he is a severe asthma. It is controlled at step three or four. It is moderate asthma. Step one or two, it is mild asthma. But if you have labeled it as a mild asthma, it is very dangerous. Why? Because parents think that disease is mild. But 30% of the death in children, they are in those people who are having infrequent symptoms. So mild asthma doesn't mean that he is not going to have severe attacks or, or he is going to die because of asthma. There are 30% risk that this a child who is labeled as mild asthma, he can develop an acute attack and, and he can die. So Gina is very clear that this term mild asthma should be avoided and in case if you are using it, tell very clearly that risk of exacerbation are same as a child with severe asthma and he needs ICS every time you are using, you are using Saba. So mild asthma, although this term can be used, but use it sparingly and always put a caveat that this child has a risk of severe exacerbation, 30% chances that they can get a severe attack, and always, always use ICS along with Saba whenever it is going to use as a reliever. Then Gina treatment for adults and adolescents, this was there in, 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 in uh, 2021, where they divided into two tracks, track one and track two. Again, they reiterated that track one is the treatment of choice 
because using ICS and formutrol as a reliever and a controller both, it has got a better control, it has got a better uh, uh, decreased chance of exacerbation and it has got much less uh, chances of severe attack and it is going to respond by, by better. So it is there again to the two to have declared very clearly that track one is the track which you should use more and more often because the chances of exhibition they are much low and the symptom control is absolutely better. So in step one and two you are using as, as required ICS for formatrol. Step three you are using low, low dose. Step four you are using medium dose. And, and there are now some changes in step five where they have introduced a new biologic which is known as anti-thymic stromal lymphopoietin, anti-TLSP has come in stage five. We'll discuss about this in, in, in the next time. Stage, in, in, in the track, track two, they are using uh, Saba as a reliever and uh, again they are very clear that this track is inferior to track one. So wherever possible try to use track uh, one, one, one more, more and more. Again, in, the, in this particular thing, they are very clear that all the alternative options, they are, they are inferior because they are, they, are, they are having more side effects and the safety uh, data is less. So try to use more and more of preferred option rather than using more, more and more of uh, alternative option. And then there has been some change in step uh, for this step for in six, six to 11 years. Change in step one, I'll come later. Changes in step five in ch children where they've added the use of anti-LR4, this is dupilumab in children below from six to 11 years in step five. But I'll again tell you, we'll not lead this thing very often because these are to be left to pulmonologists. So I think it is not very, very common for, for, for general petition, but should know it that in stage five, there is an, a new thing which is added is anti-LR4. And they have again cautioned that OC use, OC's use is very minimal because if you are using OC, the child is very sick and child needs to be referred to a, a specialist. So the incidence of OC's use in children should be as low as possible and, and you should use very clearly, uh, very cleverly. Then, then hydration of Lalama. In case of adolescent and adults, whenever you are from step four, you're going to step five, where you have used medium dose of, uh, of uh, ICS and Lava, Going to step five, you can use uh, Lama, where there, are, where there is clear evidence that if you add uh, Lama to ICS Lama, there is a modest improvement in the lung functions and there are decreased risk of exacerbation. But the symptom control may be the same. So, so they are very clear that when you go in step five, the first step you should do is to add Lama, which is tartropium, long-acting muscarinic uh, mus antagonist. But they are very clear that at least you should step up to at least medium dose ICS Laba. So after you have stepped up to medium dose ICS Laba, child not getting control, go to step five where you can add tyotropium and uh, you, can, uh, you can have a good, good control. But, but again, we, they are very clear that Lama should not be used as a monotherapy. Why? Because if you use a monotherapy, the chances of exhibition are very high. So always it is an add-on therapy where you are using medium dose uh, ICS and, and Laba. And then subsequently you, you can do uh, add on, uh, uh, add on uh, 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 this uh, llama. Now, if you if you child if you having a child with severe asthma, where now you want to know the phenotype, you do this blood eosinophil, you find a raised eosinophil. Now, raised eosinophil is an indicator of type two inflammation, where all the all the drugs like Balzac they are they're going to work. But again, Gina has very clearly cautioned that even if you have got raised eosinophil. Try to find some other cause because, for example, in tropical countries, you can have worm infestation. So just raise insulin doesn't mean that he's having type 2 inflammation. He could have something like worms also. So first exclude common causes and then only you, 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 you jump on that. In case if the insulin are markedly raised above 1500, always try to rule out eosinophilic uh, EGPA because these are conditions, they have got a lot of eosinophil. So try to, uh, try to exclude this condition before you before you jump on to type 2 inflammation. Then in, they have added this particular uh, cytokine, anti-cytokine, anti-thymic stromal lymphopoietin in stage, stage, stage 5. And this uh, drug is known as tezipelumab and this is basically for children about 12 years with severe asthma. And they are beneficial in those children who are having high blood eosinophil and high high reno. In this condition, it's going to work, work very well. 
but again even those children who are not having type 2 infection also it works well so this drug works for both even in type 2 as well as non type 2 it is it's going to work to so those children who are having severe asthma and type 2 or non type 2 you, you can try to use this 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 particular drug then again we have got one more change this anti kylar 4 which is uh, uh, dupilumab it is now being uh, recommended in step 5 in those children who are having non type 2 because initially it was basically it was used for type type 2 inhibition but now they recommend that even in for type non type 2 also you can use uh, dupilumab then they have also added dupilumab for uh, children above uh, 6 years in which they recommend that you can use dupilumab in stage 5 in 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 children who are above uh, 6 year now they are very clear about written asthma action plan that this is a very important aspect of asthma management all children must be given a very clear asthma action plan so that they can manage asthma good at their home because a well managed asthma at their home it has a very important role in, in decreasing the morbidity morbidity and 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 mortality if it is a mild asthma all children they must learn how to step up their uh, how to identify their symptom step up their 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 reliever step up their controller and in case if it is a if it is a severe attack in which they are monitoring their peak exit flow rate if, if it is less than 60% of the best try to add uh, steroids we will skip this slide because this is slide is very slide then one more very important change which has come, which has come in is that management of wheeze in preschool uh, in, in children those children who are having intermittent attacks in which the 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 period in between it is it is normal now till now we have been giving only uh, saba but now uh, the they are very clear that you can use intermittent high dose ics but now again i want to question you that the dose used for ics is very high they use uh, fluticasone as is 1500 microgram per day so this is a very high dose so although they have added this particular step in children but they should be used only in those cases where the doctor and the parent they, they are aware that this drug is to be used and they are using it in a, in a, in a proper manner so in step 1 where those children who are having intermittent wheezing and the intermittent period is all right you can use uh, you can use high dose steroid but again you you must be very very careful that you are using it uh, properly again this uh, only, only 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 two more slide then till now we have been using only salbutamol in management of acute attack all the hospital they use only salbutamol but now there are studies which are indicate that using of both buprenorphine uh, formoterol they have been used to manage acute asthma there are studies which indicate that this also drug works well all the studies are, there are only one or two studies probably we need more studies where this drug can be used along with salbutamol in management of of acute asthma now the other changes is that e cigarettes again they are now used in adolescents very commonly and they have got a high high risk of respiratory symptom they must not be used you can use air filter where there is more poly pollution but again there is no concerning effect the effect of pollution is now very clear and wherever cities where high pollution this particular thing should be tackled well you can use electronic um, devices where you can track on the uh, the adherence and you can always check that patient in those those patient last slide in the, those patient who have got high eosinophils and high pheno these are a risk for high exposition which children should be looked very clearly and they should be managed managed well and a child who is admitted to hospital if he is already on ics please put him on ics please don't forget on putting on ics so take on my messages manage your asthma very well during your covid time be updated with your covid and flu flu vaccine avoid the term you like mild asthma pf can be used to diagnose asthma and you you should use ics and and for formoterol for for management of asthma and this is not considered to be a step for uh, step of for for management cuz using more often there is a new biologic tslsp for management in step 5 intermittent asthma ics management in is added for under 5 wheezing and you can use ics formoterol to manage acute attack in hospital but again we we need more and more studies thank you for attention please if there are any question i'd like to answer them any questions can be asked in the lunch period please we are already running short of time uh, now next we are going to have one more interesting respiratory topic uh, thank you it's a symposium about sneezes to wheezes uh, i request the moderator dr subramanya k nk to come to the dais and i request the panelists also dr alok gupta 
Dr. Arif Ahmad, Dr. U. Narayan Reddy, and Dr. Vamsidhar Kedar to come to the dais. Respected uh, dear delegates and uh, organizing team and my dear friends from, from PATS and from the entire uh, central zone, greetings from all of us, including uh, myself, moderator Dr. Subramanian and the faculties. Do not worry about the lunch. Uh, we will have lunch together. It's only a question of 15, 20 minutes that we will interact with you and make it a real life situation on wheeze and sneeze. Uh, can I request the, can I request the fact, the honored uh, panelists to uh, introduce themselves before I would load the presentation and uh, go ahead. Alok Bhaiya. Thank you, Dr. Subramanya. Thank you, Dr. Bhaskar and all the organizing team for the opportunity given to me and all of us to be here to be talking about sneeze and wheeze. I'm Alok Gupta from Jaipur. I'm a common pediatrician representing all of you and sitting on the dais with the experts. Okay, so please be free to ask the questions. And uh, my, uh, other than the, general pediatrics, environment is my special interest, vaccines, and uh, I've rep uh, represented at IIP at various forums in WHO at IAP, uh, IPA and APA, and currently I'm the IAP, I IPA, International Ambassador for Environment. I've edited many textbooks, including textbook of pediatrics, textbooks called N uh, Nelson, recent advances and so many other textbooks. So you. I'll be representing you all in the, this symposium. Thank you. One, one, or two, one line introduction of yours. Thank you, sir. So firstly, I would like to thank the organizing committee in uh, calling me to be a panelist with uh, our eminent uh, Dr. Subramaniam, sir. So we have, uh, I have seen him uh, as one of the most dynamic persons I have seen him as one of the most dynamic persons in the forum. So he is capable of uh, doing everything and anything, whatever is told to him in the academic section. So really it is a grateful honor for me to be on the same dais sharing with Dr. Subramaniam, sir. So I am Dr. Kedar. I am a consultant pediatrician and pediatric intensivist from Lotus Hospitals in Hyderabad. I am also an allergist and uh, I, 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 I deal with uh, asthma. Time goes up fast. Dr. Dr. Upin. May I call Dr. Spurti Chitta? Uh, next, Dr. Yeah. Pin, sir. Yeah, uh, once again, thank you all for uh, giving me this opportunity. Good afternoon, everyone. At the very onset, can I have the lights off, please? Because it's really the glare is hitting into my eyes, sir. So it's some other way of this one. Okay, uh, very good afternoon. I'm Dr. Arif Ahmed. I'm a board, European board certified allergist. And two important things, messages which I want to give is I have written a book, Winning Over Allergies, Myths and Facts, is available on Amazon. And you can access that book. And the second message is thanks to the respiratory chapter, I'm one of the core team of this uh, allergic rhinitis module, which is coming up as Dr. Rawatha will be bringing it out in the month of August. And I request all of you to go through this module or become part of, the, uh, I mean, become a, uh, uh, um, attend this module when it comes. Thank you. Dr. Opin. Then. So, Dr. Spurti, she's here? No, she's not here. Okay. Fine. Um, we will go to the session on sneeze and wheeze. My dear friends, please clap for the panelists. None of the questions have been shared with them. Everything is extempore. So whatever 
they are going to speak will be from their heart and from the evidence-based medicine and we will try to curtail. There will be confusions, there will be jet parts, there will be crackers and flower parts. And I want all of you, please ask for mic, you can ask whatever you want on sneeze and wheeze. Only 30 minutes we have got, let us share and learn and that's the theme of now coming to sneeze, it's very common. I want very brief answer of one word from you. Alok Bhaiya, if patient comes with the sneeze and a recurrent sneeze, let's say eight year old, what are two questions that you will ask? Only two questions. One, one, is, the, one is the family history, the family past history, history over next. the atopy, and the duration of the symptoms. Next, duration of illness. What, what question, one, one other, other than that, anything you want to add? One or two questions to come to quickly diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. So is the sneeze always associated with the symptoms of a lower respiratory tract involvement okay, also? Okay, you want to ask sneeze with wheeze. Upin, sir, what you want Old to ask? Sneeze, recurrent sneeze, always think of allergy. It needs second generation antihistamine. So and you will assume recurrent sneeze as allergy? Recurrent sneeze means always think of allergy, without fever. So definitely think of allergic rhinitis. Okay. Arif Bhaiya, what is the question that you will ask to make it uh, allergic rhinitis? Besides the other questions which the, my panelists have said, I would like to know about history of other histories such as blocked nose, a runny nose, and when the timing of the sneeze, early morning, late, and all. Excellent. These are so the basically things. you go for qualifiers. All of you agree on this point. Pretty simple. You just wanted to know whether it's common cold or otherwise. Let us be very simple. Now, I will come to the next. Whenever some do you believe? Because a lot of these Gora Gora syndromes are there. Mothers will tell kafam, bafam, this, that, etc. And lot of confusions are there. There are various languages. Alok Bhaiya, in your practice, suppose you are heading towards diagnosis of asthma or otherwise, what is the thing that you will ask to confirm that whatever mother or grandmother has told is wheeze? Or you want to auscultate yourself, till then you don't believe that it is a wheeze. Because when they come, they are normal. They, would, they have taken a bronchodilator. How will you go about it? Just from your experience, what you would have done? We ask about the, the sound, like whistling sound. It is continuous for few days. Okay. It is recurrent. Okay. okay. So you and will mimic and show them. You will mimic and show them. Yes. That's what you are referring to. Is it getting connected? Yes. Sir, you have got any, anything. We want to just confirm that it's bees. The only question I ask is in the local native language, we call it as pili kutalu or sai sai awaz. Sai sai we sai call awaz. that okay. that if any audible wheeze is present because auscultation is definitely not possible in the house. But do you all agree that if you are not right at this point, we may be elsewhere. It could be wet cough, it could be something else, it may not be referred to as wheeze. Uh, open from your because experience. They say, bacha ghur karra, it may be upper respiratory, lower respiratory, have a different shade. So it's under five, of course, different veneer again. So okay. wheeze. Parents, the child is coughing night particularly and definitely was sculpted to so bilateral V's, reversible okay. bronchodilator, always think of bronchiolitis from a lower airway. For Arif Bhaiya, let me make the question a little different. Arif, how often parents have cheated you that they have told but it is not a V's? Well, that is the most common thing which happens because everything which comes from the upper airway is attributed to the lower airway. That's what is, uh, because most of the time it will be up from the upper airway. Yeah. I wanted to ask the audience, please raise your hands. Now you have a case with allergy or asthma, whatever. How often you get cough more and wheeze less as a presentation or wheeze more and cough less a presentation? Please raise your hands for those of you who says cough is more common than wheeze. I can see, good number. Wheeze more common than cough. One or two. So that speaks volume, so they report cough there will be V's. All of us agree on this point. This is pretty simple. And when we want to search, we don't get. See, these this two concepts I wanted. So uh, do, did you get a clarity on what it is for a sneeze, especially recurrent, and what it means for a V's? I think there should not be any confusion tomorrow in the practice. Now, why this sneeze and V's? together we have taken is because we have got a concept called one airway, one disease. And if you don't treat one, the other cannot be treated. So it is pretty simple. We have to be united in our approach to both allergic rhinitis and asthma. 
Now I'll come to the scenarios. I'll start from audience. Any one of you can raise your hands and ask for mic. How do I treat a child which has only sneeze but no wheeze? I want your prescription. Please raise your hands. I will write first generation antihistamines. Nobody. Second generation antihistamines. Okay, three hands, four hands. Second generation expensive antihistamines. Okay. Second generation cheap antihistamines. Nobody is raising the hands. Okay. Now, syrup antihistamines. Please raise your hands. Okay. Tablet antihistamines. Please raise your hands. One or two. Mantulocast with antihistamines. Please raise your hands. Do be very honest. Don't worry. Few. Only Mantelukast. Raise your hands. And I want one line, one comment from you. What will be... Please do not tell anything else. Please tell what you will write in your that chota slip, less than A4 size prescription. A second generation antihistamic. Huh. And a Name the drug. Which set, drug set, you will set, write? Set, cetrazine. Huh? Cetrazine. You will write cetrazine. And for how long? For uh, four to five days. Four to five days. What else? What you will you write? Sir, can I have Aram the... Say, don't worry about Can it. I know the age? Okay, so, uh, this girl, uh, how old is she? She's not 30 year old. Around five, six Around year five old. year old. Hmm. I will go with what sir has told. It is citrazine for five days. Citrazine for five days. Uh, uh, that is cold, five days. But allergic analysis got to give four to six weeks. You can't okay. give one four or five days. Allergic analysis, second generation antihistamines should be given. If parents are worried, we have to do skin prick test or immunocap to know what is the cause of allergen, allergen avoidance can plan. If no response to go for international. No, no, no counseling. Tell me your prescription. Counseling will do. What is your prescription? Prescription, second generation antihistamine, non sedating for four to six weeks. Minimum four, four weeks. Minimum four, four weeks. weeks. Arif Paya. Whatever I give, many of the times patients become well. Most important thing is making a diagnosis. Without a diagnosis, I will not give anything. It is diagnosed. What is it diagnosed as? Okay, mild. I want a diagnosis mild, and then mild, only I will prescribe. Mild and non-severe allergic rhinitis with a sneeze. Mild non and? Non-severe. Mild and severe? Mild and non-severe. There is mild Very and? mild and non-severe allergic there's rhinitis. There is nothing like mild and non-severe. There is... Okay, fine. Because there is a... Arya has a definite... I am qualifying it. Mild means... Not so yeah, mild, but is it moderate persistent or is it mild persistent or is it intermittent? We have to make a proper diagnosis. Okay. Unless and until okay. you okay. make a diagnosis, you, made, you, you, tell me, you tell me what is your prescription after your diagnosis. First my diagnosis and then my prescription. Okay, fine. I think he wants to make a diagnosis. I will tell you very simple. Later, early morning, five-year-old is coming with sneeze. Not so troubling the child so much. But they come to your practice. The message is you will, it is intermittent. And it is not persistent symptoms, not affecting the child in day-to-day -day practice. All of you agree? You will see this case, no? It is basic. Okay. Basically, we do it for four to five days. We review the case. If it okay. improves, then... It doesn't matter, Alok Bhaiya. See, the, Alok Bhaiya, I told Alok Bhaiya to tell this answer. Because that's what most of them will do. You understand? So, please do not prescribe for three days, four days, five days. It has to be for a good duration. Because these recurrent symptoms are, have to be treated with a good coverage of antihistamines. And second generation antihistamines, that is simply because you want to give less side effects when you have to give for prolonged time. If you are going to give for short time, side effects are not important. However, when you are giving for a week or week plus or two weeks plus, three weeks plus, you have to consider two things. One is side effects and the cost. I think Upin brought out a nice idea. He would not give less than around uh, four weeks. Four to six weeks. Four to six minimum, weeks of therapy. Minimum. If uh, all of all I would of like to review the case review after and five then continue. days. Fair and enough. continue. You wanted to separate if it is all right. call from that. Fantastic. Point taken. Now the next scenario is there is only wheeze but no, no sneeze. Looks like an asthma. And occasionally he gets the wheeze. The age group is around 5 years. He is neither under 5 nor above 5. Okay, we will keep it on his birthday. He has come to your clinic for confusing the panelists. Now, the issue here is intermittently he is presenting. I think 3 or 4 
times and year he is presenting. Is this scenario clear to you? No sneezing is there. There is no both of them. There is only V's. Looks like an asthma, but no uh, one or two risk factors are there, like one sibling in the family has got some atopy is there. You can accept this. There is a setting of asthma, but severity is very less. There, is, there are troublesome episodes, three to four in that year. Now, what I will start from this end, Arif Baya, what will be, I, I don't want anything, evaluation, I want your prescription. I'm fixing for want of time because there is only 20 yeah, minutes. I always would, uh, before starting my prescription, I'll make a diagnosis. Okay. And after that, because, because a lot of, uh, we drive, okay, anyway, I'll come to the point. So how should we treat only the V's with no sneeze, okay? Making sure that there is no allergic rhinitis in this uh, patient. There is no allergic rhinitis. Yeah, yeah I, and if it's depending upon the severity of the V's, okay, I will uh, uh, give my prescription. Uh, inhaled uh, 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 corticosteroid will be there in the prescription. And considering the, this age, I would use uh, intermediate acting uh, salmetrol or formetrol along with it. So this combination I will give to the, to the child. So you will prescribe an MDI with a spacer which yes. contains uh, formetrol with bidocinide. That is your prescription. How long? Inhale corticosteroid meter dose with the spacer. That is gold standard. You have to give. Depends upon the severity. Then you have to add in drugs, other drugs. You are not sure that it is asthma, but you have started on, let's say, bidocinide with formetrol for that particular child, yeah. waiting the diagnosis of confirmation of asthma. How long you will give? Because this is what minimum, the audience wants. Minimum, minimum three months trial. Minimum three months. Minimum three, three months. months. Sir. Sir, for the scenario that was given to us, so basically uh, I would like to differentiate this particular scenario into two parts. If the clinical symptoms are less than three to four days with only two or three, three episodes in a year, I would not like to put the child on ICS first. I would like to personally consider giving an MDI with spacer with a beta agonist, wait and for, wait for the recurrence of symptoms and assess the recurrences of symptoms. If it is more than three or four and six months, then I would switch over to the ICS, ICS. or ICS plus LABA. So you will, you will give a bronchodilator alone and if the symptom persists, then only you will go for ICS plus uh, if, SABA. Uh, Sir. If uh, spirometry is available, yes, I will do that before starting the treatment. And uh, it is intermittent two, three times in a year. Fair enough. Okay, so I'll give inhaled uh, short-acting bronchodilator with a Fair spacer. I, I got your point. You will give a short-acting better. I want the audience to please raise your hands. Be very, be very smart and be active and be truthful. Please don't raise your hands and do something else tomorrow in the practice. How many of you will write oral bronchodilator for a child which comes with wheeze and cough of three or four days duration, four to five times a year, setting asthma plus minus. I think I gave you the answer. Oral bronchodilator. Fine. How many of you will give bronchodilator with MDI with spacer? Please raise your hands. There is a good number. How many of you will give bronchodilator with ICS? One hand. Okay, four to five. Okay. How many of you will give formatrol plus budesonide off-label below six years of age? I think, did you understand my question? Okay, fine. So there are very rational practitioners. The message from the recent trends in GINA is infrequent and occasional one of you can handle my calls, please. Infrequent visas without, without allergic rhinitis, not so much about, uh, not so troublesome, very gray area, intermittent and non-severe flare-ups now and then, not yet conclusive of asthma, and, and I will tell you, the justification for giving ICS is less, but in such settings, we are going to give bronchodilator. But the current consensus is, do not give bronchodilator alone. Please add inhalation corticosteroid. This is a very strong message. 
all of you agree on this concept please raise your hands now at least i will know that the majority of the house got the message so there is no lava without kusha and there is no kusha without lava that means if you give ics nowadays please also give a bronchodilator because when you give bedosanide you give formetrol if you give bronchodilator do not do not treat any one with only bronchodilator because they never become receptive to inhalation corticosteroids there are lots of issues with isolated bronchodilator therapy so you will give ics is this simple message clear to you in in practice i think if i am done with this concept i'll go to the next concept what will you do if wheeze and sneeze are together and if one of them is dominant as you can see on the slide isn't it sometimes one is recessive another is dominant either the wheeze is more or sneeze is more i will take the debate forward now a child of his age 4 year old has more sneeze and occasional wheeze i don't want to give a big case scenario did you understand i think panelists have understood now i will take it to the audience will you treat only sneeze and ignore the wheeze please raise your hands nobody will you give treatment for both sneeze and wheeze please raise your hands okay now i'll confuse you will you give antihistamine for sneeze please raise your hands i'm sorry arif bhaiya i'm diluting the academics i understand your points the way you are looking at me i'm not classifying the severity i do understand i'm diluting the academics but i'm making it simple because i have got only 14 minutes to go i can also classify but i'm i'm over simplifying the things for your sake that means to say the predominant nose presentation very less of chest presentation will you see this case in practice it is not that it is isolated allergic rhinitis there is a component of wheeze in that now what is your treatment for allergic rhinitis is based on the merits of allergic rhinitis but my question to the panelists is allergic rhinitis is treated with either antihistamine or steroids intranasal steroids based on the merits of severity of allergic rhinitis more of nose agreed what will you do for the wheeze in that child will you will you give what will be your prescription for the wheeze i think you understood ins is given ins plus what will you give just be be very frank as a general intranasal steroid to de hi diya apan ne hai na ab wheeze ke liye kya dete ho wheeze ke liye will give as you said a short acting bronchodilator and a inhaled corticosteroid and bronchodilator plus ics you are take so this particular i know this is very difficult question sir i am i am actually compliment the panelists for taking this offline without any preparation yes please sir, be free don't don't worry sir in this particular situation the clinical scenario what i am facing now i would like to classify into two parts so basically now it is a sneeze and less of a wheeze hmm. so considering the one airway hypothesis i would like to be more aggressive on the allergic rhinitis part that is done what that is yes, done yes sir i am coming to that yeah. so i'll start initially with the uh, ins and then subsequently i would also like to put the child on a ics also agreed now you are first day he will give a prescription of ins when you will prescribe ics on that day or after one week in the subsequent yeah, the this is what they want to know if the clinical presentation before me is only of the sneeze then i would start with the ins alone mm -hmm. but if the ch ch child's clinical presentation is with the sneeze plus wheeze i will start with the combination of ins plus ics you will give ins plus ics yes upin bhaiya you are take this is a more this is very difficult question sir please don't think that they are easy questions for the panelists is a more sneeze means the allergic rhinitis is more they have to go antihistamine intranasal steroid must then you add on if no response you can add on intranasal antihistamine also very effective no that is fine yeah i am asking of course less wheeze means you can give intermediate bronchodilator or you can give intermediate inhaled corticosteroid also arif bhaiya you are take i think in this case you should aggressively treat the allergic the that is the, done the, that is done with as dr upen uh, said anti stimulant or montelukast and a uh, intranasal steroid done. and your wheeze will be taken care of so you, so two of the panelists said that they will treat nose and wait and watch for the chest correct no that is that is one one of the panelists said that i will go and kill the wheeze also 
and alok bhai had told i will take on merit basis every five days as and when he comes i'll change my prescription me alok bhai aapko tease kar raha hu i am taking like this now what is the take by the audience now i for the wees in in a case of allergic rhinitis how many of you want to wait and watch only one wants to wait and watch how many of them wants to give bronchodilator good number okay how many of them wants to give bronchodilator plus inhalation corticosteroids so the house is now divided they say give ins give ics and give salbutamol and treat everything i will answer this question in next slide of mine just keep this spice hot and on i will now come to the next scenario i'll give you the message don't worry we will not go with the message i will now reverse sorry for the typo error there is a reverse scenario where the chest symptoms are more and there are one or two sneezes more we than less sneeze other that typo error i told typing error sorry from my end there is more we is and less sneeze okay now i will start from alok bhaiya one line answer from you i have got only 9 minutes to go uh no you have given ics plus saba done laba done what will you do for nose now no i i will add uh, montelu cast you will add montelu cast your answer very good answer please please be feel free this is what happens in practice sir in this particular scenario also my strategy would be the same my approach is the same so i will treat the wheeze as well as the sneeze also i would like to go so what ahead. is your prescription for the sneeze ics ics this is a more wheeze needs inhale corticosteroid or add an montelukast but for sneeze antihistamine sufficient arif bhaiya again i, I know what you want to answer again you see we have arya is very clear on the type of your this one for a mild case of sneeze only a uh, uh, oral anti allergic that is uh, anti histaminic second generation is more than enough beyond mild uh, allergic rhinitis you have to give ins okay now i think all of you are waiting for the answer correct no do you agree i have gone into the most gray area of the science and this is what is the real life situation and i will tell you when there is both wheeze and sneeze you put this allergic rhinitis and asthma please categorize allergic rhinitis rhinitis as mild intermittent mild persistent severe and uh, see intermittent and persistent and on the asthma side well controlled partially controlled and poorly controlled now the prescription is pretty simple my dear friends one prescription for the top one prescription for the bottom don't mix prescriptions that's the message mere ko lagta hai thoda usko mantalukast mein manage kar do 15 din ke baad dekhu or i it may go on its own i will give bronchodilator my dear friends even though we are united airway disease each of the components have to be categorized if you have a well controlled asthma and a sneeze no problem no i don't already asthma is controlled where is the question of comorbidity when the asthma is partially controlled or poorly controlled tell me will you be aggressive on the nose answer is yes because that is the factor that is limiting your control of the disease so ultimately symptom control of the patient is important so therefore can i give you the answer this is from uh, indian pediatrics 2010 uh, article published by dr h parmesh in when there was inception of this adex module approach to united airway disease i am telling you for the reference when there is more we is give bronchodilator when there is less we is also you give bronchodilator now you add steroids currently that time gina 22 was not there when there is less sneeze what i meant was less severe on area guidelines you will give only antihistamines and more and persistent blockers etc you would give ins now you will give a combination of ins plus bronchodilator if it is allergic rhinitis is severe and asthma is less severe 
and if there is more of allergic rhinitis and occasional wheeze, then you would give intranasal steroids plus bronchodilator. You would give ICS plus formetrol and add on either antihistamine or INS based on the severity of allergic rhinitis. Please remember the point which I wanted to tell you is that when you have allergic rhinitis, most of them wheeze. When you have sneeze, most of them wheeze. But when there is wheeze, less number of them sneeze. Is this also clear? I think there is no confusion. All that, uh, have I created the confusion or I solved the confusion? C well, not created. Uh, well, I'm asking <laughs> you also. Because, but, huh, Rawat sir, I think there is, there is nothing like we have not given you clarity. Please classify each of the disease and treat on its merit. Do not worry about adding of steroids. See that there is a fear. Sp steroid sparing, I will not add INS and ICS together. All these myths should go off. Please treat the diseases on its merit. I've got only five more minutes. So messages, I will follow with first for the V's and then the sneeze. This will be moderator's uh, purview. For a minute or so, panelists uh, will have to say yes to me whether you like it or not. Message number one, do you all agree that not being asthma for a V's is more common than being asthma in less than five years of age in a recurrent V's? Fair enough? So you give symptomatic treatment with bronchodilator. I'm coming to the prescriptions of tomorrow for you and simplifying it. Message number two, whenever you have V's, not suggestive of asthma. I think I am very simple. Did you understand? A child would be sick, you evaluate and refer. Number two, message number three, younger they are, V's is less likely to be asthma than not asthma. But when a wheeze is associated with sneeze, then it is more likely to be asthma than not asthma. Do you agree on these four or five simple messages for you? Now, low risk and high risk of asthma, you know very well whenever there is genetic predisposition, atopy, colds that are prolonged and child is symptomatic between the episodes, then it is more like, more at risk of asthma. When you don't know what to do, when you have yes, no situation in asthma, especially in the young, when it is obvious asthma, for want of time, I can't tell you everything about asthma in 30, 30 minutes or so. When it is too obvious, treat asthma. When you are sure it's a sick child with wheezing, not an asthma, don't treat it as asthma, then wait and watch. Please investigate. When you are in doubt, give a trial of inhalation corticosteroids for three months or 12 weeks. There is no tapering. Any inflammation that is steroid responsive will be treated as asthma until proved otherwise. Can this be a simple message? Any V's that responds to bronchodilator, any V's that responds to a trial of ICS, you can label him as asthma and start the treatment of daily inhalation corticosteroid. When there is no response to ICS, in a doubtful situation, revise your diagnosis. That means something wrong at history, evaluation, etc. Go back and revise your diagnosis. How to diagnose asthma? Pretty simple. Afebrile episodes, nocturnal episodes, triggered episodes. Four o'clock, there, uh, there is starting of uh, colds. 4.30, there is wheezing, is asthma. 4 o'clock, there is cold. Next day morning, there is wheeze, is the evolution of the cold. It is not asthma. Did you understand my point? Triggered symptoms, seasonality, relief by bronchodilator, is all that is asthma. Okay, practitioner, sir, mudde pe aajau. Don't worry about all these academics, sir. I can't know Jina, Mana, Bina, and all that from Pakistan. Or all these terrific classifications, grade one, grade two, mild, intermittent, etc. What are the situations in which you would give bronchodilators in practice? I, I wanted, to, Aripai, I wanted, to, I wanted to add on to your previous slide in the diagnosis of asthma. Back? 
the diagnosis of asthma, doing allergy testing will definitely... Okay, the... fine. Point taken. If Arif Bhaiya is around, please refer to him for allergy testing. Okay. Now, now no, I don't want to get into controversy because there is only one minute for me. Uh, give me one more minute to sum up, uh, Krishna. I am almost at the end of it. Bronchodilators should be given whenever the infrequent episodes are there, when there is no interval symptoms, especially if you think viral episodes in older children, less younger they are, they do not respond to bronchodilators like bronchiolitis situation. Did you understand? And if there are no risk factors. I am not calling these as asthma. Please, when, when you have diagnosis of asthma, then only we will add ICS. Just like that, don't add ICS to every cough and cold in your tomorrow's practice. Number two, please you should know when you should give daily low dose ICS because every practitioner wants to know this. If there is asthma likely situation and if the episodes are more than three, if you are going only by numbers, not by severity, un unlikely, asthma unlikely, but the episodes are so frequent. Number three, you have decided to give daily low-dose ICS after a trial of ICS. My dear friends, therefore, the message, key message today is when in doubt, please give a trial of ICS, not treatment of ICS. The next one, when you will give antihistamines in practice, by the by, no role for over-the-counter available antihistamines in common colds. First generation antihistamines have side effects. Do not prescribe second generation antihistamines for common colds. That is also being done. Cetrazine is being for common cold, which is wrong. If you really want to give it for rhinorrhea, please give first generation, which is superior to second generation. I am not recommending. Please understand. Dono chor hai, usme thoda sa kam chor kaune. If you wanted to do less of bribery, less of irrationality, then I would say go for first generation, not for second generation. Second generation is just you are spending the money for nothing. For allergic rhinitis, because we want to give for long, let us go for higher generation antihistamines, which are devoid of side effects, as less as we can. INS. Lastly, let me tell you, if the nose is affected, and child is not affected, you can give antihistamines. I'm oversimplifying. Did you understand? Only there is problems in the nose. Manage with antihistamines. That means it is intermittent, mild symptoms, occasional, fair enough. If the child is affected, that means child has behavioral issues, the face shiners, that markers, this, that, etc. have come. There is a, a study, behavior, sleep. If the child is affected, that means the disease is severe, the parental reporting may be less, please give intranasal steroid. So if the child is affected, I will give INS. If the nose is affected, I will give antihistamines. I am actually, for want of simplification, I have diluted the academics for your sake. Those of you who are very much interested in academics, one hour I am ready for the debate. Then the, or, I, the organizers have, give, have to give me more time for them. Now we have understood when to prescribe bronchodilators in practice, when to prescribe intranasal steroids in practice, when to prescribe inhalation corticosteroids in practice, and when to give combination of them in practice. After making diagnosis as being rightly being prompted by Dr. Arif, only problem is for diagnosis in 30 minutes, it is too difficult for me to conclude. My dear friends, we love you a lot. We are closing the session. With any doubts, if any one of you wants to make any comments, please WhatsApp to us in the group. We will respond to you. All of you become members of IAP respiratory chapter so that we will take you forward from sneeze to wheeze and wheeze to breeze. And clap for all the panelists who have joined extempore. I'll tell you, sitting here was not easy for them. I have put gray situations, not straightforward, like Mr. Rahul walks to your OPD, what will you do? That question in the panel can come and there will be ready-made answers. Again, clap for them for being extempore and, and you know they have spoken from their heart and thank you very much for your participation. And over to the organization.
Uh, uh, thank, thank you, you Dr. Subramanya. Just want to make an announcement. Me, along with Dr. Narendra Reddy and Dr. Suman, we are forming a Telangana branch of the allergic chapter of Indian Academy of Pediatrics. And we request to you, to as many people can please register for this, uh, this one. It's just a fee of, of 1500. You can register with Dr. Narendra Reddy or with myself or Dr. Suman, if you'd like to say yeah, anything, yeah. Dr. Narendra Reddy. This is allergy is so increasing need of the hour. I think this is a high time. We have to start allergy chapter to sensitize the alpha radiation. Today, evidence-based medicine, how to do quality service to the patients, particularly needy. Because most of the time, allergy rhinitis, asthma, children are suffering like anything. Not only allergy rhinitis, asthma, you have food allergy, anaphylaxis, abdominal, so many things are there. Sir, we will display, sir. So we will start. Sir, if you give this Next slide, we will display, start chapter. Thank you, sir. Okay. Please register as many as possible. Thank you. We are going to have one more interesting session how to promoting breastfeeding, walk the talk by moderator Dr. Himabindu Singh. I invite Dr. Uh, Himabindu Singh, who is an additional DME at Government of uh, Telangana and a Dean, Government Medical College, Ramagundam, to come to the dais. And the uh, panelists are all stalwarts, Dr. Sanjeev Upadhyay from UNICEF officer, and uh, Dr. Sunkoj Bhaskar, the President uh, Pats, uh, IAP, uh, TCB, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Ali Melu, and Professor Dr. Ramya. I request, I request all ah. the panelists of previous session A very to, good come afternoon. To, the, to take the uh, memento, sir. A very good afternoon to all. After a very good session on asthma and wheeze, we come down to a very uh, burning topic, I should say, promotion of breastfeeding. Though it looks very, very simple, we all know about the goodness of breastfeeding, but we as pediatricians, who are actually the advocates of children, and we are supposed to monitor the growth and development, we are supposed to actually see that every child is given the best milk, the best start to life. Can we have the slides? Yeah. So, this is an important topic because, see, most of the lectures, we are just speaking about the, you know, topic and the theoretical part, we all know the goodness of breast milk and we are talking about this in so many ages. Still, we see gaps. Now, why do we have these gaps and what we can do about it to discuss this along with me? We have an esteemed panel and Dr. Bhaskar, you all know him. Please give them a big round of applause for joining us today. Dr. Bhaskar is president of IAPTCB and he's the organizing secretary of this fabulous conference, what we're seeing at Central Zone Pedicon. And Dr. Sanjeev Upadhyay, He's uh, been with us in Hyderabad, now he's in Delhi, but he's uh, always associated with all the good work happening here in Telangana. He's the health specialist for UNICEF, and he's been uh, you know, helping Telangana, Andhra, Karnataka. I'm sure I think he's adding more responsibilities to his uh, credit, and we look forward to working with this great organization, UNICEF. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev, to accept our invite. And also uh, thank Dr. Alimelu, we all know her. She's a professor of pediatrics heading the department of neonatology at the esteemed Institute of Child Health, Nilofa Hospital. And she has accepted to be on our panel. Thank you, Dr. Alimelu. And Dr. Ramya, she's a professor of pediatrics from Chelmada Institute of Medical Sciences at Karim Nagar. So they're all passionate about this field of breastfeeding. So what I'll do now is, you know, we, I will just walk and discuss with you also. It is not, it will not be just a, you know, on, talking to only four of you, them, because I really I want to know where the gaps are, right from each one of you, because I believe that we should act rather than talk. So walk the talk, that's my favorite, uh, you know, tagline nowadays, that we have been really talking and talking. Every year we celebrate the breastfeeding week, and we speak about the goodness of breast milk, human milk, to our mothers in our institutes. We have huge banners, we have nice pictures, and then we send them for awards. We also get awarded for all those activities, what we do. But later, when you see the ground level, it's really shocking and pathetic. Now, over to the next slide. Can we move this here? Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, of course, this is myself, and then uh, Dr. Bhaskar and Dr. Ali Melu, a gynecologist uh, for supposed to join. We are Dr. Dilima. We invite her whenever she comes over. Now, uh, just to have an overview, a brief overview, Dr. Ali Melu, uh, because we all know about the goodness, but can you just tell what we need to highlight when we tell to the mother that why they should be feeding their own milk? So, uh, year, at, year after, good afternoon, everybody. So, thank you, Dr. Himabindu. So, thank you for this opportunity. So, year after year, it's always the same. We are always talking. But unfortunately, things are showing this on the data. So, the improvement has to come. And I think we are supposed to do it, and we are the torchbearers. We have to do it. Everybody is single. Every single uh, person's responsibility to see that it improves. So what so, will you tell to the mother that yeah. why she should breastfeed? So, yes. So we uh, see it's called mom. Mom is mother's own milk. And nothing can replace it. When uh, you need human blood to replace blood for a human, why buffalo's milk for babies? So human milk, human babies. That's one important concept. And the most important concept, again, which drives the mother is, if you give your own milk, the baby will be uh, more intelligent. So it improves onto the IQ. Your child will do very well in school. So this is one of the most important driving factor, I think, we can so convince the mother. So you will say mothers. human milk for human babies, and then second, the IQ. IQ. So Rangaya, sir, how will you impress the, your clients in your OPD? Sir is really doing so much with the media, and he really helps all of us to even connect with the public with a lot of social messages. I always tell mother who is telling that I don't have milk, I don't have sufficient milk to the baby. Then I ask how you will be knowing, either weighing or how you will measure. Mother milk low, immunoglobin syrup, tarata, manako, resistance, diabetes, all allergies, obesity, even nuntai. Tarata, Palaku wait the Mukanga mother milk, Yotamala, mother ku cancer ninchi. They are protected and the intelligence, what she tells, and bonding and affection, and it will be there. Yeah, anybody from the audience, apart from this, did you uh, feel that this sentence has really made a change? And because I told this, the mothers actually started giving their own milk without even experimenting any other. Anything? Anybody from the floor? Natra Nagamani. Uh, best vaccine. First vaccine to the baby. Yeah. So um, every mother or parent wants a smart baby, a very intelligent child, and of course no infections, no allergies, and of course and the point that they may be protected from cancer, future allergic problems, all this will go a long way to impress the mother. Yeah, definitely. I think instead of just telling them all the whole thing, that it has glucose, protein. That's for us to teach our undergraduates. But for the parents, you can just say this is the only milk which will suffice to the growth development. Proper proportion of everything is there. And it is good for not for the only the body. It is the food for your mind and soul of the baby also. So we have spoken about all this, that it protects the babies from long-term and short-term problems, especially the critical thousand days. So those thousand days, we all know how important it is when the brain is wired, the wiring is happening. So that is the time when the child should get the best start and the milk which is given is the human milk is the best which, uh, for the baby during that time. Now, Dr. Sankoj Bhaskar, uh, see, the, what are the, presently what are we doing? How are you promoting breastfeeding? And uh, are we doing actually what the IAP has been telling us so far? Where are we now? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Himabindu, for your excellent uh, walk and talk with panel and with uh, participants. And I thank the scientific committee for taking up this uh, as an important aspect of the scientific committee. As you all know, IAP has been doing IAP weeks. Wherever there is an opportunity, they are promoting about the breastfeeding activities. They are arranging inducements. Despite that, as Dr. Ali Melu said, we are talking, but we are unable to implement it to the extent what we are supposed to do. For example, WHO wants the exclusive early breastfeeding at least 50% by 2025. 20, we are closer to that, but 
I don't know whether we can reach or not. So, uh, any others, uh, Dr. Sanjeev ji, what about uh, just about your comments? Uh, the present strategies of breastfeeding, uh, where are we failing? Where are we now? Like, why we are not able to achieve still? So, thank you, Dr. Hema Bindu, for having me here. And I also thank Indian Academy of Pediatrics to take this issue. While I see a very few people in this hall, unfortunate part of breastfeeding is understanding its importance. We know for last 10 years, 20 years, but when it comes to actually implementing it, uh, I think there is a huge gap. In the state of Telangana, for example, I'm just giving you a little statistics. We have institutional delivery to the tune of 99%. This means almost 100% women are delivering in the health facility. This means the woman is in touch with health provider. This could be a doctor, this could be an obstetrician, this could be a staff nurse, this could be an a &M, or this could be a midwife. This means she is in touch with someone for her antenatal care as well as during delivery. But if we look at the breastfeeding in first hour, first hour, the percentage is abysmally low. It is hardly 36, 37 percent. This means there is a huge gap between what we preach and what we practice. And that is something which is always a point of disagreement or my disenchantment whenever I talk to my pediatric friends. I mean, we had a series of meetings. I don't remember in last 10 years, 12 years, at least we have not less than 10, 15 meetings specifically on breastfeeding. And every time, this has been my pain point, understanding the benefits of breastfeeding. Each one of us sitting in this hall is aware how important breastfeeding, as per the assessment by WHO UNICEF, this is the cheapest intervention to save children. I mean, you cannot have better intervention than this. In spite of that, our practice is very, very low. So this is where I've been challenging Dr. Himabindu Singh. I've been challenging my colleagues from Indian Academy of Pediatrics. I remember a few years back we had a discussion on this and but interesting revelation was that we assume that pediatricians will do. Actually, they are not there when delivery happens. It is primarily obstetrician or a medical officer or a staff nurse. They are the ones who handle breastfeed uh, deliveries. And this matter has been taken forward, mental taken forward by pediatricians who are not always there. They are there in certain cases. This means we have to go beyond pediatricians. We need to reach out to medical officers. We need to reach out to obstetricians. And very interesting, Dr. Hima Bindu, I still remember when we were having IMO folks sitting in that meeting, a person told me, sir, I think you are mistaken. More than obstetricians, a lot of these C-sections or even deliveries are conducted by general surgeons. Either they are husbands or someone who's sitting, already sitting in this nursing home. So we need to reach out to practically to everyone. And that actually opened my eyes. So this is one area which cannot be just handled by pediatric community alone. We need to go beyond pediatricians, neonatologists. We need to reach out to obstetricians who are, again, very important stakeholder. We wanted Neelima Singh to be here today. Unfortunately, she isn't around. But I mean, through all of you, and I'm not sure who's operating in our team. Oh, she's also a pediatrician. So our most important community is not here. Anyways, but this message will go. So I stop here, not take others' thank time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one, one, so, uh, Bindu, just yeah. one minute. Uh, the NHM, uh, through Telangana uh, NHM, now we have a stamp that is made, sir. So yeah, we'll come to green, that. It is coming in the no, next no, slides. No, no, three colored stamps that are put in all the other the next, delivery next slides centers. Not just that. Red color, there is a green color. That is if the baby is breastfed within one hour of birth, there is a stamp that is put on the case sheet with the time, delivery time and initiation with the nurse we who will did come the to delivery. The interventions. Yeah, no, no. Then there is a blue colored one. If it is delayed more than 24 hours, there is a reason for it, and there is a red-colored stamp. If not started, 
there is the need why the, the breastfeeding was not started has to be mentioned in this term. So this has been now uh, started in all the centers. Yeah. Uh, from the floor, what do you like to anybody say why we are not able to achieve it? There's a lot of gap. Why we are not able to achieve it? Dr. Sanjeev said we have been training only pediatricians. Maybe the, no, we are supposed to also go beyond pediatricians because they are actually not there during deliveries. It is the gynecologists have to be involved, even Indian Medical Association, where we have cross all the, uh, you know, uh, specialists will be there. So I think you all have to be involved and we did conduct a round table meeting when Dr. Sanjeev was also there. We had in Nilofa Hospital, where the other stakeholders really opened our eyes. One for leader in the IMA said, the breast milk exclusive only for four months. So still the old, uh, you know, this uh, things, concepts are still there. So it is, I think uh, we should make the, all the organizations aware and all stakeholders should be involved. So anybody from the floor to say any, why we are still not reaching out? Meeting our indicator, Indre Shekhar or sir. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, Himabindu and the team for an excellent social topic. She has asked me directly why we are not achieving the expected results. The ball is in our court. What we are doing, breastfeeding and lactation management should reach outside the hospitals, will go to the high schools, colleges, and every mother should be taught, every teacher, every Anganwadi worker, apart from our uh, medical students. Secondly, our bridging between the OBGY and pediatric is not very strong. We should be a partnership in promotion of the breastfeeding. We must highlight the benefits of the breast milk, like DHA factor, bifidus factor, etc. How many of us doing the skin-to-skin -skin contact soon after the birth? Lactation management starts antenatally. All of us should put together and do it. That's why we are unable to reach it. Let us do it to promote the breastfeeding, preserve the breastfeeding, and propagate the breastfeeding. That's our primary duty. Thank you, Imagin. Thank you, sir. Pulse of wisdom. And yes, yes, Rangaya, sir. Mainly, mother prenatal counseling, that is very important. See, immediately after birth, she don't know anything, how to give, what to do, when to give. But we have to prepare her in prenatal and gynecology is the major part. After birth, pediatricians, you have to counsel, you have to take time and sit with them and we have to explain why you will not get, why somebody is getting, why you are not getting. We have to explain to them and counsel, definitely they are convinced. Thank you. So these are the, uh, from, they are the uh, experienced practitioners who are speaking uh, these points. We have to keep all this in mind. So where we are failing. Uh, so many recommendations have been there in place in so many years. It's been more than 50, 60 years we have been promoting breastfeeding, WHO is recommending, the early initiation of breastfeeding, we know it should happen within hour, maybe immediately in the labor room. And then exclusive breastfeeding, first six months, and continuing breastfeeding two years and beyond. We all know these parameters to call, you know, the, your, uh, every institute has to follow this. But see the statistics, very, very poor. Early initiation breastfeeding, overall, all over India, is only 41.8%. That was more than half of our mothers are, are not initiating breastfeeding on time. Though these guidelines have been given by the government of India and even WHO. So why we are so much lagging? See, Th Telangana, the early initiation breastfeeding is still poorer. Combined to the you know, uh, average of India, we are lagging still behind the average. It is only 37.1. It's very, very pathetic. Do you think that, don't you think that we should act instead of only talking? We have been talking, talking, talking. Where are we? Only 37.1 percentage of our children are getting breast milk on time or early initiations happening in the labor rooms. So where is the fault? Most of the deliveries are now institutional. Is it not the, you know, our prime responsibility? The, the accountability is on the healthcare providers now. So we need to really now brainstorm and see where are the gaps. And even the exclusive breastfeeding rates are still very, very poor. Though they have just increased a little bit than compared to the previous statistics, but we need to do more, much more. WHO targets at least 50% by 2025. And uh, even, uh, you know, worldwide, by about over a period of 15 to 20, about 44% were actually breastfed earlier. Okay, let's uh, skip this. Now, in spite of the awareness programs we are doing, 
and so many trainings. Trainings are also happening. The government of India spends a lot of money in trainings. Asha, Anganwadi workers, medical officers, still there is a gap. Now, to just discuss where are the barriers, already few of the barriers have been, uh, just came out from the floor. Dr. Bhaskar, would you like to add to the barriers which are already discussed? How to overcome them? Yeah, yeah. There are really many barriers in our society. First and foremost, the grandparents, they do not believe in early initiation of breast feeds. And uh, some of them, they believe in giving pre-lacteal feeds. So that should be altered. For that, we need to counsel them, counsel the, their uh, grandparents or their uh, mother-in-laws. Uh, that's possible through, as I rightly said, it's possible, it should start from obstetrician. During every antenatal visit, it should, they should take up it as a part of uh, their counseling about uh, breastfeeding in relation to the obstetric uh, point of view. And secondly, uh, I think uh, we should promote, uh, we should aggressively promote uh, promotion of breastfeeding through media, through celebrities like Amitabh Bachchan or uh, like Bahubali, the heroine. So such things should be practiced. And thirdly, we pediatricians should promote uh, breast uh, feeding friendly hospital initiative. We should promote them to follow those 10 rules. And I think we should create awareness among the mothers, particularly those who are less educated or uh, uneducated. Yeah, so Dr. Bhaskar said three things. One is counseling antenatally and postnatally. Second, he said using media and celebrities for promotion of breastfeeding. And third, he said making every facility baby and mother, uh, mother and baby friendly hospital, you know, initiative or making them mother and baby friendly. Now, Ramya, would you like to add a few points? Yes, ma'am. Uh, keeping the mother and the baby together all the time. Training contact. Yes. Like mothering in, rooming in, keeping the mother and the baby together and also training the healthcare professionals, other healthcare professionals, like the, uh, like other than uh, doctors, uh, whoever is going to be attending to the mother, the midwife, she can also tell a word to the mother whether at the time of delivery, preparing the mother mentally, that will also help the mother in continuing breastfeeding. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shekhar? You are leading a very uh, busy center at Mehboob Nagar. Can you tell me what are the barriers you are facing and what you are doing to overcome those challenges for early initiation of breastfeeding? Because I'm, we want a pan Telangana representation. We want to know what's happening in the districts. You want us, Mike? Good evening, all. So, I think uh, this is the best topic for the periphery practitioners. And uh, so. I think every uh, thing is covered. One is like uh, I rightly said. Uh, so we are trying to initiate as early as possible once the baby is recovered. I mean, uh, out of uh, oxy. I mean, ventilator. One thing. Second thing is we are getting mother into ICUs. We are getting mothers into ICUs. Once the baby is off uh, ventilation, we are trying to initiate. Uh, by uh, touching the baby, asking mother to give care by touching or initiation of breastfeeding. And at the same time, we are giving a kangaroo mother care in uh, NICU only for the, to initiate that part. So we are taking care of that. Thank you. I think there are some few things like uh, making the mother, mother always be there besides the baby and touching the baby, skin to skin contact and involving themselves in the care during the NICU stay. These are few challenges which can be overcome. Now, we all know these barriers already said. Uh, there could be even uh, like uh, issues with the breast and you know, nipple and certain things which will require practical support apart from counseling. There could be very poor family support to the lady. So you have to look at all those factors, social factors also. So we need a lactation counselor in a high load center or those some nurse, any, anybody in your facility can be trained to look into it. Actually, it's a very passionate field. If you have the passion, then only you really can do that heart-to-heart -heart counseling. So counseling is an art and skill. So please identify somebody in your facility who can give the time and really do, they'll say. Okay, that sort of counseling should happen. And this will, that will really be, be a big support to the pair, child, mother who's not having any other support. And of course, pre-lacteal fees, there could be some cultural practices, there could be, if this is a very big thing, baby and mother being separated. So that should be stopped immediately. We are all advocating now skin-to-skin -skin contact. 
So how many of us, kindly please tell us, honestly, here we are, we are not even seeing your, noting your names, honestly put your hand on your heart and just say, how many of you are still, your babies are, now after delivery, are on the cot? Those who are conducting deliveries, how many of the babies are away from the mother? All are with the mother? Very good. That's a huge benefit, but still, they should not be just lying down there. They should start, actually, somebody should practically help them. And we can utilize the presence of a birth companion. You know, they, this is a new concept, but it's not so new also. We all have to do that, both in private and public sector. And uh, the availability of substitutes, that could sometimes become a barrier and multitasking of healthcare provider. For all this, we need to, there are answers. So like, you know, uh, the healthcare provider can have a checklist and divide the work rather than saying, I cannot do this, all this work. This is very, very simple if you have a checklist and decentralized. No strategies, some of them already mentioned, skilled counseling, motivating the mothers during antenatal visits, examining the breast for any problems they have, and proper guidance on technique of feeding and practically helping them. Counseling, not just the mother, also the family and community. Zero separation. And all of facilities should have zero separation policy. Never separate the baby. In fact, we are now advocating all in the government sector, even in the private, they are delivering the baby on the mother's abdomen, get the baby after stabilized onto the chest, cut the umbilical cord only after stabilization, skin to skin contact here, and start early initiation of breastfeeding. Show her practically. Don't just tell her, take and start actually uh, latching the baby onto the breast. So that is what we need to do and strict implementation of the IMS Act. And of course, follow all the 10 steps and have counselors if you are overloaded. Uh, we have another 10 minutes. So uh, we have how to overcome exclusive breastfeeding, Dr. Ali Melu. We have seen, we have spoken about the early initiation, which is a really a bad indicator. That is 37% only. I think that's the first indicator we should change, start changing that. Because once you, the initiation happens, then sustenance is easy. So, but six months of exclusive breastfeeding also is not happening to the expected mark. So why, why it is so and how to overcome? Yes, uh, so like you have already mentioned, I think we should have a care companion at the time of delivery who start that initiation. So that first golden hour, I think that's the first hour when they are in the labor room, that's the golden hour to start breastfeeding. And once the baby starts to breastfeed, I think there shouldn't be any problem with exclusive breastfeeding because as pediatricians, all of us are talking about exclusive breastfeeding. I think uh, if the first hour, I think that's the first step. The golden hour, if it can be, uh, you know, started immediately, I think the next six months will fall in place. I think that is the first one, one barrier which we can overcome. And of course, this uh, too much of advertisements as IMS acts is already there. But I think uh, like how cigarette packets have uh, that skull and saying danger to health, uh, health and all that, I think all the milk packets and milk boxes along with the bottles should have that same kind of red skull with us with a X or some danger sign saying this is so harmful to your baby. Something that representative and strongly should be on all the milk boxes, I think. Thank you. Anybody for the floor? Why do you think six months, Manu, six months complete the breast milk give it ledu? Induku. So, wonderful uh, discussion. I am from Karimnagar, past president of PADS. So, the only thing is we are discussing ourselves. The main, main focus should be family-centered. It should shift from this all to the family. We have been discussing almost for the last 40 years, 50 years, the same, same, same old. I don't think it will change, but if you take to the, before the, the technology, everybody used to give the normal delivery, the normal delivery became an abnormal delivery, abnormal delivery became a normal delivery. So where will be the, will keep the baby with the new one? New one with mother, it is very difficult. So because if you Telangana, it is a very problematic. Why? Because 95% of the deliveries are abnormal. Abnormal. Whatever it is, I don't know. Abnormal. Who made it? Society had made it. Who made it? The mother has made it. Who made it? Parents has made it. Family has made it. And one-armed child, two-armed child, working woman, educated, economically, socially, all are multifactorial 
and now the government is telling that you doctors to decrease that is again a problem so i think whatever the things which are di- we are discussing it has to shift to the socially community and the family then only i think this can be successful and can be made very powerful thank you very much thank you coming from a past president that's really a, again pearls of wisdom so you know why we are not uh, the mothers are not exclusively breastfeeding for 6 months many of us also must have had children and all of us are working so can any young mother share who's a, a pg or anybody yes can share their own experiences we don't want to come from the textbooks we want to listen from the field because we are really going to launch a new activity in telangana and we want to know all your uh, inputs are, are very much important rawat sir aap kuch bolna chahte hain na yeah nagabani yeah that is non availability of crutches yeah. and baby dr nagamani is the uh, chair of iap women's wing telangana okay <laughs> so we have a women's wing and uh, telangana nagamani heads it dr ramya would like to add what are the barriers and how just all the, don't repeat the same but anything new ma'am um, like availability of leave to the mother one leave leave work most of them as uh, like sir has already pointed out they're working mothers availability of leave to the mother yeah and also like uh, arranging any daycare center for the mother to take the baby yeah so that can also ha- help in continuing the breastfeeding right okay we have only 5 minutes so i think dr sri krishna has cut our time uh, so these are the yes, some of the barriers lack of awareness some of the mothers may not know oh 6 months have to feed by 4 months only they are saying enough char maine de diya now i want to go to work so they are actually trying to get the baby onto the other milk and get used to the baby you know such things are there we have are particularly seen in our especially the well to do families who are very ambitious you know who are working so they have their own uh, mental you know make and they think that breast milk is enough for four months so lack of awareness of the importance of uh, complete breastfeeding for six months not six months two years and beyond that has to be emphasized during all our visits so like in the early initiation we have uh, decided to have a checklist and have uh, this activity happening in the labor room itself and then shift the baby mother out and zero separation for 6 months exclusive breastfeeding to take place all our pediatric we are responsible here in the earlier part maybe dr sanjeev has said we need gynecologist but here for sustaining the breastfeeding we are responsible every visit now we are saying early child development visits ecd visits so every visit 6 10 14 in vaccine don't just say amma e tikal only we are just bothered about tikalu page kya ho gaya we wait routine but we don't see whether the other aspects ha uh, pal istnara ante but she may have lot of thing no eye contact also with the doctor the child the mother may hesitate to even talk she may have lot of problems and issues so have a nurse alternative is have a nurse or somebody in your facility who can give time and ask about how the breastfeeding is going on and the, definitely the working mothers require support leave and other things crutches etc and please see that you don't have any availability of you know the substitutes in and around the facilities now strategies identifying breastfeeding corners also all public places i think we as a community we should support by creating corners for the mothers in all public places airports uh, uh, stands you know we are talking about it why don't we really give a written request to the women development child welfare they are talking about women development and child welfare you know it is definitely comes under them to support the mothers and uh, leaves and paid leave, maternity leave at least 6 months whether contract or regular employee should be given and implementing a strict act on ims because the strictness is very important so till now i have not heard anybody being penalized you know so it should be very very strict people should be afraid of this act and of course strengthening the healthcare providers and uh, see that you all the centers now we are advocating that every facility should be mother and baby friendly so that implementation also we need to promote so two minutes to go uh, how do we strengthen our services dr baskar role of healthcare providers yeah uh, i'll uh, present it very briefly it starts from antenatal visits wherein obstetrician should be very actively uh, skillfully should convince them about uh, promoting breastfeeds secondly in uh, operating room or labor room there should be a lactation counselor or a nurse or some healthcare professional should uh, counsel the mother about the breastfeeding and she, they should initiate uh, breastfeeding immediately after the baby is uh, out even if it is a cesarean 
baby should be taken over to the chest of the mother and they should start feeds and thirdly i request all my colleagues pediatricians please promote breastfeeding if your voice makes real difference more than anybody your voice to the mother will make a huge difference yeah so, so yes, dr baskar only one minute to go i'm afraid the slides will go so before we go to this we'll just see what we want to promise now ims act is also causing lot of havoc dr sanjeev would you like to just say crisply how the ims act is coming or i so, sorry the availability of the substitutes is hampering our progress in promotion of breastfeeding ye dabba wagre hai na wo bottle how that is really uh, causing problems for us crisp crisp okay only one uh, minute to go okay there is definitely an impact of this but uh, uh, the ims of course most of us are very now scared to take uh, uh, you know any funding from those companies but still there are situations okay. where the mother sometimes feel so it will wind it up so but basically is the ims here yeah, wherever you see a dabba and bottle the mothers feel maybe some of the thing they feel that is easy jaldi available hai pila do and they may also feel that is more nutritious so this is really hampering and we should take care that we all are not deviated towards that and now implementation of this uh, concept that is what i want to highlight before this closes down and what is the role that iap would like to play dr bhaskar i think we require all of us we are now planning i want to briefly tell you we had discussion about the telangana promise last year itself and then we decided that we'll go for a initiative called making all the centers mother and baby friendly so where iap dr bhaskar being the president of iap has uh, said that we should do it act then just talk about it so we are coming out with this uh, interventions uh, zero separation so we are going to put this criteria for all the centers so better you all have all this uh, these things in your all facilities we are going to start orienting for sensitizing everybody making a criteria the one of the criteria would be uh, uh, ensuring counseling antenatal visits having a zero separation then you are going to initiate breastfeeding before you bed the baby and mother out of the labor room and have a checklist for that and then proper guidance practical help being given in the postnatal wards and community awareness have counselors if you want trained ones and have corners breastfeeding corners and provision of express breast milk in working mothers in the working spaces that should be given and leaves and all that you know all this all this should be followed by everybody in the center so somebody will come and visit you so there'll be some you know all are we going to have a committee and we're going to visit every center and see whether all these criteria are fulfilled and a certificate and accreditation will be given to all the centers like nnf is doing accreditation for all the centers for a standard of care so similarly an accreditation criteria will be set in place and people will come accreditors will come and visit and check and then give the certificate so the all this should be strictly implemented so this criteria should be fulfilled you know, implement the ims act and appreciation will be given to providers and also to the centers who are mother and baby friendly so this this will be monitored by government and also will be involved the mho ke sath mein baith ke karenge and i am strictly i mean very earnestly saying hum bahut din se bol rahe hain now let us now become very very focused let's orient sensitize first start going for a field visit and check them and later even in the ecd follow up all this should be told to the mothers whether they are doing for 6 months and 2 years beyond all that should be checked and a policy and legislation should come in place i strongly advocate for this bahut ho gaya now we want an act after 1 2 years so if somebody is not following this act they should be penalized or the registration of the facility or the nursing home will be cancelled so aisa kuch hona chahiye at least after giving some time for all the healthcare providers to orient themselves thank you so uh, we all uh, pa pa panelists want to give uh, yeah Uh, crispy 10 seconds message yeah yeah each one of you sir yeah okay you, sir. yeah my message is please tell them that you became doctor because of your mother's milk Or tell them that you are intelligent because of your mother's milk thank Good you message, thank you dr sir. bhaskar and your leadership will definitely roll this out uh, dr sanjeev my unicef yeah my closing statement is anything which is monitored is done anything which is not monitored is not done absolutely all of you need to monitor the early initiation 
early initiation of breastfeeding rates in your own health facility. If you are managing a district, so look at your district, and if you are managing the state, look at the state numbers. So start monitoring it, people will start following. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev, for that closing message. Dr. Alimail and Lamia, one word from each one of you. Yeah, so I think uh, one in investment would be a lactation nurse in every delivery center. I think that's not, uh, that is, I feel, would be cost uh, effective as well. And another thing is having uh, breast pumps. That also helps. So these are besides always. Yeah. Ramya? Family education and family, family support for the mother. Family education and family support. Yeah, thank you. Can we all raise up and make this promise to make Telangana a mother and baby friendly, uh, you, know, uh, you know, state? Can we all thank raise? Thank you, madam. It's like a little exercise for you. Thank I request you. I request you, sir. Thank you, him you him can come madam, on stage, for the sir. excellent moderation of the session. Sir, thank you, madam. Sir. I thank the moderator, Mabindu, madam. I request madam. all the past thank presidents. Thank the panelists. Sir, so just a minute. Yeah. This is a promise, so the, which has to be committed, and you know. Dr. Sri Krishna can join us on stage. All the seniors can come here. Arik Sangragya, sir. And sir. So this is on behalf of IAP Telangana. We are committing that we'll walk the talk. We are going to implement what we have just spoke. And then soon our creation criteria will be released in the month of July itself. We are launching this program. And we are going to make every center which is delivering babies, mother and baby friendly. Sir, please come. I believe in action rather than just talking. So I request you to please join this mission. So, so, okay. So we all promise. We all promise. Come on here, raise your voice. We all promise to make all our facilities delivering babies and nurturing babies Mother and baby friendly. Mother and baby friendly. In by next year. By next year. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I request the panelists and the moderator to please come for the honors. Ladies and gentlemen, let's value our time. It's my pleasure to invite Chairperson of the next Manjee interesting sir. session, Dr. Manjukaya, Manjukonda Rangaya, sir, please come on to the dais. Dr. Suchitra, Associate Professor for Gandhi Hospital, please come on to the dais. It's my pleasure and privilege to invite teacher of the teachers, Professor Dr. Indrashekar Rao Garu, former superintendent. Nilofar Hospital, former additional director of medical education, a trendsetter, a class beyond compare. Sir will be enlightening us on promoting vaccine confidence, how to fight vaccine hesitancy. Over to chairperson, huh? Dr. Ranga Akhtar. Next slide. Focusing. Uh, hello, hello. This topic is very important and uh, we are discussing since uh, months, but still everybody has to know about this. Dr. Professor Indrachekar Rao, sir, will enlighten regarding this. So, Chitra, please introduce, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, words fall short and I am so small before the big uh, tree that is grown in front of us. We are just a rootlet, sir. Uh, introducing Vindrashekar Rao, sir, is my uh, honor and privilege that I have taken here. Sir is, uh, was a former HOD and uh, medical superintendent of Nilopa Hospital, former chairperson for infectious disease chapter of IAP. He was a member for governing council, Indian College of Pediatrics, ICP-IAP. And he was convener, advisory committee on vaccines and immunization practices. So it is our honor to hear from you today, sir. The pearls, what we get from you will be a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Rangai Garu. Thank you, Madam, for the good words. Distinguished faculty of our central zone, guest faculty from all over India, who are our dear learned guests, my dear students who have become experts and stalwarts in IAP and all other invitees. A very good afternoon to you all today with me, 
with four decades of performing, I see IAP is very secure academically and intellectually. All our students have become eminent personalities and stalwarts in IAP. I give salutations and applause to that. Learning is a lifelong process. One should not think we know everything and stay time in the conference, in the lobbies, and also in the exhibition. It's a time we should sit in the hall and learn something which is being told because every lecture has some take-home message. Okay? I really thank both Baskars, IAP TCB and also IAP Telangana for giving me an opportunity. I decide to have a short lecture on important social aspect, why vaccines are not taking up properly, why we are unable to give the vaccines, what is the take-home message. Okay? With this, I go forward. I want to give a brief history of immunization, how we progressed in last so many years. This immunization is the single most public health intervention that has created an impact in the health of the children of our country. Testimony is eradication of smallpox way back in 1977, eradication of polio in 2016, and also elimination of maternal and neonatal tests. So immunization is one of the strong pillars, in, you know it, and others are breastfeeding, growth monitoring, ORS, etc. Still this holds good for all of us. All of us should know, particularly the youngsters, the milestones in immunization, very important, is started in 19... Babu. Caller mic. 1978, we started the expanded program of immunization, targeting six vaccine-preventable diseases, BCG, OPV, DPT, and measles, successfully, then 85, we renamed it as Universal Immunization Program and for giving vaccines to children below one year. Subsequently, the program of safe childhood and child survival and safe motherhood has come very vigorously implemented with UNICEF help in 1992. And now the government of India is so determined to So, immunization program is the largest in the world with annual cohorts of 27 million infants and 30 million pregnant who are covering. It is the greatest program in the world which we should be proud of it. All of us should know, particularly for the youngsters, the story since 2010, several vaccines have been introduced, 85 vaccination against vaccine diseases, slowly 2002 hepatitis B, I was a professor at Nilofar Hospital at that time. Slowly escalation occurs. Now, 2017, we are having measles, rubella, PCV, and also JE in the routine in Indra Dhanush program. The UAP program is Indra Dhanush program. We are part and parcel of the country's immunization program. We are not separate. We should be together and do it thoroughly. But how to fill the gaps of vaccine hesitancy in the community, let us see what are the causes and how we are going to do it. So, we know the success. We have seen that the Indra Dhanush is successful. We are giving so many vaccination. But how should we go forward on this issue? The shortcomings we should know. WHO targets disease elimination, measles, rubella, etc. are being scheduled. Still, we see outbreaks. We are having the reporting system, rubella, measles, AFMA, Reporting system is in place. Every day we see fever with rash. In fever hospital, we see every week 10 to 12 cases of diphtheria. Still, it is not totally eliminated. In Karnataka, many medical students had a positive diphtheria. 
still it is there. So our immunization program, we have the laurels to feel happy, but it is not complete. The disease eradication can remove the pathogen, it needs to be coupled with overall development, very, very important. But children need many more things than the vaccination. Number one is the nutrition, sanitation, healthy living are the core factors. That is why in the slums and crowded areas, we see the outbreaks of the diseases. Then we do measles intense immunization program. Where are we lagging in the immunization? In spite of millions of rupees and millions of persons working in the healthcare. Why? What is the problem? There is, despite the progress routine child immunization coverage is slow to rise. In a democratic country like us, we cannot enforce properly. Estimated 38 to 40 percent of children fail to receive all basic vaccines in the first year of life. There have been outbreaks in 2019 of diphtheria. Even now it is there. And already epidemiology is shifting. Outbreaks are occurring in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. And this is an example of medicos in Karnataka. Other day I was in Karnataka sharing that they got medical student diphtheria. So what is our achievement? Where are we lagging behind? Measles, we are lagging behind. Outbreaks are occurring. India, fourth largest. And also measles case up by 300%. There is vaccination dip that is because of the recent COVID pandemic. And the list can continue. Vaccine providers, we, society and the government should own up the responsibility for this lagging behind and also the vaccination drip. What are the factors affecting the vaccination? Particularly in last two years with the pandemic of COVID disrupting the social life family life, the economy, and the togetherness. There is disruption in every field of the family, the togetherness. Secondly, limited knowledge of spectrum of vaccine among the doctors. Consequently, the education of the parents should be very well done and tell that each and every vaccine is useful, should be given. Lack of awareness and knowledge of the vaccines and initiative of ice cube towards polio vaccine. It's all skewed only towards polio vaccine. It is not so. There are several vaccines, though not in the UAP program. We need to protect children. Vaccines are not endowed in the government unless they are approved. Parents will ask you, I made the sub All vaccines have given. But when you tell of hepatitis A, when you tell of typhoid vaccination, when you tell of swine flu vaccination, they hesitate because they are not in the program. Lastly, effect of COVID, a major hindrance for all of us. All our manpower, all the human resource has been diverted to vaccinating adults for the pandemic with COVID vaccination and not much has been done to the routine immunization and the vaccinations. Same thing, patients prefer in difficult times to treat for the fever, COVID positive, than to think of the vaccination. Several vaccines are continued, are considered very high risk. Why should I take typhoid fever? Why should I take? Right now, post-COVID, we are seeing children coming from other places, particularly from US, staying for one week, developing dengue, typhoid, hepatitis A positive. Concept of adult vaccination is not established. Medical people tell, why should I spend money for vaccines? Insurance company should give. Insurance company is not giving the vaccine coverage. That is something has to be done at the statutory level. Limitation in the cold chain till the last minute distribution, till the last vaccine is given the delivery point, the cold chain has to be maintained. Otherwise, the potency of the vaccine is lost and you are unable to give a viable vaccination. And even if you are prepared to give in the office practice, many multinational companies are in the order to supply to the government. They are unable to supply certain important vaccines to us. Shortage is existing. This is a very good global story of vaccination written by Plotkin very long back. The impact of vaccination on health of world's people is hard to exaggerate. With the exception of safe water to drink, no other modality has such a major effect on the mortality reduction and population growth. Meaning, safe water is very good for survival. Similarly, vaccination has a great impact on the positive health of the children and we need to nurture this thought and propagate it. 
now the new concept which is there anti vaccine lobby hesitancy vaccine delay vaccine all these things are going on right from 2000 when i have seen in a belgium vaccinology conference there is a lobby protesting about say, no vaccines we need independence but still it is a behavior influenced by a number of factors including confidence i don't trust the vaccine complacency do not perceive there is a need for vaccine i do not value vaccine i need good food tonic and other things for children and medicines not vaccine and no to for a vaccine do not value and convenience there is no access when can i come i cannot reach the facility if i go to government hospital is not available this is these are the things vaccine hesitancy group found out these are the reasons why vaccine hesitancy is there in the community vaccine is a, is one of the 10 global threats for the child health please remember we as a pa pediatricians need to rectify the vaccine hesitancy delay in acceptance and refusal of vaccines despite availability of the vaccine services in our office rooms and the hospitals is called the vaccine hesitancy why is a complex and context specific varying across time place and vaccine it is influenced by various factors as i told complacency convenience and lack of confidence these are the things complacency convenience and confidence trust is my vaccine safe where child will have any adverse events and is this vaccine prevented is it necessary is it availability and also accessibility these are all the things in the mind for vaccine hesitancy who has created a model how to increase vaccination model in the community to improve the vaccination intake <coughs> number 1 what people think and feel perceive the risk worry confidence trust and safety concerns are there is a social process it should give good media coverage should give continuously communication like all india radio ranga sir goes every other day give social messages on vaccinations and also breastfeeding or is so many things i admire his abilities to do this social commitment should be there and he does this thank you ranga garu for your great work for the commitment motivation readiness willing to intent and hesitancy we should be motivated to outcome and to beat the hesitancy practical issue availability of the vaccine convenience cost quality etc should be taken into the things and the intervention fatigue fatigue is also is important vaccination schedule the appointment consent accept delay and do not refuse schedule the appointment ask them to come sit and discuss with them this is a practical management i am not just showing my photo this family is known to me parents i have been being a senior pediatrician they used to come to me as patient childhood patient the daughter last 6 months at home because of covid studying intermediate and developed headache mother thought it is something else somebody told it is something else and they are giving the treatment went to neurosurgeon only thing she was having a depression because of isolation parents did not give vaccination the side issue she did not receive any vaccine after after 5 years of age she is already 15 years and she did not receive hepatitis a not given swine flu not given human papilloma virus not given then who will give it parent doesn't know it is we we should take the responsibility to motivate since i have the rapport with the parents i spend time establish positive dialogue initiate family counseling give value time my dear friends you should develop eye to eye contact language and give time give time even if your op is busy give time value time if you give they will agree for communication strategies are plenty you must go into communication strategy and tell them how could you do it and also you are sending to good college good education good dress good food why not good protection you must give a comparative study correction of the false beliefs religious <coughs> beliefs and all those things are there we should do it and be conscious media i have seen in nilo for hospital is a double edged sword as sword so be positive with media communicate with media tell the positive effects it is over one minute more the strategies of communication is community influence grassroots leaders communicate effectively partner with existing state governments with 
child welfare department immunization officers we can do it definitely local vaccination programs publicity should be given and improve the convenience to access immunization at the local centers private and public same thing connect with the parents tell them the need to give the vaccines apart from the universal immunization programs the new vaccine identify the concerns tell child is growing she has risk of getting typhoid fever papilloma virus influenza etc include children and youth in communication and also behavior go to the schools and colleges where children and adolescents are there give them the lectures collaborate with public health officials academics and healthcare associations this is see what has happened refusal they refuse polio vaccine in pakistan in this place called waziristan there are outbreak of polio so this is occurring if you are complacent so eternal vigilance is success to maintain the success of eradication we must have constant vigilance this was national polio surveillance eradication program recently conducted i went on behalf of the polio eradication you can see dr datta and the people she was was sir arora and these people are there navin takkar strategy vaccines are the victims of their own success public perception is not always positive need consistent strategy go on changing and doing it to sustain the coverage so how can you overcome restore services adhering to hygiene physical distancing because post covid protective help, equipment to the health workers and helping health workers to communicate who are the health workers in our office practice the vaccines coverage health workers means we our staff should be done and rectify the community gaps expand routine services to reach missed communities with where some of the most vulnerable children live the slums and downtrodden people role we can play in the private sector very important most of us on 80% of the healthcare is provided by us delivered through uip has been doubled and these vaccines are very important typhoid chicken pox hepatitis a human papilloma mumps are not covered in the uip but still parallelly while being part of the uip you should propagate these vaccines and must work towards increasing acceptability information and the importance of vaccination and key messages for all of us which you know only we should think again and do it is immunization is recognized as a core component of human right to health and individual we should not deny any family the child to get a vaccine where affluent countries are getting it is the responsibility of the community <coughs> government is doing everything bringing new vaccines and healthcare providers are the we are the source of information and we should both central communication role trust is bold over time brick by brick from individual acts and require genuine care accountability and out of general public media and also personal communication with the parents increase the coverage and reduce the vaccine hesitancy let us work together to dispel the vaccine hesitancy in the community particularly post covid area because several the economy is bringing up children are going to schools let us do lot of counseling give time enhance and endorse all the vaccines uip and other vaccines we parents think uip is a close no we should tell the newer vaccines which are necessary to give positive and good health for these children it is our professional responsibility thank iap tcb for this thank you thank you very much sir thank a you a huge round of applause sir needs no less than a standing ovation for his crystal clear very lucid presentation blended with experience of more than 40 years that speaks volumes very mature and composed and very comprehensive sir we will take your every word forward every word is geeta bible quran put together for us sir i bow and salute before you thank you sir thank you very much ladies thank, and gentlemen you, let's go for thank another you, interesting presentation well done sir thank dr ranga sir dr suchit thank you sir you explain very nicely and you were experience all the party years so very useful for all juniors and all pediatricians who's practicing baskar sir so we are thankful to you for a nice lecture so ladies and gentlemen put your hand together
for another stalwart who has taken DIAP platform from national level to international level is none other than Dr. G. V. Baswaraja. Sir has come all the way from Bengaluru, a composed and balanced person, a pure academician, professor of pediatrics, Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health, Bengaluru. No words to describe his commitment. Over to Dr. Baswaraja, sir, for giving us his inputs on shock management and its updates. Thank you, Dr. Indra Shakarov, sir, and your team. Yeah, thank so you. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Srinivas Kalani, sir, for your kind words. Thank Dr. Basura, sir, who is well known to us, your IMA Central Secretary for last all over India is very popular. And uh, all the way he has taken time and came to, to deliver his lecture today. Thank you very much, sir. Please introduce. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rangaya, sir, and Suchitra, madam. Yes, sir. Just a few words and your lecture goes on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As a chief uh, pediatric intensive care unit, he is an intensivist, but so busy around the uh, entire country for IAPNs, especially. He is working hard, looking forward for higher post. And he is uh, presently at Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health, Bangalore, and he is an honorary secretary general of Central IAP for the year 2021. Over to Vasarath, sir, for your talk. Thank you so much, uh, uh, the organizing committee of NA Central Zone Pedicon, led by Dr. Radha Krishna Kundala, sir, Dr. Sunkoji Baskar, sir, and Dr. Arakala Baskar, sir, and the team, IAP PADS and uh, Twin City branch. Of course, our chairperson, Dr. Rangaya, sir, and Suchitra, madam. What I'll be talking about for the next 20 minutes about the shock management, what really which has been changed in the last few years, what re we need to adopt it in the clinical practice, so just before moving to the management per se, okay. So just a word about what is shock. Shock is an acute syndrome, basically, which is in a circulatory system, which is unable to provide an adequate oxygen and the nutrient that bodies met to meet the metabolic demands of the body. When we talk about a shock, we need to know the different types of a shock. The common thing what we all come across in the clinical practice is in a, our uh, I put in hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock is one of the common thing. And basically, the moment you say hypovolemic shock, either an external loss or internal loss of any blood, plasma and the fluid. It could be because of any trauma or it could be burns which is causing a plasma loss or it could be any fluid loss which is maybe because of any acute gastroenteritis. That's the commonest thing. Most of the time you will not have a much difficulty in managing an hypovolemic shock. The next thing which is cardiogenic shock, basically the moment we say cardiogenic shock either because of any filling defect are emptying defect, are delivering the things. So basically it is a pump payload that results in a thing. It could be CHD, it could be a viral myocarditis, or it could be a myocarditis. These are the or cardiomyopathy. These are the things which is because of a cardiogenic shock. And the next thing is obstructive. Obstructive is basically either right outflow obstruction is affected or left outflow obstruction is affected because of either a pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, or a pneumothorax, these are the things are in an obstruction at the left ventricular outflow because of a stenosis and all, that is an other thing. Distributive shock is in a one thing, what we generally get it is in a dengue, septicemia, these are the things which is, of course, anaphylactic shock and neurogenic shock is another thing we need to keep it in our mind. Just briefly, before going into the management, briefly touch upon the uh, what the pathophysiology in a patient with a shock. Basically, in the hypovolemic shock, when the fluid loss is occurred, the effective circulatory volume is lost, 
that results in a reduced free load and re uh, reduced cardiac output and organ perfusion is finally is affected and leading onto the shock. Whereas in a cardioseptic shock, it is not only just uh, the volume loss with the internal thing and also there will be a myocardial contractility and distribution, um, mal distribution of a fluid which is taking place in the body that leading onto the shock in a septicemic shock. That is the one thing which is a nightmare to the pediatric intensivist and emergency physician in the pediatric uh, emergency department and ICU. So cardiogenic shock is another thing. Basically, it is in a decreased cardiac output because of the pump failure that leading on to the organ perfusion which is likely to be impaired which is causing in a shock. So with this, let's move to the goals of our shock management. Basically, the moment we say shock, the first and foremost thing as a clinician we need to recognize the shock at the early stage. Why early stage? The moment you intervene at the early stage, your morbidity will be less and outcome will be better and mortality will not be the thing. So that's how you need to be. And suppose if the patient comes in a late stage, we need to stabilize and you need to transfer the child to the thing. How do we recognize? Let's look into the first one. The first and foremost thing is we need to look at the temperature. Temperature is one of the things, it is especially in a septic shock where the difference between the core and body temperature will be, will be more than 2 degrees centigrade. The first and foremost thing in a case of a shock, earliest sign of a shock is a tachycardia. So tachycardia, not all tachycardia is a shock. Tachycardia could be because of another thing also, but we need to recognize the you know, tachycardia in a shock and recognize the shock in early. So most of the time, what we have tuned in our mind is to look at the blood pressure. Yes, we, blood pressure uh, recording is an important thing, but blood pressure is the la later it is likely to be affected. That is why we look at the heart rate and pulse rate to pick it up the shock. The moment you're looking at the blood pressure, it depends upon the, if it is an hypovolemic shock, there will be a narrow pulse pressure, especially hypovolemia and dengue. In case of an septicemic shock, there will be a wide pulse pressure. That's where it will be useful thing. Capillary refilling time is another thing. Normally it is less than 2 seconds. Anything more than 2.5 seconds, that is a 2, 2 to 5 seconds. That's the early stage of a shock. More than 5, it is in a late stage of a shock. Hydration we need to look at and skin color is another thing we need to be looked. And apart from these vitals, we need to look for an organ perfusion, especially urine output is another thing. You always monitor the urine output and maintaining the good uh, mental status is another thing. And gastric, especially if the patient is putting uh, going into the shock, it can develop into the paralytic acellus. You need to be very, very watchful with the bowel sound. Of course, tachypnea and all, it is going to develop in a later stage of a shock. With this, once you recognize the shock, next thing comes as a clinician, we need to manage the shock. How do we manage that? Let's look into these things. It is in a multi-pronged approach to manage a shock. The first and foremost thing is, how do we increase the oxygen delivery system and decrease the oxygen demand. The whole purpose of management of a shock depends upon these two things. So maintaining your, uh, increasing your oxygen delivery and decreasing your oxygen. How do we do that? All the patient with a shock, we need to deliver an oxygen and fluid will come to that each uh, type of a shock where the management of fluid is going to be defined. Correcting the metabolic abnormality and temperature, wherever it is indicated, we need to think about an antibiotics and inotropes and mechanical ventilation in a late stage of a shock. What should be your therapeutic endpoint as a clinician? We need to normalize your heart rate and pulse rate is the thing. The mean arterial pressure, we need to bring it down to the normal. Uh, achieving a capillary refilling time of less than 2 seconds and differences between the skin and core temperature, you should bring it down to the less than 3 degrees centigrade. You need to maintain a urine output of more than 1 ml per kg of an per hour. If the fluid is, if the urine output is more than 2.5 ml, that's the sepsis guidelines which is came in 2016, latest which is in a 2020, and update which has came in a 2021. So what I'm going to talk, I'm not going to talk in detail, whatever the, sep the survival sepsis guidelines, which has been changed in 2021 update, I'm going to talk about to it the practical aspect of it. So when you say why septic shock, we are things because mortality and morbidity in an emergency department in intensive care is very high with that. Almost it is as high as uh, uh, 5 to 30 percent, even in some of the centers is 50 percent. 
So resuscitation is a proactive, and most of the time you all manage the septic shock. But what is lacking in an emergency department and intensive care is you are time sensitive. Time sensitive is the thing we need to be very, very uh, careful to, because once if you take care of a uh, time oriented thing, that will help you to managing these things. Okay. Uh, so proactive time sensitive manner management is in one of the most important thing. We don't uh, give an, enough uh, things to act early. That's what which is required in the clinical practice. So golden hour, because once our delay in managing septic shock, almost it will increase the mortality as high as 40%. That is why managing the things is very important. Quickly, let's go through the, this is a boy, 12 year old boy presented with a trauma five days back, increased swelling and redness in the lower limb past one day and child as in a tachypnea also. What's your uh, thoughts at this stage? So most probably you are dealing with in a septicemic shock. So on clinical examination, this child had in a febrile, tachypnea, tachycardia, prolonged capillary refill time, blood pressure for in a, this age of 70 by 50, it is in a, just corresponds to that of a 50. 50th centile, look at the pulse pressure which is a narrow, it is around 20 and apparent swelling and hyperemia that indicate that this is a child which is having an infection, systemic inflammatory response that is tachycardia, tachypnea, hypothermia and with an hypotension it is a case of an hypotensive shock. So what else we need to see in this type of a patient is basically we need to look at the blood pressure, blood pressure is a very very important thing. In the early stage of a septic shock, it will be in a wide pulse pressure. In the late stage of a septic shock, it will be in a narrow pulse pressure. So we need to increase, use in a fluid and inotropes in that. The, and also there is a significant acidosis. That's why tachypnea is in one of the important things here. This is all because of your secondary trauma, mainly because of a gram-positive organism is the most likely cause in this child. The moment we talk about a fluid, what is really changed in a survival sepsis guidelines of 2021 is, so there is no confusion regarding the crystallites and collide. It is always in a crystallite fluid is then a fluid of choice in a case of any septicemic shock. The moment we talk about crystallite, there are three things which comes to the mind. One is a normal saline, ringer lactate and balanced fluid. Among three, two is freely available in all the hospitals that is normal saline and ringer lactate. I will come to the balanced fluid later. So one of the things we need to remember, when you talk about a normal saline, sodium content of normal saline is 154, chloride is 154, whereas linger lactate, it is a 130 and 109. That is relatively linger lactate, which is less chloride, that is 109. So if you give in too much of a normal saline, it is likely to land up with an hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. That's why we need to be very, very careful when you are giving a normal saline thing. If the no other fluid is available, normal saline is the fluid of choice. If the balanced fluid is available, balanced fluid is the fluid of choice for the resuscitation. Reason is balanced fluid is almost like a plasma concentration that it contains a sodium of a 140, chloride of a 98. So that's equal to that of a plasma. That's why balanced fluid is the thing which needs to be adopted in the clinical practice in the coming days. It is not really available at present, but as the days advances, it is going to be there. So this is the one of the big, major change which is there in a survival sepsis guideline. This is where we need to change from normal saline and ringer lactate to that of a balanced plane. That's the point I wanted to drive here. And of course, colloids, there is no role for a colloids in the clinical practice unless dengue with a refractory, that's the time where we think about albumin and then other you know, colloid things. Otherwise, in generally, we don't use a colloids in any emergency. What about antibiotics? The moment we talk about antibiotic, it needs to be given within a one hour. That's the important change which has been there in a survival sepsis guideline. If you further delay, it is likely to have a, in case of suspected sepsis, that's the time you can give it up to three hours. Whereas in a shark, we need to give within in a one hour. So the antibiotic of choice, it all depends upon the clinical context. We need to look at the what the bug you are expecting, depending upon that we need to choose. In generally, ampicillin and gentamicin or septriaxone, third generation cephalosporin is good enough. Suppose if you are thinking about in a staphylococcal infection, especially MRSK, that's the time where you think about vancomycin is the drug along with septriaxone. Who are the patients who are likely to have any risk? If the more patients coming to your ICU with MRSK, that's the crime. You go up front with a vancomycin. 
if there is a history of a trauma followed by cellulitis in index case, that's the time where we need to sometimes supplement and day care center. That is the situation where we need to think about MRSA, we need to go upfront with the vancomycin. Pseudomonas, especially in immunocompromised and an hospital acquired infection, that's the time where we can think about. So these are the terminologies of warm shock and cold shock. Previously, we used to talk about survival sepsis guidelines of 2021 clearly says there is no need. The terminologies has been removed in the survival sepsis guidelines of 2020. So there is no more they are using it. Inotropes, previously we used to think about dopamine as the inotrope of child. Survival sepsis guidelines of 2020, even the lot of literature across except in a newborn period. So it is an epinephrine is the epitrope, uh, inotrope of child. We need to give in a 0.1 microgram per kg. You can titrate accordingly. So coming to the, uh, this inotropes, when do we choose an inotropes? The fluid, amount of fluid you are going to give it around 40 to 60. We knew, previously used to say uh, liberalized fluid policy. This is what the, we need to reassess and monitor depending upon that we need to choose an uh, thing. But when you are giving in a second bolus, that's the time where you be ready with me, especially in a septicemic shock, starting with adrenaline or not adrenaline depending upon things. If that adrenaline or adrenaline is not available, that is the situation where you think about dopamine. Otherwise, in generally, we don't use the dopamine. For last 10 years in our ICU, we don't use that. Why dopamine is not prepared? It is likely to associate it with tachycardia, increased pulmonary shunting, and also immunosuppression. These are the things why the long term of a things which is not been used. These are the drug dosages of an, uh, do, dobutamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, milrinone in the clinical practice. So basically when you talk about in a, uh, uh, say you are a do, uh, thing sub which is like norepinephrine which is likely to cause a reflex bradycardia, peripheral vasoconstriction is likely to be increased. Whereas in a case of epinephrine, so it is not only the uh, blood pressure, your heart rate is likely to be increased, but you, you need to use it in a right manner and right dose. So it is a dose dependent thing. What about role of ionodilator, especially in a survival and sepsis guidelines, whenever there is in a clinical use in a children with septic shock evidence persistent of hypoperfusion, that's the time where you can think about if there is a cardiac dysfunction, after achieving the blood pressure of normalization, that's the time where you can think about an uh, ionodilator. This child which has been still in an hypotensive cold peripheries, so the received then fluid boluses of 60 ml with an uh, epinephrine, and still there is a metabolic acidosis. After this, what will be your next further action in this type of a patient? You think about it is a catecholamine because epinephrine is used, norepinephrine is, it is a catecholamine resistant shock. Now you need to intubate this child, Ventral arterial line needs to be things and intensive monitoring of an advanced intensive monitoring is the thing which is required. So just to summarize, in the five minutes it is a recognition and fluid boluses is the thing and uh, within a 15 to 30 minutes you need to give an antibiotic and inotropes needs to be started and after that if the patient is a fluid sensitive you can shift and you can monitor the thing if it is a fluid refractory you look at the fluid loss what is happening and look at the pulse pressure look into the fluid overload status like epidemically and uh, uh, pulmonary edema if the this is what in this chart there was in a fluid overload and this is the patient where fluid refractory, where we need to access the central line, then we need to look for the mixed venous oxygen saturation. That requires a level 3 intensive care unit. You may not be able to manage at that because we need to give in a hydrocortisone and we need to think about a vasopressin as a thing need to be. Other treatment, apart from that source control and blood glucose control, these things need to be looked in. Mechanical ventilation is another thing. Platelet transfusion only if it is a thinking about invasive procedure, otherwise it is not. ECMO is in a one thing where if the patient is refractory, that's the time ECMO is an advocated in a septicemic shock. So cardiogenic shock, to worry about cardiogenic shock, especially milrinone and dopamine is the first inotrope of a child. If the patient is maintaining a blood pressure, if the patient is not maintaining the blood pressure with hypotension, epinephrine is your uh, inotrope of a child in that. So this is what the study is, which is clearly, there is no difference between the dobutamine and milrinone. You can use whatever it is available. Only thing it is, and milrinone is the phosphodiesterase inhibitor, likely to be associated with hypotension and thrombocytinemia. You need to be watchful on that. Obstructive shock, when the patient not responding to your fluid, that's the time where you think about pneumothorax, bricardial effusion, pleural effusion, 
that is likely we need to relieve that apart from fluid resuscitation. So, pericardiosynthesis, thoracotomy, these things, I will just take another 30 seconds, I will finish it up. Distributive shock is another thing where we have almost uh, uh, septicemic shock is the one thing, that is a uh, thing. So, in case of anaphylaxis, epinephrine is the drug of choice, we need to give that. And take home message is early recognition and fluid therapy, which needs to be given with a uh, reassessment. And when the moment you are giving a second fluid boluses, that is the time where you consider your inotropes. Reassess after each fluid administration or each intervention. This is what we do not do it in the clinical practice. We need to uh, emphasize on that. And categorization and start the specific vasoactive agent, it all depends upon the type of a shock which determines the thing. Supportive therapy is the most crucial thing in a patient with a shock. With this, once again, I thank the PATS and TCB branch for giving me opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. One word you said is recognition, early recognition. Once you recognize, you can feed. Now, in Hyderabad, are so many pediatric hospitals are there. They are depending on the DMO, due to medical officers. Late night, they will admit. Once they recognize every case, consultant cannot come and see uh, till morning. Only doctors, duty doctors and uh, junior doctors. Recognition, recognition is very important. If you have any suspicion, call the consultant. But don't uh, uh, diagnose, then patient will be serious and it will be bad to them. So it is a good word. One word is recognition is very important. Then only you can save the child. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, so one, one question, like uh, 10 to 20 ml that is uh, previously said, but now I think it is only 10 ml per kg. What uh, the correction has to be started with and a normal saline remains. The crystalloids are the main content rather than the colloids, whatever, what we always uh, go ahead with. Yeah, if it is in a hypovolemic shock, you go with a 20 ml per kg of a fluid. If it is in a septicemic shock without hypotension, you give a 10 ml per kg is good enough. If the patient with a septicemic shock with hypotension, go with a 20 ml, but monitor for the fluid overload like epitomegaly, tachycardia, pulmonary. You are absolutely right. Thank you, thank sir. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Uh, thank you Dr. Basara, sir, and Manchkundar Angai, sir, and Suchitra, sir. Please take your uh, uh, mementos here. Uh, the next session is clinical dilemmas, treat or refer the panel discussion by the moderator, Dr. C. Aparna. I request uh, the moderator to come to the dais and I request the panelists also, Dr. Aravinda, Dr. Bhanudeep, Dr. Sudeep Parma, Dr. Narendra Kumar Tota and Nanda Kishore. Thank you uh, very much. At the onset, on behalf of uh, Team Kim Scuddles, my heartiest um, acknowledgement and gratitude to the organizers of the Central Zone Pericon um, for giving us this wonderful opportunity. And here we are going to discuss a very important uh, clinical dilemma that we all face day in and day out. And to demystify this very complex sort of um, uh, question, we have some very eminent panelists to do this job for us, and I'm really, really indeed uh, pleased to introduce them. Uh, uh, we, we all know Dr. Nanda Kishore, and he needs no introduction. Pediatric intensivist, senior consultant pediatric intensivist, and ECMO specialist, lead consultant at Kim's Hospital, Second Rabad, and he was the first person to start ECMO in the uh, Telugu states. Uh, we also have Dr. Tota Narendra Kumar, consultant, adult and pediatric hemato-oncologist and uh, bone marrow transplant physician, head of the department of BMT at Kim's Hospital, Second Rabat. Dr. Sudeep Verma is our pediatric cardiologist, senior consultant pediatric cardiologist, MD pediatrics, FNB in pediatric cardiology. Dr. Banudeep is our young and dynamic pediatric neurologist, having done his MD and DM in pediatric neurology with a special interest in epilepsy and autism. And Dr. Aravinda Lochani is young and vivacious neonatologist who has joined us today uh, with fellowship in uh, neonatology. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to start with a few interesting case scenarios. And uh, we're going to discuss what are the clinical dilemmas, how to approach, how to evaluate, when to treat, and when to refer in each of the situations. And uh, please be ready with your questions at the end of the panel. So case one, and I'm going to turn towards Dr. Banudeep for this. A one-month-old boy was brought with complaints of clusters of tonic seizures, five to 10 episodes every day. 
So Dr. Banudeep, how do you approach such a case in your clinical practice? So whenever uh, one see an infant with uh, seizures, one should uh, first start from the history. So as you know, one should ask about the birth history and followed by family history. And also uh, one should ask about the history of consanguineous marriage. And also the most important thing is, are there any history of intrauterine seizures, like in the form of increased uh, fetal movements uh, noticed by the mother most prominently. And uh, after history, one should rule out the sepsis or any history of hyponatremia or hypokalemia. In the index child, the birth history was normal and uh, there was no any consanguinity or intrauterine seizures. And also there was no, uh, no history of any, no sepsis markers were normal and also the, there was no hyponatremia or uh, hypocalcemia also. And uh, in the uh, index child, in view of uh, increased cluster of seizures, we have loaded with uh, phenytoin, valproate, levetiracetam, and uh, followed by even uh, clobosome also. And further, there was no response. And then uh, the child was referred to me. And uh, later. So um, a, a close look at history and uh, evaluation to rule out sepsis, electrolyte disturbances, and uh, neuroimaging wherever appropriate. Yeah. Um, so, genetic evaluation, where none of these initial investigations help us in getting a clue. So, what did the genetic evaluation show us in this case, Dr. Banu? So, in this index case, in view of normal birth history and normal MRA, we had done um, exome, and uh, it, it revealed SCN 8A gene, gene mutation, which is uh, uh, a sodium channelopathy, and then uh, he was referred to me. So, um, uh, then even after diagnosing also that infant had recurrent seizures and not responding to all the above medications and so uh, the next uh, what, what you should do next so then we have done the drug levels of all these aids uh, the drug levels of phenytoin and uh, valproate were normal and in 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 case of uh, like scn 8a or scn 2a genes one should uh, use high dose of phenytoin because normal dose uh, won't respond, and there is a uh, study showing that we, sh we must try high dose of uh, eptoin mostly. And uh, in this index case, we have uh, slowly increased the phenytoin dose of up to uh, like 12, 12 mg per kg per day. And the uh, corresponding drug levels were up to like 30 to 40 mg per liter. And uh, the normal drug levels were uh, 10 to 12 mg per liter. So after uh, Attaining the maximum dose of phenytoin, the child had responsive and uh, the child was actually seizure free. And at one year follow up, even the development also uh, was normal and uh, the child was seizure free. And we have the child is only on high dose phenytoin and clobosome. So, so basically, you know, to uh, summarize it, a genetic diagnosis actually help us, helped us in modulating the pharmacological management of epilepsy. So uh, can I ask you as a clinical tip to a practicing pediatrician, so when do you think a pediatrician should refer first episode of unprovoked seizures to a neurologist? So whenever one find uh, refractory seizures not responding to any uh, of the two AEDs, then they can refer to neurologist. And also if the uh, child had any global development delay along with uh, refractory seizures. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Banu. So moving on from Dr. Banudeep to the next speaker. I don't think the slides are moving. If someone could please help in. So because we need the slides for presenting the cases. OK. So the next case is Dr. Narendra Tota. So we have a 15-year-old uh, boy who met with a road traffic accident. He had a head injury with multiple bone fractures. And on examination, the GCS was compromised. It was 6 by 15. The child was unable to maintain airway and had to be intubated. The initial evaluation revealed intracranial bleed with multiple bone fractures. The rest of the evaluation, the counts and the renal function test were essentially normal. And on blood gas analysis, there was metabolic acidosis with elevated lactate, uh, secondary to the polytrauma. Now, when we did coagulation, we re realized that there is elevated prothrombin time. PT is 28.1 seconds with control of 14 seconds. INR is 2.58. APTT was essentially normal at 30.7 seconds. The child is posted for surgery. 
So what are your thoughts? What are the differential diagnosis and how would you approach this case? So uh, these uh, polytrauma cases, most often of the patients might be seeing these cases. So when you see a polytrauma cases, generally you might be expecting that uh, because of trauma, the infection might be first cause because of the, uh, due to the elevation of the ITP, PT and INR. Uh, due to coagulopathy, generally we expect the elevation of APTT also. But when you see isolated INR elevation, so first possibilities of differential should be uh, the trauma itself, trauma-induced coagulopathy. The second thing would be because of nutrition, because of vitamin K deficiencies. So as the patient had already uh, trauma, polytrauma, the soft tissue infection caused the subacute DAC or a DAC type of picture. And obviously because it's a trauma, you expect the liver injury to be one of the cause of the elevated PTINR. The third would be a clotting factor deficiency, probably factor 7, which is very rare because we don't see often in the routine practice. So these are the first differentials when we see a cause uh, case in a ICU. So the subsequent investigations which I have ordered is routine hemogram and along with that the ultrasound abdomen to rule out the liver injury and the coagulation profile to see whether the reports which were earlier are they are the same values or they are the abnormal values. So these are the reports which we have seen. And the procal was little uh, above the normal, which makes you suspicion of sepsis. So for that reason, what we did is, uh, next slide. How do, how do you manage the case? So first most important is managing a sepsis and DAC. Because it's a trauma patient, lot of soft tissue injury is there, lot of infection is there. So you need to manage these patients with aggressive antibiotics. Then manage the acidosis also, because acidosis also can cause the change in the coagulopathy parameters. So mainly focus on the infection, coagulation, I mean acidosis, then treat with the FAPs whether you see whether it be uh, easily correctable with the uh, blood products, then uh, repeat the coagulation profile. Most of the time it should get correct because of hydration and your management, acidosis should get corrected and other parameters should automatically get corrected. If these are not getting corrected, then your differential starts narrowing down. So after, after the, treating this patient with the FAPs, Still, the PTINR was still elevated, but APTT, the repeat value also normal. So this narrows down to only two possibilities. One is vitamin K deficiency or it is a factor deficiency. So we have ordered for the mixing studies. So in your own hospital, if you want to initially make a diagnosis of factor deficiency, the most simplest test is a mixing studies, which will differentiate you from the factor deficiency versus the antibody for the factor. So we are ordered for the mixing studies for this patient. And interestingly, this study has shown that the factor seven deficiency was the possibility. And this should be further managed with sending the exact factor levels, uh, okay. uh, factor seven. That will make you understand whether the severe variety or the mild variant. From there onwards, your treatment will change. And for this patient, there was an interesting observation during the uh, post-trauma management. During the trauma, there was clear-cut bleeding in the cranium, that is the uh, brain bleed there was there, uh, CT was evidence there, soft tissue bleed was there, but subsequently patient was not bleeding much. So that itself says that even though we have concluded that it's a factor seven deficiency, it is a mild disorder probably. But still, because you know, surgeons will never handle a case with these values. So they have asked for a referral. So for this patient, what I have said that very clearly plan, uh, plan of management was, Take up for surgery. If he is not bleeding on during surgery, also go ahead with the surgery. Keep uh, the backup for FFPs and activated factor seven because we don't have a factor seven concentrate in the market. We cannot treat with the factor seven concentrate. So ideally, you should have a FFP, which is very difficult to manage with FFP because factor seven half life is hardly four to six hours. So if you transfuse it, you have to transfuse at least six times or four times a day which is very difficult to manage these sort of patients because fluid overload is a big challenge. So most so we're running out thing, of time, uh, sir. So yeah. can you, what, what, would you, what would be your summary or your take So most message? important is first rule out infection, trauma-induced DAC, and if these are normal, then look for factor deficiency, which is even though very rare, look and focus for that and manage uh, very appropriately using an activated factor seven. That is the most so important rule out uh, trauma-related DAC, consumption coagulopathy, secondary to sepsis, liver failure. But yes. if you find a persistently deranged coagulogram, particularly if you have 
one of the components, like in this, in this case, prothrombin time being persistently elevated, then the rarer cases, ca causes come in, and uh, here, um, you know, we were able to figure in that this was factor seven deficiency, classically involving the extrinsic pathway. So thank you, Dr. Uh, Tota. We move on now to the next case, uh, and for which I'm going to call in our neonatologist, Dr. Araminda, over to you now. A 28-year-old primary mother walks into the hospital. She has GDM on insulin, and she has uh, PROM now for 24 hours. So prolonged pre-labor, pre preterm rupture of membranes. There is no abnormal antenatal Dopplers. She delivers a preterm male baby at uh, 30 weeks of gestational age with a birth weight of 1,000 grams. So the baby looks IUGR or small for gestational age. Cried immediately after birth. Apgar 6 and 8 did not need resuscitation. Antenatal steroids, we only could give one dose. So incomplete antenatal steroid coverage. So Aravinda, what are the complications you expect and how do you prepare your team and infrastructure, equipment for this delivery? So as you can see from this history, it's a very preterm, uh, very low birth weight baby born to a mother with incomplete steroid coverage. And mother is also having a pre-prom of uh, 24 hours. So what are the expected complications? Prematurity, respiratory distress syndrome and uh, hypoglycemia, risk of early onset sepsis is also there in this baby. And how will you prepare for the preterm delivery as per NRP equipment checklist? You have a preheated warmer 30 minutes before the delivery. So and can you only well tell us the additional equipment for the preterm baby? Yeah, yeah. Plastic wrap and cap hat for the preterm baby and preterm mass and uh, laryngoscopes of size 000 and uh, smaller ET tubes of 2.5 and 3 size. Right. So um, important things, anticipate RDS, anticipate asphyxia, anticipate hypothermia, hypoglycemia, feeding intolerance, IVH, and be ready with additional staff. Be ready with as many people who can help you in, in this sort of uh, uh, high-risk uh, case scenario that we have just seen. So you started the baby on CPAP for RVS. The baby is on a PEEP of 6 FAO to 25. You have started caffeine and empirical antibiotics. Uh, at 60 minutes, uh, this is a no-brainer. The baby's X-ray clearly is RBS, and we have given the first dose of surfactant at one and a half hours of life. The problem always begins from day two, day three, and on day two, the baby starts having recurrent apneas, prolonged CFT hypotension. So quickly, from now on, my panelists are only going to take 30 seconds per question because we are really running out of time. What are the possible reasons for deterioration in this baby? So and in other words, CPAP failure when? So worsening on day two of life, it could be either worsening of the sepsis, worsening of RDS, or opening of the patent ductus arteriosus. Um, these are the causes for worsening on the day two of life. What are the causes of C uh, CPAP failure? How do you define CPAP failure? On a PEEP of more than uh, seven, and uh, if the PAO2 is less than 60%, and PACO2 is more than 50%, and baby is requiring FAO2 of 0.5 to 0.6, then it indicates that it, it is going for CPAP failure and needs intubation and mechanical ventilation. So that's all about CPAP failure, rule out PDA, sepsis, air leaks, but more important things, also ensure appropriate humidification, prevent frequent dislodgement, displacement of the prongs, ensure that the interface is in place and there are no leaks in the circuit. Very often CPAP failure is due to inadequate CPAP delivery itself. Now, Aravinda, if I were to ask you, if you were the obstetrician, the, P the primary care pediatrician, which are the preterm babies that you would as well like to refer in utero to a high-risk center? So any baby less than 28 weeks, uh, it's better to refer to a tertiary care center. And with a history like this, with a antenatally pre-prom, is there risk of sepsis uh, is high in this baby, steroids uncovered, it's better to refer early. Antenatally itself, in utero transfer is the best method of transfer to a higher tertiary care center. So the best transfer is, is not our ambulance or somebody else's ambulance, it's actually the mother's own womb. So in utero transfer is the best thing you can do to prevent morbidity, to prevent mortality, and for neonatal neuroprotection. And there is ample evidence to show that babies below 32 weeks have the best outcomes if they are delivered in centers where there is immediate access to quaternary care. So moving on now from neonatology to pediatric intensive care. So uh, Dr. Nanda, two-year-old girl comes to us with high-grade fever for 10 days, no localizing signs or no localizing signs or symptoms. She is irritable, cranky. Investigations, uh, the pediatrician has got CBP and inflammatory markers. They are elevated. Pro-BNP is also highly elevated. So we have admitted her. We do an echo because this is prolonged fever. Echo shows significant coronary dilatation for of all the three vessels and COVID antibodies 
which is now in vogue, um, were significantly elevated. So what are those uh, diagnostic criteria for MISC, and does this fit into MISC? Yes, it does fit into MISC. Uh, but unfortunately, there's no confirmatory test for multisystem inflammatory syndrome. It's a clinical picture with backed up by a, uh, laboratory data. The reason is, it's very important is to diagnose, they can develop heart problems and which can have a permanent uh, sequelae. So we need to identify these children very earlier on. And this child, if you look at the criteria, it fits into all the criteria of uh, MIAC. Uh, there, though there was no non-purulent conjunctivitis, no lymphadenopathy was there, but there was fever was there and heart involvement was there. That's good enough to say it is MIAC or Kawasaki. Kawasaki. One of, yeah. Absolutely. So this, this was a case indeed of MISC, and uh, this is how we went, went about the treatment as classically described, and this is now uh, something that all of us have seen and heard in the recent times, IVIG followed by methyl prednisolone as well as high rose aspirin. But then we had a problem again. The fever, although subsided, the fever kept coming back again and again with irritability and investigation showed persistently raised inflammatory markers, and in ECHO, there was a uh, cause for worry, coronary dilatation had increased. Now, what is the next step? So this is a dilemma we had. So, I mean, we manage many children with Kawasaki or suspected multi-inflammatory system uh, syndrome, and we give IVAG, they respond very well. And sometimes you say, you give IVAG, if they respond that kind of a relief, that confirms the diagnosis, and it prevents the further cor coronary issues also. Uh, so far, I, so usually children, the moment you give IVIG, fever response within 24 to 48 hours, which was persistent even though you've given so many antibiotics and other things. So then what if it doesn't respond to IVIG? So which this child had and we had a dilemma, what to do? Then question is, is it something called resistant Kawasaki? Or is it, a, are we missing something else? Because child was start given IVIG and antibiotic and now child came with infection. Are you missing out some infection is there? Or is there some underlying rheumatological problem altogether? Diagnosis is different and probably responded to your steroids. Now it started coming down steroids. Child relapsed again. So what did we do in this child and how did she do subsequently? So because it's still the like heart involvement was there, coronary dilatation was increasing, child was irritable. It also fits into the something called resistant Kawasaki. Apparently I found out that up to 20% of the kids can have resistant Kawasaki. So I think one, so when we're giving IVIG, we need to think about that. What is their exit plan in case child doesn't respond to your IVIG? Because she'll give a second dose and again, a cost issues. And what if, if that doesn't work? And if you look at the literature, what they say is give her the second dose of IVIG, give and plus or minus steroids. Yes. So then parents ask, okay, already given IVIG once, you're going to give, put me, put through one more or two more lakhs. What if child doesn't respond? And main worry is heart coronaries are getting bigger. So what is the next option? So what we did was we give second dose of IVAG. That's what the literature says. Fewer intensity has come down, uh, but it's not subsided completely. And inflammatory markers were slightly better, but not normal yet. Uh, and coronary dilation was not getting better either. And she was already, steroids were already given in the first instance itself. So we gave IV agent uh, steroids. So we steroids being continued almost like, this was almost into uh, third week into the illness. Then we got in touch with the rheumatologist and looked at the literature. literature. What it uh, said was, you can give biological monoclonal antibodies, which be quite helpful in these situations. So we gave infliximab, and the uh, response was very good. Child became aparixal uh, by next day. And important thing I noticed was child became very friendly until that point. We thought just a two-year-old not liking hospital, but she became very friendly. So one of the things they say is Kawasaki children are very irritable, but that's only probably can diagnose when they get better. Uh, when we see in an OPD or in a hospital, probably you don't realize that they're how cranky. You could attribute just because they don't like the hospital and doctors. Right. So the, the basic uh, reason this case was discussed is that in 20% of cases with, of MISC, be prepared for uh, a lack of response or inadequate response with the first dose of IVIG, and you may have to be ready for a second dose of IVIG with or without steroids. And if that also doesn't work, then we are in for real clinical dilemmas here. We'll need discussion, we'll, need discuss, we'll involve the rheumatologist, and we'll probably have to take it forward with, um, you know, biologicals. So, um, that's Sudeep the... Has some comment to... I yeah. just want to make a comment. Because the coronaries are dilated from the beginning, first of all. 
the incomplete kawasaki picture will be there most in nowadays with mis in picture right. and both are autoimmune mis as well as kawasaki so once in ivigq there is no harm so there are two pathways for that if you tell literature directly with one ivig you can do infliximab or you can call ivig ivig steroid infliximab azathioprine so this is the way so there are so many lead coming now that showing if not respond with the one then markers are still very high directly you can go ahead with the autoimmune that monoclonal antibodies first rather than trying for ivig yeah. actually there is studies in japanese children looking at the predictors even with the first dose of ivig who are not going to respond so they looked at the mainly raised inflammatory markers and liver enzymes but that is not been validated in other ethnic groups but i think that's something we can probably in indian children will look at it and probably find it what are the those markers which tell us say, these children are not going to develop and not respond then so that we can be aggressive from the beginning itself and right. coronary so involvement it itself shows, coronary involvement in the first week itself shows it's a very high intensity in you need very so high early coronary involvement is a high risk mass marker because for usually, predicting the subset of babies who may not respond because to usually it happens in second week actually right. but if it happens in first week that itself shows you may have so, to use the second ivig so dr infection. sudeep we are coming to you anyway for your next case now uh, so we have this next this baby of um, uh, one of the twin delivered by emergency lscs non booked case birth weight of uh, 1.2 kg 32 weeks the baby didn't cry at birth and required uh, post pressure ventilation and was later intubated for respiratory distress now the baby had uh, initially had cyanosis we gave surfactant we were expecting cyanosis to get better but in fact cyanosis didn't improve so this is a preterm baby persistent cyanosis now how do you approach this is it pulmonary is it cardiac is it something else see there is one thing in preterm cyanosis and we have 30 to 40 seconds see, per preterm cyanosis main is rds if rdn is not responding as per your expectation you have to think of cardiac cause also or you try second surfactant but still not improved then you have to definitely think of the cardiac cause if it was non book case prematurity it's not improved because in most of that rds respond well to the surfactant so in that case your oxygen high oxygen if you give fio2 increase ip will be we still not improved there more chances of it's a cardiac second you take the x ray that is the one of the most important pathway in that take a proper x ray because rds and cardiac cause may be ruled out at that point with even simple thing like x ray also so clearly rds not responding to surfactant ventilation think of other reasons it could be still pph in a, in a small subset where it might respond to a higher concentration of oxygen now also be prepared for the relati relatively rarer causes of cyanosis like methemoglobinemia if you do not get a clue from anything else and as dr sudeep said a good x ray will generally give us important clinical information but you are in for a surprise when you have absolutely normal looking heart with a cyanotic heart disease like you commonly see in obstructive tapvc right now this was the x ray so what is your comment see this x ray shows mild cardiomegaly but in this not showing any signs of rds like what you expected with that type of clinical picture so we can classify it's a oligemia you can see there is no peripheral vasculature so once it's a oligemia with cyanosis whatever heart size is there you have to think of the duct dependent pulmonary circulation that where the role of first to suspect and then you refer or you call cardiologist for to rule out cardiac causes so when they referred to us we found out there is oligemia we did echo we found out there is a duct dependent pulmonary circulation in this so cyanosis with relative paucity of respiratory distress not responding to oxygen and x ray showing normal sized heart with pulmonary oligemia suspected this could be a duct dependent pulmonary circulation so what do you think as a pediatrician or as a neonatologist we should do immediately to stabilize this baby see sometimes in spite of the chest x ray showing white out there is no role of pg but first you stabilize with the rhinotro make bp try to go with the maximum fio to try to maintain it and if it's still not improved you can start pg only in two or three condition until unless there is a pulmonary venous obstruction there is no role for pg but otherwise when you saw x ray like that and you are unable to get the echo you can start prostaglandin and then you can refer so, so stabilize uh, oxygenate the baby adequately and in view of a suspicion of duct dependent heart disease even if dr sudeep is not available immediately to your side an empirical decision can be made to start prostaglandin and we all know the starting dose which is 0.05 to 0.1 0.1 mics per kg per minute now also always remember to look for the complications like apnea hypotension and uh, flushing 
And so this uh, baby's echo, in fact, uh, confirmed the diagnosis of pulmonary atresia with an intact VSV. So this was indeed duct-dependent pulmonary circulation. So now, Dr. Sudeep, that we know the diagnosis, what are the treatment options? See, now, first we already told you, if it's a duct-dependent circulation, first maintain volume, start prostaglandin. If try to intubate, intubate if it required apnea or using high doses. Because every time you have to start with the high doses and then come to the low doses for proper effect of the prostaglandin and then you have to refer for the immediate PDA stenting or in this case perforation. So we thought either there are two ways, if the valve is good, perforable, we can do the perforation by transcatheter route or we can do the PDA stenting by transcatheter So this was in general the picture you can see there is a perforation and the only the atretic valve was perforated, all atretic rest, all is the pathway is there. So we thought rather than doing PDA stenting, we'll do the more proper procedure of wall perforation. So that's what we did, 1.2 kg, preterm 32 weeks is the one of the smallest we did perforation and we were successfully able to do that. So, so we started… Do you know what saturations do you generally think uh, a definitive intervention is required in pulmonary atresia? In general, if less than 70, you have to start prostaglandin. If above okay. 70 to 75, you can still wait, keep prostaglandin aside, but there is no hurry worry to do. More than 80, definitely there is no need to start. You can still wait and watch, but you have to see for the other things, cardiac output, saturation, FiO2, but if baby is stable, term, preterm is stable, then up to 75 saturation you can accept. Only less than 70 you have to start prostaglandin. So right, so a very interesting case and as Dr. Sudeep uh, mentioned, the two venous channels were accessed for this case and they, uh, they were able to manage to improve the saturations in this baby to an acceptable uh, level. But not to forget that these babies are not treated and done forever, they need regular follow-up. And what do they need follow-up for? See, we need, once we perforate the wall, that RV may not grow. So if the PR will be there, the RV growth, you have to decide, otherwise they need multiple surgeries. So that's what the, is still not finished, you have to follow up for life. The second or third surgery may also need it depending on the RV growth and the pulmonary all regurgitation after the perforation. So this child is still on follow waiting for the third, sur second surgery actually. Right, an important uh, clinical tip here also is it's, it's very, very easy and simple whenever the venous axis is taken right in the NICU and uh, we have the benefit of an excellent cardiac anesthetist as well in our team, Dr. Nagraj sir, who makes his job very easy and, um, you know, that will reduce the ch chance of complications, hemorrhage, thrombosis, etc. And that actually gives the cardiologist a lot of relaxation so that he can go in and neatly perform the procedure. So do we have time for a few more cases? We can take questions if... Questions? Okay. So can we take any quick questions from the audience? Because all the experts are still here. Anyone and if there are none, the then I think I'll ask one, one, one quick question from all of them. So Dr. Banu, this is a six-year-old child with progressive difficulty in walking and frequent falls. So I'm just going to ask you 15 seconds. What are all the important markers in history? So whenever one find a child with frequent in walking and frequent falls and one should look for like uh, one should take history regarding cerebral palsy like spastic diaplegia or one or, or, or can be a kind of myopathy or mitral dystrophy also one should rule out initially but usually in, in such cases the most important history is history of uh, dystonia during uh, day daytime that might be even subtle also it, it might not be a frank dystonia and that might be frequently missed by local parents also so one should ask for the like whether these twisting postures they uh, they are uh, like disturbing that they might or evolving during the day and they are absent during the sleep. So that should be the most important issue that one should ask for uh, for the proper diagnosis. So this child was actually referred as a case of cerebral palsy. But when Dr. Banadeep closely took the history, there was history suggestive of dystonia in the form of twisting postures involving both the upper and lower, lower limbs. And there was also classical dynal variation. So where do we see this dynal variation in dystonia, Ban? So in, in this case, it's actually a case of dopa responsive dystonia. So usually in uh, DRD, you, we usually find due to the abnormality in the dopa metabolism, the enzyme that is called as uh, tetrahydro Biopterin, it, it, it has certain, certain uh, circadian uh, rhythms that will uh, get, that so get altered. So in dopa responsive dy dystonias, there will be a history of dynal variation of dystonias yes. and you will get a normal neuroimaging. So this child was tremendously benefited by the initiation of Syndopa uh, actually. Syndopa, we went up to 7 mg per kg per day and the child was actually, uh, the falls got frequently reduced and he was actually walking fine after one year of follow-up. 
So, um, if we are running out of time, yes. can I just ask my panelists to summarize by giving one important clinical tip or clinical message to the audience which they can carry home today? So, starting from, uh, starting from this side, from the left, Dr. Narendra Dutta. So, in my case, uh, we always think of only sepsis and trauma induced coagulopathy. Rarely we should remember in our mind that in especially kids, uh, the bleeding disorders uh, you should keep in, my, in your mind, especially they are very rare, uh, like factor 7 deficiency to the commonest things, factor 8 and von Willebrand is also you should keep in mind. So when something is not getting corrected with the FAP transfusion, you should definitely keep in your brain that you should further work up. And most important trauma cases, treat infection, correct the acidosis, then look for the other disorders, which is uh, even though rare, it can be seen in the practice. Yes, okay, just to get, uh, uh, straight away, so in a, if you're thinking of a MIST or MISC, which we're probably going to see again, this sort of uh, multisystem inflammatory syndrome with the COVID going up. So do always give IVIG when you suspect it, because what we want to do is prevent the coronary uh, dilatation aneurysms. But I also have an exit plan, what if uh, IVIG is not going to work? And try to identify if we can see by any means uh, those children who are at high risk of not going to respond so that you can be aggressively treated from beginning itself and refer them to cardiologists and rheumatology. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Dr. Banu. In case of actually uh, channelopathies, uh, one must try high dose phenytoin uh, because uh, even though they don't respond to multiple AIDs, they may respond to high dose phenytoin. And also, if one find uh, frequent falls, one must ask about the history of twisting postures of uh, upper limbs and lower limbs frequently lower limbs and uh, to diagnose DRD and manage accordingly. Dr. Sudeep. The cyanosis in term, whenever RDS not respond, think of obstructive TAPVC or pulmonary vein. In term, baby, when the RDS is not responding, you always collate both with the X-ray and your findings. Suppose X-ray is not collating with your RDS, think of the cardiac causes. In term, it's mostly if the RDS-like picture, it's a pulmonary venous obstructive dislike, TAPVC, quadriatridum. In preterm, if it's not improved, then you have to think of the duct-dependent circulation and correlate with X-ray. So X-ray with clinical picture will give a nice correlation of the duct-dependent or the pulmonary venous obstructive diseases. Dr. Arvinda? Yeah. So anticipate uh, before the delivery of the baby itself, assess the risk factors and uh, what are all the complications the baby will uh, most likely to develop, like prematurity, SGA, IUGR, risk of sepsis, pneumothorax, surfactant deficiency, need for ventilator requirement, and then only decide when to refer the baby, whether we can um, treat the baby or uh, early referral would be better. It should be decided both by the obstetrician as well as the neonatologist. So, and I think with, with a small bias of being a neonatologist primarily, I would end with, a, with a, a clinical tip that if you're dealing with an impending delivery of a baby less than 30 weeks, think of in utero transfer wherever possible. So with that, I thank all my panelists for um, doing the difficult and almost undoable job of compiling piles of knowledge into a limited time. And thank you, audience, for bearing with us and the organizers for giving us this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, for the next session, I ask Dr. Chakrapani and Dr. G. Ramesh to chair the session. Simultaneously, uh, I wanted to give an uh, thing. So 7 o'clock, there is an inaugural function. And then followed by, there will be a cultural night thunder. So all of you are invited for the, uh, this extravaganza. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, the practitioner quiz in the hall B, uh, Dr. P.S. Reddy Hall. N not in this room, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll just say. So, uh, the next presenter is Dr. Sri Nagesh. Yeah. And uh, uh, there are two cell phones. We got it in the washroom. This is POCO and some is a AI. It's here. If somebody has actually misplaced their cell phones, it's here. They can collect it from here. Uh, shall we start? Yeah, over to yeah. you. This, this is the slide changer. Eh? 
sir one minute i would like to introduce you and dr nagesh is a endocrinologist and uh, he did his md dm he is a he is a huge list to read and he is uh, practicing at uh, kukatpalli i think over to dr nagesh Thank you, sir, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee of uh, Central Zone Pedicon, especially both uh, Dr. Bhaskar and Dr. Sunkoja and Dr. Arkal Bhaskar for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this meeting today. And uh, for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to tell you a brief overview of what is new in the management of type 1 diabetes. Can we have the slides? Can I have the slides? So a lot of times, we have very common questions about diabetes. This is how it's going to be. Some of the failed innovations in the management of type 1 diabetes. What are the activities which have been recently done by Endocrine Society of India? Because you mostly listen to the activities of IAP. So for a change, I wanted to tell you about ESI activities. What are the newer insulins? What is the status of pancreas transplantation? And what is the device status? I'm not going to focus more on devices because devices are what has been told to you in the past few couple of decades. Devices have become, have taken center stage in the management of diabetes and there is a management of diabetes beyond devices. So does anybody among you know who this man is? He's not related to diabetes actually, he's Werner von Braun. He was the man who made all the rockets for Hitler, the V1 and V2 rockets. And it is Werner von Braun's rocket science, which is the basis for every space shuttle and every rocket we see in the world today. And diabetes history is pretty similar. The entire management of type 1 diabetes depends on what has been told to us by these four people in 1921. Actually, last year we celebrated the centenary of diabetes. After 1921, the treatment and the standard of treatment for diabetes has remained insulin. What has changed in diabetes has been the iterations of insulin. You started having lenti insulin, then you had ultra lenti, then you had bovine insulin, then you had recombinant, then you had analogs, you had long acting analogs, you had ultra long acting analogs. But insulin to insulin, one unit of bovine insulin is equivalent to one unit of ultra long acting insulin. The treatment of insulin has remained the same. In spite of the innovations, we've had a huge number of innovations in the past few years. The treatment for insulin has remained unchanged over the past century and it still remains only insulin. Maybe a decade ago, there was a huge amount of excitement, sometime around 2005. People started talking a lot about inhaled insulin. We had a new insulin called Exubera. I'm sure you must have heard of it. A lot of people were telling us that this was the solution for needle pricks. We would have no more needle pricks. No question of having a social situation where you did not have to take an insulin. You did not have any fear of hypoglycemia once you started using this. This insulin was very stable at room temperature because the commonest problem our patients have is transporting insulin. And this was actually hailed as a game changer. This was launched sometime in 2008. This is one of the most expensive failures in the history of pharmaceutical industry. It almost wiped out Pfizer. It was a $2.8 billion loss. And the reason was not hard to find. This is the device. Imagine going out with this kind of device and taking this in a social situation. Nobody would like to use this kind of insulin. Five years down the line, people came up with this device. This was called Afresa. This was from Sanofi. A device which was as small as a whistle. This, they thought, would change the face of insulin treatment. This was the outcome. You had 5 million euros in nine months. The amount of money spent on developing this device was 2 billion euros. This almost wiped out Sanofi. The reason was again, because insulin is a growth factor. And you take it in the lung route, it causes a significant amount of bronchospasm, a lot of decline in pulmonary function, and because this is a growth factor, it causes an increase in lung cancer. And importantly, inhaled insulins cannot be taken as a bolus. They, can, they cannot be taken as in, in a basal route. They can only be given as a bolus. These insulins were also quite expensive. And many people did not really see the need or the requirement for this kind of insulin because insulin delivery devices became better and better. Pens were smaller. 
pens were much more discreet. They were no longer the large bulky pens you were seeing earlier in the management of diabetes. People became better at injecting them once you started having ultra long acting insulins. Many of our patients, actually many of our school children started skipping the afternoon dose of insulin. With the ultra short acting insulin, we reached a situation where they would take their night dose of ultra long acting insulin, take their morning dose, skip the afternoon dose, come back to school in the evening, take the tea time dose and take a bedtime dose. This created a situation where you didn't really need to take an insulin in a social situation. And that ended this saga of inhaled insulins. Around a couple of years ago, when we started looking at type 1 diabetes, Endocrine Society of India, we wanted to actually have a dialogue with the stakeholders. Because I'm an executive committee member of ESI. We wanted to engage with the stakeholders and because webinars had become pretty common. We started programs around 6th March 2021. Slowly, we started talking to the WhatsApp support groups of type 1 diabetes, parents of children with type 1 diabetes, the societies of type 1 diabetes people, the educators, and also a lot of uh, public bodies which were engaged in the work with type 1 diabetes, and even a couple of uh, political figures who were involved in the management of type 1 diabetes, and all of them were involved in this. This is still an ongoing program. We have a program at least once a month. A lot of times we have it on public demand. We have it at least twice a month. If you have the time, please do log in because these are very informative programs. And at the end of one year of these programs, we finally managed to collect some kind of some amount of data. This was one, a, there were a couple of programs where even I was a member, where we involved a lot of stakeholders, people and teachers with uh, teachers of children with type 1 diabetes. And these were a lot of questions we got from the parents. These were perhaps the crux of the management of type 1 diabetes, and these are the areas which we need to address. Will we get longer acting insulins? At this point of time, the longest approved insulin for the management of diabetes is Deglutec, which is a true ultra-long acting insulin, which has a steady state duration of action of 25 hours. But now, once weekly insulins and Perhaps in the long run, once monthly basal insulins are in the pipeline. The first question people asked us was, are we going to get longer acting insulins? The second question, and I'm sure this question has been asked to all of you many times in your OPs, will stem cell transplantation become a reality? There are many organizations which are actually recommending stem cell transplantations. There are commercial entities which are doing stem cell transplantations for children in India today. But let me make it very clear, none of them are officially sanctioned. They are not validated, none of them have been proven, and for all practical purposes, you can consider all those bodies which are offering you stem cell transplantation commercially as quacks. It has not been validated anywhere in the world till now at this point of time. There is only one reported case, I'll be talking about it later. Will we get oral insulins? This is a huge area of development in the pipeline and we've got one commercial success recently. Can we improve monitoring? I think this is one area where we've had the maximum amount of thrust in the past 10 years with the huge number of startups which have invested money in this area of management of diabetes. And of course, the biggest question of them all, can we cure diabetes? Coming to the first one, we have a new insulin called Icodec, which is a further uh, subsequent greater analog of Degludec. We have had two trials with Icodec, onwards one, which was in type 2 diabetes, and onwards six, which was a basal bolus treatment in adults with type 1 diabetes. Mind you, this is a study which has been done only in adults. Because the regulatory guidelines are you first start them in adults, then you take it to the 11 to 8, 12 to 18 year old age group, then it is 5 to 12, 2 to 5, 1 to 5, infants, pregnant women. That is the order of progression of any clinical trial. And, at the, and right now, this a small phase 3A trial has been done in adults with type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes. This was a 52-week efficacy and safety trial, which was a non-inferiority trial, because generally, whenever we do any trial in any kind of insulin, we have to prove that it is non-inferior to any established insulin. And they actually proved that this Icodec was non-inferior to the established current standard of care, Degludec, the best insulin we have right now. It was non-inferior in reduction of HbA1c, which is the gold standard for us as far as we are concerned, endocrinologists in the management of diabetes at 26 weeks. HbA1c reduction was 0.47% with Icodec as compared to 0.51% with Degludec. 
which is considered pretty significant. But mind you, you had slightly higher rates of hypoglycemia. The problem with long-acting insulin is insulin is a molecule with first-order pharmacokinetics. The greater the dose of insulin, the longer is the duration of hypoglycemia. And with this kind of insulin, you had statistically more hypoglycemic events. You had 19.3 hypo, hypoglycemic events with once weekly insulin as opposed to 10.3 hypoglycemic events with once daily insulin. And this has been reported even in the type 2 diabetes studies and this right now is the biggest problem with this kind of insulin. Even when Degludec was introduced in the market, ultra long acting insulin was introduced in the market, you had more of daytime insulin, daytime hypoglycemia. Slowly we started learning to adjust the doses so that people did not have nighttime hypoglycemia. A same kind of uh, adjustment is going to happen with this kind of Icodec also. As you do more and more trials, slowly we are going to reach a stage where we start adjusting the hypoglycemias and we reach a steady state where we get an understanding between the hypoglycemia as well as the efficacy of this molecule. And in all probability, this molecule is going to come into wide clinical use in the next three to four years. So you'll reach a situation maybe by 2025 where you'll probably have to give only two or three doses of insulin for your type 1 diabetes patients and give them their dose of basal insulin only on a Sunday, which will be very useful for a lot of children with type 1 diabetes. The big question, which is pancreatic transplantation. What you're seeing is a confocal microscope picture of the beta cell of a child with type 1 diabetes. The green ones you see are the beta cell. This is what happens in a child with type 1 diabetes. You have complete beta cell destruction. You can see that there are very few beta cells. For many years, we've had a huge number of experimentations about stem cell transplantation. Just a month ago, the first successful stem cell transplant case was published. This was done by Harvard in conjunction with a commercial research company. This was VX880, which was a stem cell derived differentiated pancreatic islet replacement therapy for people with type 1 diabetes. This was again done in somebody who was an adult, not in a child. Basically, this is a two-step therapy where you give one infusion at day one and you give the second infusion at day 180. The index patient in this case actually did not need a second infusion. The first infusion, which was half dose itself, was enough in this patient. And along with that, you also give them immunosuppressive therapy because there is every risk of this islet therapy being rejected. Basically, what was found was, unlike the earlier cases, this case is very important because you had a successful engraftment, you had improvement in fasting and simulated C-peptides, reduction in the HbA1c, decrease in exogenous insulin requirement, as you'll see in the next slide, almost to zero, and it was very well tolerated. You had required very little immunosuppressive therapy. You can see that initially before therapy, the fasting C-peptide was undetectable, came down to 280. HbA1c came down to almost normal, and insulin dose came down from 34 to 2.9, which is almost zero. Coming to the next step, many people ask us this question, why don't we give people oral insulin? The problem with giving oral insulin is it's a large peptide, and peptides are digested in the stomach. You have bile in the intestine, you have acid in the stomach, you have tight junctions which prevent the passage of these peptides. You have a lot of intestinal microbi microbes which digest your peptides, and you have a lot of microbiota drug interactions which prevent a successful delivery of peptides. The only peptide which has been successfully delivered till now by an oral route is vasopressin tablet. Nothing else has been delivered successfully. That is the reason why we started having newer approaches. We've had approaches of ionic liquid. We've got a particle formation. We've even started having intestinal patches where you swallow it that gets stuck onto your intestine and slowly releases the insulin molecule. You've got an intestinal microneedle. I'll show you slightly more about this later on. In fact, one molecule, semaglutide, this is actually not insulin. This is a GLP-1 receptor agonist. All these years, GLP-1 receptor agonists were given only as tablets. For the first time, semaglutide is the first commercially available GLP-1 agonist which is given as a tablet. It is given both as an injection and as a tablet. It's now commercially available and widely used by all of us. And it is assumed that in the next five to 10 years, this technology is also going to be translated to the use of diabetes. It is considered perhaps the most significant breakthrough in the management of diabetes in the last decade. This is perhaps the best method of management of delivery of oral peptides in the management of diabetes and in endocrine care in the past one year.
5 to 6 years. And we have something known as intestinal needle, which is derived from the turtle, the Galapagos turtle, which is called self-orating millimeter scale applicator. The concept is you give them an oral insulin with a needle in situ. It goes into your stomach. It has a needle which the needle injects itself into your stomach epithelium and it slowly releases insulin over a period of time. This is also being explored as a new method of giving an injectable oral insulin directly into the stomach. This perhaps will take a decade in development. These are the two best approaches now for delivery of oral insulin. As far as monitoring devices are concerned, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Freestyle Libre. We've got a new device called Eversen C3. It is approved for 90-day CGM monitoring in U US and 180 days in UK. It has a sensor which can be applied by any healthcare professional, ideally a doctor. It has a transmitter which has to be worn over a sensor. And right now it has a mobile application, Android or uh, iOS, which will give you your values every five minutes for a period of 180 days. This is in wide use in US and in UK. It's probably not yet come to India, but it's considered to be fairly cheap. It costs you only around 100 euros for a period of 180 days. The next one, I'm sure you are all familiar with this, Freestyle Libre Pro for doctors and Freestyle Libre for the patients. The most recent advance in the management of diabetes wearables and monitoring devices is a ketone monitor. This has not found a lot of application in India, but in the West, where they're more interested in preventing DK episodes. Just like a CGM monitor, you also have a ketone monitor, which monitors your ketone levels between the zero to eight millimeter range just like a Freestyle Libre monitor, it monitors your ketones for 14 days. And any at any point of time, if your ketone levels cross 8 millimoles, it gives you an alarm. Then you have this device called Medivice, which is a non-invasive method of monitoring your blood glucose by means of radio waves. This has not really taken off, only widely used in UK. Not a very accurate device. You've got NovioSense, where you've got a glucose monitor, which is which needs to be inserted into your lower eyelid, which monitors your blood glucose for 14 days, just like you insert a contact lens. Very soon, this might be widely applicable in the US. And then you had the Google contact lens. 2014, it was hailed as the next best thing in the monitoring of blood glucose, but unfortunately, it was a failure. You also have a graphene patch, which is still in development, which will perhaps monitor your blood glucose levels from a graphene patch inserted over the skin. This is again in development. And then we have the concept of smart insulins, which has been in development for almost 20 years, where an insulin is injected into your skin. Every time your blood glucose levels go up, the polymer opens, the insulin is injected out into your circulation. Once the blood glucose levels come down, the polymer closes. Your blood glucose levels remain stable. The next time your blood glucose levels increase again, the polymers open. This has been in development with boron, with a lot of other uh, polymers, but unfortunately, these are very toxic polymers, and that is the reason why this technology has not really taken off. The last slide, the big question about diabetes, can we cure insulin? Right now, the answer is no. We've had a huge number of uh, therapies. We had the Brazil experiment where we started using anti-thymocyte globulin. We finally realized that the treatment was worse than the disease itself. Then people have started with other immunotherapy. We even looked at gene modification. We've identified the basic genes on the histocompatibility complex which contribute to type 1 diabetes. But this is still in evolution. We've looked at encapsulation devices in momentum for the management of diabetes. That is still under technical uh, development in a lot, by a lot of companies in the US. But it is difficult to do, it is expensive, and it needs a lot of regulatory controls, which is not very possible. The average treatment with any of these devices costs approximately $1 million per person. So it's not widely feasible and it's not supported by insurance. Artificial pancreas is already in development. Glucagon pancreas, glucagon insulin devices have been in evolution since 2016. There are a lot of firms which use fuzzy logic. These devices were supposed to come into production sometime around 2021, but because of a few cases of sudden deaths, probably because of hypoglycemia and failure of the glucagon portion of the pump. These have been set back by a couple of years, probably again by around 2025. We might have artificial pancreas and closed loop systems in circulation. Right now, these are the closest answers we have to the question, can we cure insulin? That's it. That's the end of my presentation.
And if there are any questions, I'd like to take them. Any questions from audience? Sir Nagesh, sir, as of now, what, uh, what is the uh, best treatment to treat type 1 diabetes? Insulin, sir. Insulin. That's all. That is the take-home message. Okay. Thank you. Bottom line Thank is you. it's still insulin. Yes. Depends on the device, actually. You are talking, device-wise, if you are talking of freestyle, freestyle has a problem. Because my data, my experience is extrapolated both from type 2 as well as type 1. If you've got a chronic kidney disease, freestyle is not reliable. If you've got a hypoglycemia, you will have to corro corroborate freestyle with your glucometer. In all other situations, you can use a freestyle, but you cannot replace it with, you, you cannot replace your glucometer with freestyle. Because the major concern for people with type 1 diabetes is hypoglycemia. So you can use it to monitor your blood glucose levels, you can use it to adjust your insulin doses, but you cannot totally replace your uh, CGM. It advantages it doesn't require calibration, disadvantages you need to replace it every 14 days. It's not very expensive, but it's not very cheap either. If you get something like Eversense with validation for 180 days, it will make it very cheap and Eversense is very accurate. Its error is in the single digits. Freestyle error is to the tune of 14% in hypoglycemia. Thank, thank you, Srinagesh. Move on to the next session, which is a panel discussion. Invite on stage the team from Ankura Hospital, Dr. Srinivas Jaka, Dr. Anjani, Dr. Shweta, Dr. Srikant, Dr. Kirti, Dr. Sujit, and Dr. Parijat. I hand it over to the moderator, Dr. Srinivas Jaka. Uh, while the panelists come on stage, announcing IAP Central Zone Practitioner's Quiz, a wonderful chance for you to literally earn a much awaited uh, event. It will happen in Hall B. So all the practitioners who are here and who are keen to participate in the practitioner's quiz, just go down to Hall B. We'll have the quiz in Hall B. Eligibility, you just need to be registered delegate and should have finished post-graduation. That's all that's needed. Please come down to Hall B. Uh, yeah, it starts at 5.30 sharp. So I request you to please come down. Please attend this session and then come down. We'll start after this session. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Srinivas. OK, uh, good evening, friends. Uh, this is the last session, and I'm sure you must be all tired, physically and mentally as well. So we'll try to keep you uh, awake and entertained as much as possible and interested as well. So basically, as pediatricians, we all see children with recurrent fevers, isn't it? So when you see children with recurrent fevers, you have the questions, are there simple viral infections occurring one after the other? Am I missing any serious systemic disorder? Could it be a malignancy? Could it be a rheumatological problem? So to answer all your questions, we have a team of very young and dynamic pediatric subspecialists whose average age is less than 40. And, uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, they are very experienced and very talented in their respective fields. So uh, without much ado, I'm going to start the session. Okay, so we got Dr. Sujit, uh, our pediatric intensivist, uh, Dr. Parijat, our pediatric gastro, Dr. Anjani, our pediatric immunologist and rheumatologist today, Dr. Shweta, our pediatric nephrologist, Dr. Kirti, a pediatric neurologist, and Dr. Srikanth, our pediatric hemoncology. And I'm Dr. Srinivas Jekka, I'm a consultant in pediatric pulmonology, allergy, and uh, general pediatrics. Okay, we are not going to definitions now. Okay, we'll start with Dr. Sujit's case. Uh, I had a 23-month or nearly two-year-old male child. He had a high-grade fever for 20 days or so, and he was not bearing weight. And gradually, there was a decrease in the movement in the right leg for the last five days or so. And uh, there is a pain in the right hip and thigh associated with swelling as well. On examination, there is a swelling present in the, until the middle of the right thigh. There was some tenderness and decreased range of movements as well. So Dr. Sujit, uh, with this case, with this history and findings, what are your thoughts and how did you investigate this patient? Uh, sir, uh, considering uh, this child, this child essentially presented to us with uh, prolonged fever and had some uh, bone symptoms. 
considering she had bone pain. So I, my uh, thinking uh, thought process would be like uh, it would be a child with fe uh, fever with monoarthritis and we would be approaching in that line. So we'd be considering possibilities such as septic arthritis in case of infections, uh, whereas, uh, in ca whereas in case of uh, infiltrative and inflammatory disorders, we'd be considering things like leukemia or SOGIA. So at this point, it would be a very broad differential encompassing all these things, sir. Uh, and uh, coming to investigations of this child, so essentially we would first, when the child presented to us uh, in the ER, we would do an ABC assessment and uh, conclude that the child is hemodynamically stable and then uh, we would, uh, uh, while putting a cannula, we would take all the cultures and necessary investigations such as CBP, CRP, LFTs, etc. Uh, and start the child on broad spectrum antibiotics and get an ultrasound of the hip uh, and ultrasound of the abdomen also. Okay, so the break is take on point is any child with fever, with joint pain and swelling, we always need to rule out septic arthritis because that will destroy the joint unless we treat. So we did all of this in this child. You, you did a cultures which were negative. You also looked at cyanuronal fluid that was also negative as well. And uh, so as you mentioned, your differential work, is it an atypical infection or non-infective cause as well? So on that lines, we did further workup. And Dr. Sujit, please mention what your workup was. Uh, so considering that uh, we had already started this child on broad spectrum antibiotics, if it was infective or septic in origin, we would have expected some response. Whereas this child, after even after 72 hours of antibiotics, wasn't showing much response uh, with respect to fever and other symptoms. So we worked up for atypical infections and non-infective causes, and which as shown, initially we worked up for tuberculosis, which is quite rampant in our country, uh, which was, uh, workup was negative for it, bone marrow was normal, HIV was normal, and then uh, brucella uh, serology, which we sent, came back positive, and this was actually a, a kind of, uh, took us by surprise. We sent it as part of the workup, but we weren't expecting this. So when we went back and probed history uh, further, uh, asked the father whether there was any uh, history of uh, raw milk consumption, then the father started saying that this child had, uh, had an illness of fever around three months ago, and uh, be, uh, because the child was unwell, they bought uh, a domestic cow and started feeding the child with raw milk. Actually, this child had a positive history with respect to that. Yeah. So there is, retrospectively, we got the history that father was giving the child raw cow's milk. And we did a prolonged culture, and that culture grew brucella as well, and the child responded very well for the medication. Uh, so Dr. Sujit, uh, can you briefly tell us the infectious cause of recurrent fever in children? Uh, sir, uh, uh, I mean, going to the most common thing, it, will be, it would be uh, recurrent viral infections that would be uh, presenting to us, sir, where child gets better in between, where growing well in between. So, but going to all the causes, uh, as a list of bacterial, we would be looking at causes such as infective endocarditis, which we have to uh, look for specifically, dental abscesses, which we'll have to look for specifically, and other uh, causes such as tuberculosis, which we tend to see quite commonly, and brucellosis and relapsing fever, uh, which are uh, known causes of recurrent fever, but uh, we don't see them so often. And then viral infections such as EBV can present with prolonged fevers, and parasitic infections quite rampant again, uh, such as malaria. Excellent. Uh, so this is the common infections which cause recurrent fevers in children. And moving on to uh, Dr. Kirti. Okay, Dr. Kirti, would you like to tell us about your patient? Yes, so uh, this was a story of a four and a half month old boy who presented first with history of fever and along with that a very brief generalized seizure that lasted for only three minutes. Immediately after the seizure, the child became all right. There was not prolonged postictal drowsiness, and it was treated as a simple febrile seizure. And the investigations at that time also showed mildly raised inflammatory markers, mildly raised ESR, CRP counts were fine, and the child became afebrile within two days. And so child was discharged by day three. However, after going home from day five to day 20, the parents noticed that the fevers were recurring every four to five days, on and off, they were taking some oral antibiotics. Uh, transiently, the fever was disappearing only to reappear again. But by day 21, the fever localized. And the child developed right focal seizure. We can have a video of this. Uh, so permission has been taken for sharing this video of the patient. So we can see there is right facial twitching and uh, right lip twitching. 
And uh, along with that, the child seems to be aware there is uh, no clonic movements elsewhere of the body. So what it indicated, the seizure semiology indicated that there could be an irritative focus in the left hemisphere. A very focal uh, lesion may be there in the left hemisphere. That's why we straight away went ahead and did CT brain with contrast, which showed a hypodense lesion in the left frontotemporoparietal region with contrast enhancement. It was big enough to cause mass effect and midline shift. So the radiological uh, diagnosis was that of a subdural empyema. And immediately, because the sutures were open, and because of that mass, the sutures were widened. We went ahead and put in a, uh, this one butterfly needle through the widened corona suture and tried to aspirate the pus. But it was a very thick pus, and only four to five cc of the pus could be drained. And uh, after draining four or five cc, we could find some blood clot coming. That's why we aborted the procedure, repeated the CT, and saw that there was a hematoma formed within that. However, the bulging AF had come down, the child had become little stable, the midline shift had reduced, but the pus still remained there. That's why we went ahead with neurosurgical intervention and did burr hole drainage of the empyema, and the whole pus was evacuated. Around 25 to 30 cc of the pus was evacuated. The pus culture showed the growth of, um, we did PCR as well as pus culture, which showed both showed the growth of uh, Escherichia coli which is a common gram-negative cause of a complicated meningitis in this age group, which was sensitive to meropenem. We gave five weeks of uh, meropenem in the hospital. We had to insert central line because IV access was difficult. We monitored repeated neurosonograms to look for re uh, recollections of uh, the pus. However, that was not seen. And this was the neurosonogram on discharge. The collections had all gone. And repeat CSF on discharge was also showed only 14 cells. So, so it, uh, can you tell us uh, the, any neurological causes that can cause recurrent fevers in children? Yes, yes. So if we look at the neurological causes of fevers, like in this case, it was partially treated bacterial infection. Any infant less than six months of age coming with fever and seizure, uh, the recommendation is to go for lumbar puncture, even if there are no systemic signs of inflammation or uh, high inflammatory markers. So in this case, Ideally, lumbar puncture was indicated in the first uh, episode when the child presented with fever because then uh, he got complicated into a empyema. So any occult abscesses, partially treated infections, tuberculosis, even fungal infections, rickettsial infections are known to come with prolonged or recurrent fevers. Non-infectious causes of fever, like uh, there's a new entity called as MOG associated antibody, uh, MOG antibody associated disorders, where children present with prolonged fever, they may or may not have any neurological deficit, but MRI would show demyelinating lesions. And MOG antibody would come positive and they would respond beautifully to immunomodulation. Other autoimmune disorders like SLE, vasculitis, neurosarcoidosis can also present with only fevers. And in neurological ICU, we see hypothalamic dysfunction or central fevers as a result of any uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, a barachnoid hemorrhage. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the neurological causes, enumerating the neurological causes. And over to Dr. Parjat, who is our experienced pediatric gastroenterologist. Uh, and, uh, one, this is a two-year-old boy. He presented with uh, epigastric pain uh, and then intermittent vomiting for the last three months, so really chronic uh, history. So, Dr. Pajat, can you tell us how you manage this child? So, as we can, I will just show this, uh, because this is a long history, you can just see, I have shown uh, here only till up to 18 months. This was the whole time that uh, for me it took to make the diagnosis and treat the child. So, initially this patient uh, came with epigastric pain abdomen and intermittent postprandial vomiting. So as usually, we will think of something dyspeptic kind of symptoms. Although for a two-year-old kid to tell epigastric pain, it is quite unusual. If he is showing that, that means something is there. It's not functional. So initially, we thought of gastroesophageal reflux or peptic ulcer disease or functional dyspepsia. Initially, without any investigation, we gave a trial of two weeks of PPI, which failed. Child had similar symptoms. Then we went ahead with investigations which showed slightly high platelet and inflammatory markers were increased. Amylase lipase was normal and then we went ahead with endoscopy. 
So we can see stomach is absolutely red. It's looking angry, looking like stomach. Normally, if we look, it will look more like the the color will be more like the duodenal mucosa that we can see. So it was quite erythematous, and even duodenal mucosa showed there is a scalloping and mild nodularity. Biopsy showed H. pylori positivity in the stomach, so we treated that with some improvement because duodenal biopsy also had some issues, so we did celiac serology, which was negative. So next, when patient came to me after uh, some improvement, so next, yeah, so there was initial some improvement, but then child started having fever, recurrent, every day, 100, 101 degree Fahrenheit, sometimes up to 102, similar epigastric pain, but now fall in hemoglobin not gaining weight and poor physical activity. So patient went somewhere else and child was worked up for tuberculosis, which was rightly done. CT showed dilated terminal ileum with fecal material. Normally we don't expect fecal material in ileum. It should ileally be in the colon. So there can be some IC wall problem, but GA for AFE and X-ray everything was normal. So now the th differentials that I thought along with the past history, is it resistant H. pylori infection? But fever is not a feature of that. Tuberculosis, definitely it can be. IBD, but uh, there are no other GI symptoms which I can incriminate. Immunodeficiency, we cannot rule out. So in workup, albumin was falling, CRP was high, colonoscopy was normal, and then again we did endoscopy after the five month of the first endoscopy. So now the first picture is a uh, narrow band imaging, so it is looking blue, but it is the same duodenum which we have seen in the first. So there have, uh, I think arrows have uh, somehow, so yellow color arrows if we can see, these are the ulcers, and we can see some circular ulcers for there. Now H. pylori is negative, but biopsy again did not show anything other than inflammation. Stool examination we did, which showed ankylostoma, which we have treated. But again, some improvement was there, repeat stool examination was normal, pain decreased, and fever was there, but frequency has decreased. Again, after four months, patient come to me. Now it has passed around 10 months with me, but somehow they were sticking still with me. So there was recurrent pain, again, fever, which has again started increasing, hemoglobin dropped to 7.7, .7 and appetite has decreased. So now again, the same differentials. I, don't I did not have any other clue to think of anything else. TB, all tests were negative. IBD, biopsies were not suggesting. I uh, took consultation with the immunologist. And we took, uh, we sent samples for all the immunodeficiency autoimmune workup. Everything was normal, but fecal calprotectin came very high. Usually it can be high in intestinal inflammation, but it was quite high. Colonoscopy was again normal. And now the endoscopy picture, if we see, the ulcers have become quite deep and big, like disease was revealing itself to me over the year. So it has big, deep, long ulcers. So now again, I have taken biopsy, which again did not reveal anything. CT has shown a thick, small bowel loop, which was not there in the first CT scan. So we made a diagnosis of Crohn's disease versus abdominal TB, mostly involving a small intestine. Because uh, nothing was very strong for any one of them, I started uh, given trial of ATT, which failed. After six weeks also, there was no improvement. So child was started on immunosuppression, thinking of Crohn's disease. After that, hemoglobin drastically improved, albumin improved, inflammatory markers resolved. Most importantly, fever stopped coming. In last five months, not even once child developed fever. So now we have stopped the steroids and child is doing absolutely fine on only azathioprine. So this was a case of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, I will say. What I always say that inflammatory bowel disease is quite an underdiagnosed condition. So many kids coming to us with pain, fever, which is going on and on, it can be IBD. So we should suspect if inflammatory markers are high or any red flags are there. So apart from IBD, uh, what are the other causes of uh, GIE causes that can cause recurrent fever? Yeah, so mostly GIE causes child will localize. So we don't need to think if there are no symptoms. but. Inflammatory bowel disease, GI tuberculosis, GI lymphomas, these are common causes. We see a, not a lot, but GI lymphomas can be a cause. Then in immunodeficiency as CVID can present even in adolescence, vasculitis, and there are so many causes. Hepatobiliary is uh, this liver abscess. Autoimmune hepatitis and sclerosing cholangitis are two causes of chronic liver disease which can present along with the fever. Then cholidocal cyst, Karelis disease and splenic abscess, of course the Polydocal cyst and carolis, when infection is there, it can present primarily with the fever.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Parjat. Uh, and over to Dr. Shweta. Uh, she is presenting an uncommon presentation of a common disease, which we all know. Uh, okay, Dr. Shweta, uh, can you quickly go through the case? It's yeah. a case of 10-year-old female who presented with weight loss uh, for one to two months and low-grade fever on and off and decreased appetite for three weeks. Uh, there's no history of cough, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, or no bones. Uh, there's no significant history in the past and family history. There's no history of contact and no significant illness in the family. Uh, on examination, she looks emaciated, weight less than third centile, but height is appropriate for her age, more than third centile. Uh, blood pressure within the range, uh, there was paler and rest of the examination normal, no impedinopathy. Uh, her investigation showed HP of 9.2, total count 16,000, ESR and CRP slightly elevated, uh, left and RFT within the range, and CUE showed turbid appearance of the urine with trace protein, and plenty of pus cells and 15 to 20 RBCs. Blood culture and urine culture, which was sent before starting antibiotics, came to be negative. So we are looking at a case of uh, sterile pyuria in a child with chronic symptoms. Yes. And there are some X-ray findings as well in that child. Yeah, uh, can you tell us I'll, briefly yeah. about the ultrasound? So ultrasound abdomen, uh, the liver, pancreas, spleen were unremarkable. Uh, left kidney is normal, but right kidney sh uh, showed uh, enlarged. So we can see the size of the right kidney, uh, 120 mm, and the left kidney is 87 mm. And there is also hydroureteral necrosis on the right side. And with cortical thinning. So upper pole is uh, 4 mm and uh, lower pole is uh, 8 mm. And uh, there is also sludge in the dilated calyces with internal echoes in dilated uh, ureter and urinary bladder. And there is uh, irregular bladder wall. So we have sent uh, sputum for gene expert. Uh, it showed mycobacterium tuberculosis sensitive to rifampicin. And subsequent to the ultrasound findings, we have sent urine for AFB. So we have sent uh, three samples. Uh, there is a specific urine uh, collection for AFB. We have to collect entire early morning sample uh, for three to five consecutive days. We got two positive. Uh, and the diagnosis is it's a, a rare presentation of renal TB in conjunction with a pulmonary TB. So we did MCUG. It showed us a lot of changes. The bladder is subtle alter shape. We can see bilateral VUR. And uh, upper and mid pole calyces are uh, grossly dilated, and uh, lower pole calyces are uh, moderately dilated. And there is a corkscrew appearance, a beaded appearance of the ureter. In between, we can see strictures and uh, dilatation at the right lower ureter. And there is significant post void residue. So we have started on ATT, two months of intensive therapy, followed by three drugs for four months. And it's the uh, incidence of coming to incidence of renal TB is very rare. Uh, three to five, less than three to five percent of the all TB infected cases. So, so Dr. Shweta, uh, can you, uh, renal TB is obviously quite rare, but what are the other common causes of uh, recurrent fever in your practice? Yeah. The first common cause is UTI, recurrent UTI, which requires detailed evaluation. And the tubular disorders like Barter's, Rittleman, RTA, and DA, these tubular disorders, the recurrent fever is due to dehydration. These are dehydration fevers. And then renal tuberculosis and lupus nephritis, SLE. Thank you very much. Uh, this was actually a 40-minute presentation, but uh, it was reduced to 30, so I have to hurry my presenters. So thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Anjini, you have five minutes for your case. Good afternoon. Uh, I will be presenting the case details of an 11-year boy who was born to a non-consanguineous couple. He presented with history of fever for one month. The fever was high grade, up to one or three Fahrenheit. Initially, it was subsided with some antipyretics, oral drugs after three days. However, it only recurred after one week. This time, along with fever, there was history of rash, which occurred on multiple areas of the face, trunk, and extremities. He was evaluated for the fever. He was uh, treated with IV ceftriaxone. There was no response. Infective workup with malaria, dengue were negative. So when he came to us at one month on examination, there was mala rash, which was including the nasal bridge, nose, and the cheeks, with characteristic nasolabial sparing. He also had some oral ulcers, mucosal bleeds, and crusting of the lips along with redness, and rest of the systemic examination was normal. Keeping in mind the fever and the rash, the initial possibility we considered was multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children or atypical Kawasaki disease. However, the malar rash was something which was against it. 
With the characteristic malar rash, we kept a possibility of systemic lupus erythematosus. Down the line, we considered malignancy infections, but they were odd because there was no organomegaly or lymphadenopathy. We went ahead with some investigations. In the investigations, there was persistent thrombocytopenia, leukopenia as low as 1900 of TLC. CRP was normal in spite of so much of fever. ESR was 70. There was mild transaminitis. We did an echocardiography upfront, which showed aneurysms in the uh, left main coronary artery and the proximal LAD. We did COVID antibody titers, which were highly positive. Because we were suspecting lupus, we have done ANA by immunofluorescence, which was positive. Both anti-DSGNA and anti-Smith antibodies were also elevated, along with low complements. So finally, we made a diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus with uh, cardiac involvement, with mucocutaneous involvement, with hematological involvement, and some transaminases. He was treated with IVIG at admission because there was uh, <coughs> presence of coronary aneurysms, but there was no much response. When we made a diagnosis of lupus, we have started him on IV methylprednisolone pulses followed by oral steroids, and he's currently on azathioprine, and he's doing good with the platelet count of more than 2 lakhs and TLC of more than 6,000, and all other symptoms have resolved. So, Dr. Anjini, I would like to ask, uh, what are the rheumatological causes of recurrent fever you see commonly? So, in the rheumatological causes of fever, uh, if the child comes with arthritis, high-grade fever, evanescent rash, and some organomegaly lymphadenopathy, always think of systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Connective tissue disorders like RK, systemic lupus erythematosus, juvenile dermatomyositis, systemic sclerosis, can have fever as a presenting complaint, and it can be the sole initial manifestation. As we all know, vasculitis, if not treated properly, can have persistent and recurrent fever uh, spikes. And there are many other disorders like auto-inflammatory or periodic fevers in which there would be episodic recurrent fever. Other uh, miscellaneous conditions like sarcoidosis, macrophage activation syndromes, inborn errors of immunity can also have recurrent fevers. And when would you suspect, when would you uh, advise us to suspect a rheumatological cause of fever? So. Uh, Whenever a child has prolonged, periodic, episodic fevers, we need to suspect rheumatological diseases. Especially when there's multi-organ involvement, when there's rash, which is unexplained, when the musculoskeletal system is involved in the form of joint pain, swelling, myositis, if there's extreme weakness, some oral mucosal changes like oral ulcers, genital ulcers, unexplained uh, alopecia, we need to consider rheumatological diseases. So what are your messages for that? So I would like to say when a child comes with fever, especially prolonged and recurrent, we should just not only work up for infections because fevers are not just because of infections. Moreover, the pediatric rheumatological diseases are more severe than the adult counterparts. So appropriate history, examination, and some base in baseline investigations can help us make a diagnosis. Thank you very much. And coming to the last case, uh, Dr. Srikant. Uh, can you go through your case? Yeah. So we had a nine-year-old girl presented with a chief complaint of pain in the right elbow since one month, and she was uh, attributing it to post-trauma, trivial trauma she had. And then fever was there since last three weeks, which was there on and off low grade. Apart from that, she didn't have any other significant complaints like other joint pain or swelling, no rash, no restriction of movements of the joint, normal appetite, normal bubble bladder habits, no other constitutional symptoms. Examination-wise, she was totally hemodynamically stable child with normal head-to-toe and a normal systemic examination. So with this very uh, only complaint of uh, mild pain in the elbow and fever, which is the low grade, we obviously thought of infective causes involving the joint and worked up for the infective causes. So CBP being normal, other parameters also being normal, cultures were no negative, and other infective workup was also normal. So as she was complaining, persistent pain, low grade pain of the left uh, elbow, so we did X-ray and ultrasound as well, which were normal. She was started on NSAIDs and uh, monitored, but she didn't improve a lot. Then an MRI was done. Actually, parents were from Dubai, so they got the MRI done there. And apparently, they were uh, told that the MRI is showing gross abnormalities, quiry infiltrative lesion. Parents were totally uh, shattered with that uh, report, and they came immediately to India, and they came up here. So it is then when we uh, took up the case, and then we did a PET CT scan because MRI was showing these abnormal findings of uh, diffuse involvement. 
So we did a PET CT scan to look what, if any other bones are involved and what is the picture like. So that mainly showed focal areas of hypermetabolism and uh, uh, all the areas, all the bones were showing hypermetabolic and hyperintensity, which is not a regular pattern which we see in any infective causes. So when we thought of this, then we went ahead and did bone marrow aspiration and biopsy. Aspiration was inconclusive. Then again, we had a dilemma. But good thing is we always have a habit of doing biopsy simultaneously. The biopsy was the one which showed after a week a sheet of blast cells, which on IHC confirmed the diagnosis of infiltrative disorder. That is B cell lymphoblastic leukemia. So this is the biopsy report. So mainly here what we want to stress is it's not that always uh, leukemia should have high-grade fever, organomegaly, a sick child or a bleeding child. They can have just very mild, vague symptoms and if we miss it and we think some it, if it's an arthritis and we start steroids, then we can have child landing up in complications. So the take-home message would be fever without focus should prompt us to do a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy. And though it is an invasive, it's a very simple procedure that should not hinder us from doing the procedure if we don't have a focus. And do not consider uh, initiation of steroids without thorough evaluation. Had we given steroids in this case, then she would have landed up with major complications and maybe would have had even end up losing the child. Presently, the child is uh, two, two years plus on maintenance. She is doing very well, perfectly right, and they've gone back to Dubai. So consider a final message is, if fever is there without focus, go ahead and do a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy if you think it's necessary. Don't have a false thing that it's a very cumbersome procedure, difficult to do, it cannot be done in a setting. No, it can be done, it's a very simple procedure and we have to guide the parents as well that there's a need for the procedure and we have to take it. And especially steroids, because nowadays everything is coming up, Missy, all, everything is coming up and we tend to give steroids. But sometimes if we give steroids in ALL upfront, then we will uh, land up in soup. Thank you. Okay, very valuable uh, uh, points, uh, Dr. Srikant. So what I learned from this case is whenever we see a child with recurrent fever, of course, infectious diseases are still far common. So we have to look at uncommon manifestations of common diseases like we saw. Then if the child is not responding to conventional antibiotics, rather than increase the antibiotics to higher antibiotics, we should also think laterally. Are we looking at any atypical infections? Are we looking at any systemic cause of infections? If the child has recurrent severe infections, look for primary immunodeficiency disorders. And last but not the least, look for rheumatological causes and malignancies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? I think we 40 seconds early, so we can take a couple of questions. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Srinivas Jekka, sir, and his esteemed panel. That's a very, you know, roller coaster session. That was very interesting cases. Uh, thank you so much. So, any questions from the audience? So, there is an interesting quiz, practitioner's quiz there in the down floor. That is Hall B, Dr. P. Sudarshan Reddy, sir, Hall. So, please go there. Lots of uh, prizes to be won. Yeah. So, inaugural function is at 7 o'clock in the same hall. Please do join us. There is an interesting and exciting and uh, scintillating session is there. Uh, so please join. So I request all the practitioners to register for practitioner's quiz. Even the audience. Audience has prizes. Every round we have an audience uh, prizes. The cash prizes will be given instantly. So enjoy the process. So please join in Hall B at 5.30. Yeah. 5.30, we'll start, lead to start the quiz, practitioner's quiz. Hello? Request all the registered delegates to please join us for IAP Central Zone Pedicon Practitioner's Quiz. We'll start it in the next 15 minutes in Hall B. It's a wonderful chance for you to get your registration amount back and also to participate as participants. 
any correct answer which the teams on stage don't give, you get a chance to answer it and you get instant cash awards. So come down to Hall B. I'm sure it will be very entertaining for you all. See you all in Hall B in 15 minutes. I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy this. We are bringing up the team here, which is Shravanti and team onto the stage with your round of applause. Come on, make some noise. And the first song which Shravanti and team is going to perform here is Nagulamma, Nagulamma. Come on, make some noise for them.
make some noise. So we're giving you some flavors of Telangana folk. We are not done yet. We're bringing more on this stage. And with another folk dance by the name Dandanadan, the team is once again coming here onto the stage. But I want you guys making some noise. Come on, make some noise. Everyone, please put your hands. Great, sir. Great. That is what we want. Come on, team. Can we have you back again on stage?
So ladies and gentlemen, how is it? Is it giving you some flavors of Telangana? Yes, Telangana is known for culture, language, festivities. And now, one of the famous song when we talk about Telangana, Teen Mar, what, do you, what it comes? The one song which everyone loves to tap their foot is exactly right, sir. So our team is coming up with Maya Dari Mai Sammar song for you all. So can we make some noise? Come on. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shravanti and team. Thank you so much. Come on, give them a huge round of applause for Shravanti and team who performed so lovely on this stage, the Telangana folk dance. So ladies and gentlemen, before we move ahead, I want everyone to please stand up. Wherever you're sitting, I would request you all to please stand up once. Everyone. May I request everyone to please stand up at the place wherever you're sitting? Lovely. Okay. Amazing. So what we need to do right now is, so yeah, thank you so much, sir. Please shake hands with the partner who is uh, at right your side and shake hand and say, how are you doing? Just check with them, come on. 
check with them. How are you doing? And give them a tap on their shoulder. Come on. Everyone, there's nothing to hesitate. Come on, give them a shake hand. They'll feel good. You are going to be there this evening, couple of hours together, isn't it? Yes. So what is the harm in checking with how the person is? All right. That's lovely. That's lovely. Sir, not in front of me, sir. When I see, you know, I love the, you know, I love when you are uh, shaking that smiles when come, uh, come on to your faces. That's amazing for the one who's standing on the stage to watch it. Okay, what we'll do is, by the time, yes, sir. Sir, how are you doing, sir? <laughs> how are you doing, sir? <laughs> amazing. I, I will, I'll carry him and put him onto the stage now. <laughs> All right, so now what we'll do is, by the time we have um, inaugural, uh, for the inaugural ceremony, we have chairs put up. I want you all to do so, please. Only hardly for a couple of seconds, I want you all to stand. What we need to do is, I want you all to snap your fingers twice. Snap your finger twice with both the hands, twice. And one single clap. Twice you have to snap, one, two, and one clap. Good enough? Okay. So let's do it together. One, two. of us as a team. We shouldn't miss the rhythm. Yes, sir? We'll do it together? Okay. Let's do it as a team. One, two, three. 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 Where can we have the track also? Anna, track place, yes, Tara? Track. So, there will be a track which will be played now. We have to sing what we are doing with the track. Ready? Let's do it. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. I should hear. I can't hear the clap, Bloody the snap. Oh boy, make a big noise. Three. In the street, gonna three. Be a big man three. One, two, three. Come on. You One, two, three. Crazy. Come on. Little more loud. so much. Thank you. Now, I will request our inaugural organizing committee to please come onto the stage and take the mic from me. So, I would request if you can please come onto the stage. The organizing committee Very good evening and warm welcome to all the delegates from all over the country. We welcome you all, Team Hyderabad, Team IAP TCB, Team PADS, that is Team IAP Central Zone Pedicon, welcomes you all who has come all across the country for this wonderful five-state conference, the fantastic uh, five-star experience conference, which has been done in the Parth Hyatt. So it has uh, many records to it. So it has a record number of registrations, 
and first time uh, in the city of hyderabad we are conducting this and uh, we have to we have so many scientific uh, sessions around 110 faculty across the country they have arrived to hyderabad to the deliberate the session scientific sessions and to share their knowledge and wisdom with all of us and uh, there are lot of uh, success in the e posters we have received more than 225 posters that is more than uh, it's like a national conference mini national conference itself and 128 free papers and uh, more than 28 gold medal papers to be competed so with that great success it's a five star pedicon which we had the blockbuster pedicon so now with now that i call upon the two reception committee chairman dr alladi ashwant rao sir who is the president elect of uh, Pediatric Academy of Telangana State to please come and occupy the chair, and uh, Dr. Garlapati Lakshman Sir, who is also the President Elect of IAP Twin Cities Branch, and then now I call upon our Chief, uh, uh, two Organizing Secretaries, Dr. Arakala Baskar Sir, who is the President of Pediatric Academy of Telangana State, give a good round of applause, and I welcome Dr. Sunkoju Baskar Sir, who is a Uh, president of iap twin cities branch without these two baskers the conference won't be there so now i invite the chief organizing chairman vice president central zone dr radha krishna sir to please come and occupy the chair sir and the two organizing chairman dr n ravi kumar sir and also dr m surendra sir to please come and on the dais sir give a good round of applause and i invite our guest andhra pradesh iap state president dr murlidhar reddy sir to please come on the stage sir and the uh, ciap treasurer dr samir dalwai sir to please come and occupy the chair sir and now i invite our hsg honorary secretary general ciap dr vinith saxena sir to please come and occupy the chair sir and uh, dr upendra kinjewadkar sir who is the president elect ciap and dr e ravinder reddy sir who is a national vice president of indian medical association to please come and occupy the chair sir now i invite our chief guest dr krishna ella sir who is a innovative entrepreneur who is a scientist and en entrepreneur who is a savior of many lives during the covid times he has made a tremendous remark across the globe the hyderabadi the the telangana he made us pride across the world and dr krishna ella sir is a padma bhushan award he is a phd faculty at uh, viscon medicine university he is a pres most prestigious jrd tata award awardee and he is a university of south california the special award of asia pacific leadership award was also be bestowed on him now i invite of the president of ciap dr ramesh kumar sir who is just on the way and i request our uh, president both presidents uh, to honor uh, the delegate call honor the chief guest with the medal of honor So, with a medal of honor, special medal of honor to Dr. Krishna Ella Sir from President Dr. Alakar Baskar Sir. The special medal of honor with the statue of new icon, statue of equality, and uh, the conference logo and the state and uh, central IAP logos. Yes. Now I invite the dignitaries to inaugurate the session with uh, lighting the lamp.
welcome Dr. Murugari ji to our program Anga Bhavish Show. Acknowledge the presence of Central EP members of uh, Telangana, uh, Dr. Sri Krishna sir, Dr. G. Vijay Kumar sir, and Dr. Sushalam sir, and also the EP members of uh, AP. Delegates and guests, our president, Central IAP, Dr. Dinesh Nath Nathanshya, our uh, guest of honor, Dr. Sri Krishna Ayla, our honorary secretary general, Dr. Vinay Sakshira, our uh, Central IAP president, Dr. Salim Galway, our uh, guest of honor, Dr. Ravindra Reddy, presently vice president of National Indian Medical Association. Our uh, chairperson of the conference, Dr. Surendra Nath, and Dr. Uh, Murlidhar Reddy, President, Andhra Pradesh, and our uh, chief, our chief uh, chairperson, Dr. Radha Krishna, our organizing chairperson, Dr. M. Ravi Kumar, our reception committee chairperson, Dr. Lakshman Gargapati. Another reception committee chairperson, Dr. Lakshman Rao, Dr. Pawan, joint organizing secretary, and Dr. RSC, wherever you are, you are requested. So, good evening, all. since they told us there would be conference, ever since they had allotted this conference to us, it was five months ago, we had uh, chosen the scientific committee headed by none other than our uh, uh, advisor, Dr. Sanjay Sridhampur, along with Dr. Usharani. They made a super fantastic scientific program within two or three days. <laughs> and since that time until yesterday, we spent a lot of time, we planned meticulously to conduct this program, a memorable one, and should be a very, very educative one. I had performed my two children's marriage. My daughter was married, my son was married. I thought that was a tough task to perform marriages. But believe me, organizing the small Central Zone Conference, it took us three months, sir. Now I appreciate Dr. Vinit Saxena how difficult it was for you to organize the national conference. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Arakala Bhaskar used to sleep at 3 a.m. I used to get up at 4 a.m. Honestly, 4 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. I used to work. He used to work from 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. with little interruptions. Whenever there is a patient, he used to see the patient and he used to do the conference. And it's not the importance of me two persons. It is the teamwork which made the dream true. It is a teamwork, everybody, <laughs> sincerely. All the committees, all these, uh, our joint organizing secretaries, our uh, sponsors, everybody, including all the IAP members. And let me acknowledge in this difficult period where pharma companies were not uh, really doing well, vaccine producing companies were not doing well, despite that, by seeing you people, by seeing you people, by seeing you people, they had come forward, they had co contributed sufficiently so that we are able to do in this cozy atmosphere. Thanks to all the sponsors. And not to take much time, uh, I must thank my wife who is sitting there. Last three months, I was not uh, mentally talking to her. I was talking physically. She used to say something. My mind was about the conference. So she tolerated, tolerated me for three months. Thank you, Vijaya. 
and we are uh, really we are uh, immensely happy that uh, sri krishna ella it was a pedikan thunder actually we had named the our cultural program as pedikan thunder but your presence is a bigger thunder lightning thunder we were extremely happy because uh, we thought that dr krishna ella may not be able to grace the occasion but amazingly just 45 minutes ago we got an information that he is arriving we were really rejuvenated and whatever uh, fatigue exhaustion we had we became fresh again sir so thank you all for coming here have a nice time in the evening thank you now i invite our uh, reception committee chairperson dr ashwant rao to address the audience uh, i request all central iap eb members from our state dr sri krishna sir dr vijay kumar sir dr sri sir please come out to the stage sir please they are the ambassadors and the connection between the central iap and our state and they are very very important persons to uh, for getting the conference to our state thank you sir please ask you sir and alok bandari sir also from our uh, uh, central zone eb member please sir good evening everybody uh, i welcome all uh, dignitaries today's chief guest dr ramesh kumar central ip president padma shri dr rela then uh, hsg dr ramesh uh, vinith saxena all the dignitaries our brother ima vice president national dr ravindra reddy our two chair persons dr surendra nath dr ravi organizing secretaries i have been looking at uh, two conferences 2010 and 2016 but the present central zone conference the amount of work done by both the chair persons dr baskar arikala baskar and sulkosh baskar is phenomenal we were a part really i saw all the email messages when i saw in the morning around 5:30 or 6 o'clock the last message delivered by arikala baskar was around 3:30 i think sunkoj baskar started his work at 4 am we were a part uh, all be been saying team work team work together we achieved all this to the present stage what we had done we know central zone pedicon is of the all the five states today we had uh, gold medal papers 28 gold medal papers 170 e posters 128 uh, free papers it speaks the amount of interest shown by post graduate delegates and all the halls a or b was fully packed yc mathur hall and uh, ps reddy hall were fully packed right from morning 9 to 5 the topics framed by the scientific committee the members who had taken lot of time to frame really it speaks uh, they made uh, the delegates present so i thank one and all all the members from all the five states who have graced the occasion the faculties around 120 faculties who have graced this occasion delegates 700 plus delegates made the, this uh, conference to the present state one and all our advisors without whom dr indrashekar sir dr sanjay all the guiding forces jagdish chandra seniors all people who have guided us constantly thank i thank one and all for giving us this opportunity especially dr radha krishna without whom we would not have really thought of gracing this central zone conference thank you one and all i request dr anil kumar sir sir please come out to the stage central iap eb member from andhra pradesh and we are missing dr kiriti and uh, dr <coughs> please sir uh, now i request uh, dr garlapati lakshman to address the audience uh, in capacity as a reception committee chairperson 
Uh, he talks uh, just for one minute. Even if you request him, he will not talk more than one minute. Thank you, Dr. Baskar. Good evening, all the delegates and all the national faculty and our seniors. Thanks to the organizing committee for in, uh, making me the reception committee member, me and Ashwan. And uh, we did little, actually, uh, Dr. Baskar and uh, uh, two Baskars and all the scientific committee, they have organized so well, Pavan and RSV. And uh, it is a first time, first uh, central zone conference in Hyderabad. And it, it, uh, it is uh, nothing less than a national conference. And I thank you one and all and enjoy the Hyderabad food, Hyderabad uh, uh, culture and Hyderabad uh, cultural activities tonight. And uh, the last, I would like to thank Dr. Krishna Ayala for gracing this occasion. Thank you, sir. Thank you one and all. Now I request uh, our uh, RNS chief RNS chairperson, Dr. Radha Krishna. Please, uh, you are invited onto the podium. Chief guest of the day, Ila Krishna. Guest of honor, Ravind Redgaru. Organizing secretaries, organizing chairpersons. EB members of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, and my dear academicians. Why I'm calling you an academician is, in a developed country, the meaning of an academician is a researcher. In our country, we hardly have research. So anybody who can give a good lecture is an academician. On this day, anybody who attends a conference is a great academician. So out of the 5,000 delegates of Central Zone, around 700 have come and 200 of them are in this hall. So you're all great academicians. <clears throat> 40 years ago in 1983, I attended a conference, 19th Pedicon at Pune. Do you know how many delegates were there? I was thrilled, 180 delegates were there. Now over a period of 30, 40 years in a national conference, we have 10,000 delegates to uh, 10,000 delegates. I would like to thank both the organizing secretaries and the organizing chairpersons because they've done a wonderful job. I, ha I have hardly contributed anything to the conference, but they've done a wonderful job because they were at Hyderabad. I will always say academics are extremely important. You have to invest some time on academics and every pediatrician should take care of his himself, his health and family. That is the art of balancing. How much time you would like to spend on yourself, academics, your health, and everything. That is an art of balancing. So at the outset, I would like to invite all the delegates to, to this wonderful conference. Thank you. Yeah, now I request our uh, Dr. N. Ravi Kumar, the Arnazan chairperson, very dynamic personality. Now request you to address the audience, please. Yeah, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On the eve of this inauguration, it gives me immense pleasure. Dignitaries on the dais, Dr. Krishna Inle, sir, and my IAP central office bearers, and my colleagues and of the dais. I can see a good number of my colleagues and my senior colleagues who are sitting here. When I completed my post-graduation, one of my professors has told me, see, you got only a certificate. There are a lot of gaps. It is a zigzag puzzle. Unless you go to the conferences, workshops, you don't know what you are not aware. So today, though qualification-wise, I'm a professor, but whenever I'm supposed to address for one particular class, I have to again and again see for the what is update in the latest. That's what Today, in, the, in this session, mammoth gathering, but I never seen a central zone conference, such a massively, to fill the gaps 
of the academics, whatever small, small things are there, that gaps are stopping us not to move forward while in the diagnosis or treatment. That filling the gaps is, is going to get in these conferences, more so in the workshops. So I'm sure you are all going to get an excellent benefit, academic benefit out of this. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. You had set a trend of uh, finishing of speeches within one minute. Thank you. Yes. Now I invite Dr. Surendranath, our uh, chairperson of this co conference. I should say one word about Dr. Surendranath. Whenever we go to a vaccine producing company, they say, where is Surendranath? And all these sponsored uh, sessions, they wish to give few, to few people. He's one of those people. Over to Dr. Surendranath. Dignitaries on the dais, our chief guest, Padma Bhushan Krishna Ellagaru, and our central IP secretary general, Dr. Vinit Saxena, and vice president, chief organizing chairperson, Dr. Radha Krishnan, Dr. Samir, the treasurer, and our organizing secretaries, Baskar and Baskar and joint organizing secretaries Pavan and Sri Krishna and joint secretary of Central IAP and the EP members of the Telangana and AP state and president of AP state Murlidhar and Ravinder Edigaru, our Peddana, I am a, I think vice president sir and the Dignitaries who are sitting in the audience, Dr. Bakul Parekh, Dr. Sanjay, Dr. Indrashekar sir, Dr. Baswaraj, and many more. Good evening, all of you. As you know, updates are very important for the practicing pediatrician. The subject we have learned 20 years ago is entirely different what we are practicing now. And in this August audience, now I can say, Previously, Hyderabad was supposed to be a city of pearls. Now can we say it is a city of vaccines? Our innovation has brought Hyderabad into the global map, and we are the leading producer of the vaccines all over the world, in fact. And thanks to Bharat Biotech and many other companies who have started manufacturing vaccines for the world supply. Now we are able to supply to the world. And as far as the scientific program and the workshops are concerned, they are very well designed for the dissipating the latest knowledge to the pediatricians. I wish all of you will enjoy the Central Zone Conference. This is, I think, fourth Central Zone Conference, and we are happy to host it. Wish you all the best. Wish you all happy learning. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Srinath. Now I invite our uh, very dynamic organizing secretary, Dr. Arakala Baskar. Please. Even un until this moment, is still tense and under stress. Thank you. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, before starting this speech, I requested Ravi not to talk too much. Give me some time. And his briefest speech is today itself. Thank you, Ravi. And <coughs> It's my pleasure and honor to invite you all to this pleasant evening into this beautiful city of Hyderabad, the city of Pearls. And whenever, if we want to achieve anything, we have to first conceive the idea of uh, achieving that. And we had this idea of conducting the Central Zone Conference uh, almost four months back. After that, I was, after Dr. Radha Krishna sir, uh, and insisting him that we should get the Central Zone Conference sir for the first time. Uh, we are not having the Central Zone Conference. Our tracker record is very, very um, brilliant sir. We have conducted many national conferences and uh, upper Pedicon also. So, uh, thank you sir. But he gave me a caution. Bhaskar, if you get the Central Zone Conference, I won't interfere you as long as you are going in the right direction. And till now, he has not spoken to me, not a single word. And when we were coming back, 
after dinner he told me bhaskar you and your team are doing well no problem still i do interact with all the scholars experienced persons experts and academicians and teachers to for this 3 days conference and with this few words i thank each and every delegate because without you without you no conference will be successful and we are afraid that almost 800 if the 800 will come physically it is very difficult to manage them today's the lunch time it was around 600 it may touch more tomorrow because tomorrow is sunday with this few words again i thank every person every person every delegate every leader in the state iap and all the executive body members in the five other four states for helping extending and helping and uh, to us thank you sir and 
I fail my duty if I not mention one person. Dr. Sanjay sir, really thank you sir for really guiding in all aspects, in all aspects, not only getting the funds, uh, not, not only approaching the VIP people and also the scientific content, everything. Thank you sir. And also I thank from my bottom of my, of my heart the scientific committee both chairmen, Dr. T. Usharani Madam, Dr. Vijay Kumar, and also the convener and our central EV member, Dr. Sri Krishna sir, for uh, preparing a wonderful uh, scientific content with, uh, with a theme at the center of uh, the scientific uh, program. Thank you, all the scientific committee. And lastly, I, I, I want to thank uh, the accommodation people who are looking after and the transport, Dr. Sudarshan, and everybody, everybody, if I do not mention anybody. Take it that I, I am mentioning all the 1,500 members of Telangana and uh, also other leaders of Central Zone and also the national leaders. Thank you once again. And <coughs> with these favors, I, I take uh, leave and thank you very much for any conference or any program to be successful. It is a teamwork. To my luck, the Sunkos Bhaskar has come to me. In 99% of times, when we have issues or problems, we use it to uh, we use it to agree, not to disagree. And only few per, uh, percent of times only we disagree. And even this, it will not happen with my wife also. Thank you, Sunkos. And and one thing he told me: any situation, just respond, not react. And <laughs> so that will drop my BP also. Thank you, Sunkos. And uh, with these few words, I thank all the organizing committee members, the patrons, the advisors, and different uh, uh, chairmen, conveners, and members of the uh, organizing committee. They are totally more than 106. Even though they are not on the stage in one way or other way, they helped a lot to me. And any inconvenience, discomfort, or any heart burning issues are there. The entire blame is to me. If you give any, some applause, we will share, everybody will share like a cake, Doctor's Day cake, we will share everybody. With these few words, I thank you everybody, thank you. Yeah. Th thank you Dr. Baskar for addressing the audience and expressing your uh, heartfelt uh, gratitude to all. Uh, now, my colleagues who are sitting on the desk, they are hinting me that uh, let few persons speak, not everybody. So if they allow me, we'll uh, have few persons to speak. So now I invite our uh, Honorary Secretary General, Dr. Vinny Saxena, sir, please. Dr. Vinny Saxena has done a, a memorable, uh, great conference which uh, we had cherished for six days, sir. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Respected Chief Guest, Dr. Krishna Alina, sir. Vice President, Dr. Radha Krishnan, sir. Dignitaries on dais and off the dais. I'm not taking name of individual because off the dais are so many luminaries and dignified people that it will take 10 to 15 minutes. So, friends, when I saw this program, being uh, ex-organizing chairperson, I was little worried about the inauguration function because people enjoy academic and other section of people enjoy fellowship. So in between period, this, this time was very risky, but I must appreciate the spirit and uh, concern of all delegates that all are jam packed. So all participants need applause. <coughs> so friends, uh, this zonal pedicon really fulfills the concept of zonal pedicon involving all five states, faculties are from everywhere, participation is phenomenal, and scientific program is beyond excellence. So I must congratulate organizing team for taking the, this task very seriously. 
now something about our own organization. After Pedicon, actual work started. And friends, it is your success that in last four months, we have conducted a lot of work, not only on academic front, but for so many other fronts. On academic, we have conducted about 50 NTEP workshop, 40 ECD workshop, and 20 workshop of residential action plan just in three or three and a half months. Other important thing which IAP started is working for country, working for government, and uh, with our resident action plan U525, we have working with Ministry of Health and program where a grant start at Lucknow where Deputy Chief Minister of uh, Uttar Pradesh, Mr. Rajesh Pathak was there with IAP president and he appreciated and, and showed his very good concern about the way IAP is working. <coughs> now, our other plans are working for with Women and Development Ministry. We have, we are going to take and adopt some orphanage. Our e-sampark system is already there and we will definitely uh, we're making a program where we will educate or all caretaker of uh, government. Other some important activities are IAP. Uh, uh, now IAP is not limited to India. We have formed four overseas branch. And purpose of this, uh, forming this overseas IAP branch, UK branch is there, Dubai branch is there, Oman and Bahrain. So to, uh, from post-graduate, from uh, those country will come India for their training and we will also uh, it is time to send our uh, uh, postgraduate for further advanced training in uh, European countries and UK and <coughs> our uh, neighboring country Sri Lanka is now facing unprecedented crisis and IAP has decided to help them and we are taking a huge consignment with our own charity fund to help uh, Sri Lanka. So now, friends, it is time to change our mindset, mindset of each individual that academy, definitely we are uh, working for ourselves, for capacity building of our own. But it is time that one should contribute something to community, something to government, and something to uh, our country community again. So this few words, I must congratulate organizing team for organizing such a wonderful conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your valuable message. Uh, now I invite our uh, Central IAP Treasurer, Dr. Samir Dalwai. Please, you're welcome onto the podium, sir. Thank you, respected uh, uh, chairpersons of the conference, all the office bearers of the state branch as well as the Twin Cities branch, respected President Sir in absentia, President-elect, Honorary Secretary-General, all the respected office bearers, the committee members, respected Mukul Parikh Sir, past president, all the dignitaries, and most importantly, very happy to have the distinguished presence of Padma Bhushan, Sri Dr. Krishna with us. And all my respected friends, I would like to place on record the wonderful work done by this conference and the Central Zone Pedicon has been organized in such a wonderful, magnificent manner by all of you, all the Central IAP Executive Board members working in all the states here. And thank you so much for the wonderful hospitality. Hyderabad is known for its uh, food, which will always be known, vaccines it is known now, but the food and the hospitality and the friendship is always there, so thank you so much. Regarding the IAP Treasury, we can only say that thanks to the efforts of the common IAPN across the country, every one of you, each and every one of the IAPNs, we have the huge numbers at our conferences, and that helps us to generate enough revenue to meet the expenses of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. And that's why a big thanks to all of you, and I would always like to place on record our gratitude to you. I would like to end not by speaking anything more about it, but just a little share in Hindi for all of you. It's always wonderful to meet friends, especially 
two years after the lockdown, we haven't really been able to meet as we've been missing each other. So it's like this, when we meet and then we part, it always hurts. And the last two years it has hurt us so much not to have met you. So it goes like this, <coughs> Ravi sahab, bichhdenge hum, bichhdenge hum to ye dil umrubhar lagega nahi. Bichhdenge hum to ye dil umrubhar lagega nahi. Laga hai, lagne lagega, magar lagega nahi. So this is the love and friendship of all of you. Thank you very much. We hope to keep meeting you again and again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samir. Your share share is very good. It's very big. Thank you. Now we invite our big brother of Telangana and Andhra, Dr. Ravinder Reddy, former MCI chairperson, and presently he is the vice president of National Indian Medical Association. Uh, more than that, uh, he is a wholeheartedly, we all call him as Chaddanna. Uh, friends, I am really surprised. Audience are quiet, but seems to be disinterested, waiting for the back, looking at the back. It is a few moments. Please give, there is only one speaker, the renowned uh, Padma Bhushan, uh, the Mr. Krishna Ayalagaru, and most of the members have spoken. Friends, this is a conference catering to five states, 700 delegates, 14 sessions, 100 faculty members, and such an hospitality. Please, and Harkulers have worked for last three to four months, day in and out. Please give them a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. This support lo malle malle korte inko conference jayalan bilak kundali. Now I recognize the veterans in the audience. Before I go on to the uh, chief organizing secretary, uh, Chairman of the Organizing Committee, Dr. Radhakrishna Garu, uh, both Baskar, Darikala Baskar and Sunkoji Baskar, and uh, Dr. Uh, Bandaravi, I don't know where it is, uh, Dr. Garla Pada Lakshman, Dr. Yeshwant, but Peer Jepa Kundi Siritra, Baiti Kochi Nang Suskunta Rantadu. Suskunta Rantadu Kanaka, Mani Peer Mundu Jepali. Bandaravi, and then Vinny Saxena, Dr. Surendra Nath, uh, Dr. Uh, Sri Shailam, Vijay Kumar, Sri Krishna, and the veteran teachers, a conference line last 40 years, 30 years, we are seeing the conferences. When you pair Japa Kunte, it will be incomplete. Taking Dr. Raghavara sir, Dr. Indrashekar Rao, Dr. Ajay, and Scientific Sanjay. Scientific Sanjay, is it the right word? Because every conference in Telangana and Andhra, he will design. Dr. Manchukonda Rangaya Garu, Himabindu Singh, Dr. Dinesh Kerala, the most academic, Bakul Jayant Pai Garu, and Dr. C. N. Reddy. Friends. I don't want to say anything. Uh, pediatric is, uh, in spite of the best treatments, there can be morbidity, mortality. Let it be the internationally, nationally renowned rainbow or any best hunters in the world. There will be some problems. And there are new draft guidelines by NMC. As a medical council chairman of the farmer, I have one word I would say. You have to maintain OP records for three years. You have to maintain. OP records for three years. Is it, it looks simple. Is it possible? If you don't paint a record, somebody finds a case, it is a level one offense. You may be exonerated, you may be punished. I mean, some warning may be there. So like that, there are so many regulations. And uh, National IMA is fighting for that. We have sent, a, we, as a stakeholder, National IMA has sent some certain comments, suggestions, guide uh, to be changed. And then uh, not only that, we need a central act against the violence. National IMA is fighting for that. And also, we want to see, IMA wants to see that medical profession should be out of the ambit of the Consumer Protection Act, which is a difficult one, but we're still trying. Uh, with these few words, I thank the organizers for giving this opportunity. Thank you very much, one and all. Now, uh, thank you, Chaddana. Now, whom shall we have to address you all? I think everybody wants Dr. Krishna Ella, the CEO of Bharat Biotech, Padma Bhushan, Dr. Sri Ella Krishna. May I invite you, sir, with all respect? <laughs> yes, sir. Sir, actually, we expected Madam also, sir, but our bad luck, Madam has not turned out. Thank, thank you, you sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I mean, um, 
Pandareti was calling and uh, Dr. Ramesh and everybody was calling me for to be a chief guest here. I was in US. I was not able to commit my date and I was supposed to come on Tuesday. So I just got a little sick and so I came early. So I want to thank you for being here, honestly. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, Telangana is going to be innovative uh, state. It is not that other states are not going to be, but definitely the Telangana is going to put a momentum in the country to push the innovation to the edges of the entire country. So the country benefits in a way. You know, many people will be asking, what is my strategy? Is it to make money of a vaccine, COVID, vaccine? I was, I was coming from US, New Jersey and Washington, I was there, NRI Association. Everybody knows co-vaccine, not Bharat Biotech, unfortunately. Nobody knows Bharat Biotech. Everybody knows co-vaccine. And I was looking at the US, why there was less vaccination in that US? 30%, 35% are not vaccinated. The reason I asked them simple question, because of the platform technology. Because of the platform technology, mRNA technology, people are hesitating what will have a long-term impact on the healthcare of the people. If pericarditis and myocarditis is causing, it may be suppressed, but will it happen anything in the long run? That was the only concern. Otherwise, Americans are very proactive for vaccination. Okay? Coming to my strategy, when I got into COVID issue, I only looked at it. India has to be there in the game. If we are not there in the game, we lose out and we will be dictated by others what will be the price of the vaccination. And India has to stand out like a nuclear war. Nuclear, we are in the nuclear block. We are also nuclear block, space mission. We are all in the game. In that same thing in the vaccine, is not the healthcare alone. It's a more of a national security. The economy of the country is controlled by that. It's not the healthcare alone. So I said India should be there. So when we did, looked at the platform, mRNA vaccine, we didn't have an access. And the number two vector-based vaccine, when we asked, everybody was to control the technology and control the technology. The third was the only one was the inactivated. So the question is, the vaccine is only one, three important factors, safety, safety, safety. The worst people to be vaccinated is adults. Children, you're all pediatrician. Any baby can be vaccinated. Baby will cry for two minutes. You distract them attention. But the, the worst people to be vaccinated again, VAPs. You vaccinate the VIPs, you are in trouble. And uh, you know, every time you'll be bothered with a lot of uh, adverse reactions. I looked at only one thing. What's the safety, safety, safety? And I looked second angle. You want IgG response or T cell response? Simple angle, simple questions and fundamental questions. So if you have IgG, you can increase IgG, but then it will drop significantly down. Body will not keep the IgG response. That is exactly what I predicted in uh, three years back it turned out to be mRNA vaccine, is the same thing. IgG goes high, after 25 days it drops down. And then again, you have to vaccinate. That's why the people are getting more infected. Uh, New Jersey, almost 35% of the people were again reinfected. After booster, two dose boosters, they got again reinfected with 35% of the people. So that means it clearly shows IgG can give response in the short run, but it drops. So then what you need is important T cell response. So what we need is aluminum hydroxide gel. It will give you IgG response, but not the T cell response. So we made a TLR agonist, which we licensed from NIH Washington. And I've added to that. And so that the, uh, the response from lymph, it goes to lymph node. When it goes to lymph node, you produce a T cell response. That's a trick we played. And that seems to be worked out very well. Safety is proven. The T cell response is good. And now it's showing the multi response. We looked at the now coming out nasal vaccine. The nasal is strategically, because the respiratory pathogen, you need more nasal sites to be protection. We are also coming with the rabies platform technology. Rabies, if you vaccinate with the COVID, you get vaccinated with the rabies also. Rabies is a shortage of supplies, because that is why we are not able to give it. But I looked at only one simple thing in the game. India, today at least I'm proud to say, we are the second largest clinical trial conducted next to US. US has done Pfizer and Moderna has done 36,000 people. We've done 27,000 people as a phase three trial, efficacy trial. Nobody, <laughs> next to US, India is the only country who has done the phase three efficacy trial. UK has done the efficacy, but they've done only 8,000 people, 3,000 in uh, uh, South Africa, 5,000 in uh, UK. So I think we've done the extremely good and we have 24 publications. We have more publications than the Pfizer and Moderna together. So that means we have shown scientific and peer reviewed and I think just got from NIV Pune, they told me our journals, we have got the highest impact factor in the COVID vaccine. 
you know, 202. That clearly shows that we proved the peer reviewed that India stands out in science. Why it is important? We to show that we are not another biogeneric country. We are copying GSK, we are copying a Sanofi. We don't want that strategy. We need to be innovative. And I think COVID was not an innovative, but at least we were in the game as the second country in the world to be along with the platform. Had we not had a COVID vaccine, today we would have been dictated by $20 a vaccine, $25 a dose vaccine. So in the geopolitics, it's a very strategically, nobody will give a share technology unless their country gets vaccinated. And I think that gain has changed with the co-vaccine. We put a pressure on the competition and liability issues, insurance, liability issues taken care of it because other companies dictate terms on the government on a liability insurance. And I think all that game changed with just one Indian company being there. And I think many technology like uh, uh, the mRNA vaccine, we need to watch and see the performance in the particular children. I think pediatricians more concerned. They have to be cautious about that, what uh, happens to the children's and the thing. Even vector-based vaccines, you have to be cautious because it can also cause clots. So need to be aware of it, what the platform. Coming to recombinant RBD, RBD region of Omicron is totally changed. That's why the monoclonal antibody given to the Delta variant is now not working for Omicron. So the entire region that has been raised monoclonal and Omicron, the RBD region is not working for RBD. So why I'm saying this simple bullet point is very important scientifically to think in your logic. Sorry, logically to think what the science go forward. But I can tell you one thing, India will innovate and we have one NTS project with the African project. We are doing a phase one completed in Baltimore in University of Maryland, phase one completed. Now we are taking phase two and three into the African countries. We have done more than 12 countries clinical trial in various platforms. So India is not Indian company anymore. We are moving to the clinical trial in various uh, countries and positioning aggressively. Today, I'm uh, happy to say rotavirus vaccine, almost 50% of the African countries are now using, turning to our uh, rotavac vaccine. So that means we are becoming an important player in the, both in Africa and Latin American country. India was importing. You know, when Sanjay invited me 22 years back in Novotel Hotel, I remember that was my first interaction of the IAP. I was not knowing what is IAP also. I came from US, I, I'm totally, in, ignorant of the whole IAP issue. Sanjay was the first one to invite me to Novotel Hotel, talk about vaccines. So I'm a baby at that time, honestly. Today I'm a 67 years old, but I was a baby at that time in the vaccine field. So I think I spoke and I think uh, Sanjay is still here. And I think uh, it matured as a science, uh, matured the science and the manufacturing. And I think uh, India will be an important player in a global scenario. And any future pandemic also happens will be much prepared than even other countries. And I think uh, that is what I'm going to say that what will come next pandemic. And I think you look at the food diagram, the animal side, if anything pandemic comes, the chicken, if it gets a pandemic, you will not eat the chicken. So the next pandemic will it be in the animal side. So one has to be look at even Omicron. My hypothesis is the Delta went to animal and came back to the human in a different form. And now this same Omicron goes to another animal, and if it comes back to the human, how it will come, we do not know. But I think that the science we are going, but I'm really grateful to all the pediatricians in this country who are encouraged, Indian, Indian companies were not believed in the before. You know, they always say the multinational was the innovators. And I think today we change, and I'm really grateful to all the pediatricians here who encouraged us that India can innovate. And uh, without your help, we would not succeed. Thank you. One, one secret I did in the last three years, when everybody was a TV channel, two minute TV channel, every uh, virologist getting into TV channel bashing on Indian company. Indian companies are easy for target, to attack. And uh, you know, the, all the press people, they all of them have taken Covaxin. And I asked them, why do you write against the Covaxin? They said, it's become a fancy for us because the highest Google search is Covaxin. So we have to write about Covaxin all the time. So that is uh, surprising to us. But I think what is important is I switched off the TV channel, I switched off the newspaper, I switched off my mobile phone. Three years, I didn't do anything, no communication. And I just mind what I can do for the country. I don't look at for myself, for company. My mother said, you have nine inches stomach. How much of money you make, you can't eat more than nine inches stomach. Okay, that's the life in the end. A lot of us, we may have money, but we can't eat more than anything what we have. Or we want to eat more also, you can't eat. Your health doesn't allow you. I think life becomes very simple in the end. And I think what is important is the country is important, country's prestige, country's uh, standing out in the innovation, the global map. 
is very important because if your children want to stay back in India, then we have to create ecosystems and to succeed Indian companies to succeed so that your children will stay back. Otherwise, we will not create an ecosystem. Thank you very much for giving opportunity. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, Dr. Krishna Ilagar, Dr. Krishna Ilagar, your uh, killed virus is in our body, sir. <laughs> in most of our colleagues' body, your killed virus is there. You made India pride, you made us pride, you made India pride, and uh, you, what our uh, Honorable Prime Minister Modi said, make in India, I think uh, you are the leader in that category. So with these few words, now, if you all, uh, I think you'll support with me that he deserves a standing ovation. May I request you all. This is our respect to our nation and to you, sir. Now we'll uh, invite our uh, president, elect Central IAP, Dr. Upendra Silvadika, sir. Please come on to the podium. A very good evening, friends. I respected all the dignitaries on the dais, of the dais. At the outset, my apologies for the delay because thanks to all the super VV VIPs in city of Hyderabad, I think the flight got delayed from Mumbai first for two hours and then got stuck at the traffic jam. But uh, I'm sure that this is a great event looking at the enthusiasm over here because this is not only the first zonal conference of Hyderabad, I'm seeing such a largely attended gathering in Central Zoom. So big round of applause for all the organizers for doing such great efforts. And, uh, this is my first maiden visit to the city of Hyderabad after the last elections. So it's my humble duty to express my gratitude and thanks to each one of you for posing faith in me by electing me as president-elect of Indian Academy of Pediatrics for the year 2022. Friends, as you know, IAP has these zonal conferences. Like every child is special for the parents, all zonal conferences are equally important. But the first child is special, so the first zonal conference becomes all the more special. So that's why I think that's such a huge gathering over here. And in fact, I was really impressed by the tagline or the theme of this conference, that is child-centered care in new era. Amazing. I was totally blown away while thinking about it on the way. What does it mean? That means all these years, probably, we were not doing everything, keeping that child in the center or in the prominent position while taking many of our decisions. And there are two important areas which I feel the child should be at the center. One is education and second is medical care. Education, forming a medical curriculum, the scholastic activities, physical exercises, is all different, not in the purview of IP. But still, IP makes it a point at least to be safeguarding the interest of the children while it, when it comes to the weight of the school bag or forming school canteen policies, so on and so forth. But more importantly, I felt that the health policies, we have all been healthcare-centered policies, and then we have not kept the child or family. Thanks to COVID, I think the world is going to be divided now. We were talking about pre-independence, post-independence. We were talking about pre-antibiotics, post-antibiotic. We were also talking about pre-digital and post-digital. For another at least a decade, I feel, world is going to talk about pre-COVID and post-COVID when it comes to anything. And so that's it. That definitely is a new era. And what you and I need to keep in mind, that we have to keep that family and that child in the center while taking any decisions. It's quite easy to form an infrastructure, to build a hospital, to buy equipments, but are we keeping the interest of the child in the center? What do I mean by that? Are we making everything very comfortable? Are we empowering the children and the families 
are we having that communication which is easily understandable so that kind of softness which we and along with us our staff need to take care about while giving that care to that tender little children i think all of us need to introspect but mind you the technology can be built but this humanity the humanness and that tender loving care to that children is equally important in fact utmost important so i thank this central zone scientific committee for coming out with theme i have already started thinking about how and which field can we have child centered care in the new era and i'm sure with the help of all of you and all my 36000 ipns we are all going to march ahead keeping this in mind in fact if you have observed last couple of years ip is changing its direction more towards community more towards families more towards children rather than just teaching each each one of us so i'm sure this is going to go a long way thank you very much again my best wishes for wonderful program i'm sure it the first day was great and it's equally important that second day scientific deliberations are going to be great my best wishes for this conference and happy learning for all of us thank you again thank you we welcome dr ramesh kumar our president central iap you are in time sir now sorry yeah now uh, we, we will release our uh, souvenir of uh, this conference and that would be released by our guest of honor dr uh, krishna ella and our president dr ramesh kumar i invite the souvenir committee headed by dr uh, satish ganta and uh, the dr surin is the editor and uh, he made this journal ready within 3 days he had put, put in all his efforts and he made it thank you dr sir thank you very much last speaker of the evening is none other than dr ramesh kumar our president central iap may i invite you sir on the podium please he had just now landed in uh, hyderabad but uh, looking very fresh and active ever <laughs> thank you sir yeah so thank you my dear friends for just putting it so far for me to be here and i'm so happy that i could make it in right on time with you to be in the inaugural function itself a uh, president of the central zone the president of the zone dr radha krishna uh, organizing chairpersons uh, dr ravi kumar and dr surendra nath the secretaries uh, both the paskers uh, dr sungoj paskar and uh, dr um, arkala paskar as well as the secretaries uh, dr pavan as well as uh, both the secretaries and dr sri krishna and the office bearers of the state branches representing central zone 
Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Chhattisgarh, as well as UP and MB, the executive board members from the three states, and my dears, Obis Beres and the Central IAP, my beloved team, my president elect, President Dr. Upendra, Secretary General Dr. Vinish Saxena, Dr. Samir Dalwai, our uh, treasurer, as well as all the, uh, the dignitaries and the chief guest here, Dr. Krishna Ella, sir, we are so happy that you are always there with us in all the functions and uh, we are truly blessed to have your presence here. And Dr. Ajok Bandari and other seniors and all the, I mean, I am not taking the names because I mean all of that, it's such a grand celebrity mela on the stage itself. And down here I can see Dr. Indra Shagar Rao, Dr. Ajay Kumar, Dr. Basavaraj and the EV members all the senior EV members, Sri Shailam and uh, Dr. Bagul Parekh, the digit, dig, uh, visionary digital IAP man, and all my dear friends in Central IAP, Dr. Lakshman and all seniors here, thank you very much. And once again, I'm so happy, I'm so proud and privileged to be there with you on this, uh, that this is the first Kosyonal conference for the year 2022. And that way itself, uh, this is uh, been a lot for us, all of us in Central IAP, where we, we could we see a, and Central Zone, uh, as I'm, I'm sure that this is going to be a blockbuster affair. Last two days, uh, we had a lot of uh, academics and a lot of scientifics on all sides. And we, as we have seen for the Gosha itself, many workshops which are well curated for the uh, scholars, uh, the PG students, as well as for the practitioners in all aspects. And as I did just and I heard uh, Vendra also talking about the theme. Uh, this was something which even captured the attention of all of our dear friends, child centered care for the, uh, for the new era. And CCC and even family centered care, child centered care, these are concepts which are really catching up. And I'm so happy that this team has, scientific team has taken this uh, wonderful concept ahead with the, the uh, child centered care for, the, uh, for this particular conference. and. Uh, and we have some more discussions on this particular theme tomorrow, the keynote address. And friends, uh, this is a great time where Central IAP is also uh, marching ahead with a uh, lot of uh, activities in the physical mode, face real-time contact for the year. We had the, in the ECD program for the last year where our beloved president, Dr. Piyush Gupta, I am earmarked on a I'm very, very innovative project, early childhood development. And we had the national NDEP program, the tuberculosis eradication program, running high in the, in the across the branches. And I'm so proud to say that we have finished almost 50% of the ECD and NTEP. Out of the 200 earmark workshops for NDEP, 200 earmarks for ECD, our team, especially Dr. Samir, Dr. Vini Saxena, have taken the initiative to finish 50%, almost 100 workshops are through this year itself. Hats off to our team. That's the commitment this team has taken up this year. And well, we are on the way. We have mar earmarked the dates. All the Sundays have been blocked for the next five months for ECD, NDEP, and IAP action plans. We believe me, friends, we have got 330 IAP action plan workshops for this year, physical itself. 13 physical modules are there. On all specialty, you touch anything. Everything is taken care. Gastro, endocrine, allergy, respiratory, infectious disease, fever. Everything is perinatology. Everything is taken care. We have got workshops to the tune of, every workshop is sponsored to the tune of one lakh. So 330 workshops, 3.3 CR projects are there. On the other side, NDEP around four CR projects, ECD another three, so IAP is really looking ahead for this year with all the workshops completed. And well ahead, Ubendra has taken the pledge to continue all these workshops, whatever is remaining for the year 2023 itself. So that way, the real-time real physical workshops are very much on the anvil, and every Sunday, for the, every IAPN is actually booked for a physical program. And we have, out of the 340 branches, almost 320 has been already been touched by the workshops. So reaching the unreached has been my, the project of my the Secretary General also. So we need has taken that much care to see that. And our action plan coordinator, Dr. Sandor Sons, and as well as Rujira, Dr. Skamath, they have taken the pains to see that every branch is represented this year in the IAP map, in the IAP workshop map of this year. And from the action plan side also, we are having the under five mortality rate project being kicking very well with the government of India and even with the UNICEF. 
we heard the, the only leaves extended from Ulysses of in Uttar Pradesh, where we had the deputy chief minister himself being there present for the project. And UNICEF was recently ag again taken, reached to IAP with around 40 lakhs project for taking up the in, U U5MR, under 5 mortality project in Uttar Pradesh. So Uttar Pradesh very well is in central zone. I congratulate my friends in Uttar Pradesh, especially Dr. Alka Agarwal, Dr. Sanjay Niranjan, Dr. P. Ali, and all others for, take, for reaching out to that level. And I am I'm sure that Uttar Pradesh is showing the way for this year, being the most, the, con the state in the Hindi heartlands, the, with the, max, the most popular state is in IAP also, Uttar Pradesh is showing the lead and with Dr. Vineet Sakshana there, it's going to the, taking IAP to the big stages this year on the political front also. So friends, this is the good time for uh, where all of you should really be proud and this really goes to the, 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 the advocacy, the prescription, the, the capacity and the involvement of 38,000. I must correct, Uvendra, you said 36,000. We are 37,600 now. So I heard you saying 36. No, we, every year we are counting 1,000, 1,000 plus. So plus next year it may be, you may have to say 40,000 sometimes. So we are going ahead, 37,800 is the greatest number. You must really give a good clap to our members. Every month we are coming up by around 200 numbers every month. So it's a time when our youngsters are really marching ahead to join IAP. They not, no way, now the, maybe 10 to 15 years back, a postgraduate used to join IAP falls by around the age of 40 years only. So at that time, we used to say you are IAP by 45. So now I believe you are IAP should be pushed down to 35. Because people now, I know from my institute itself, those who have just come out after 26, 27 years, they are joining IAP, very eager to join IAP. So that shows how much we have marched ahead, how much we have gone into the hearts of the pediatricians and the fraternity. Well, it's the only thing what we lack right now is the public visibility. We have to go to the public. Indian Medical Association, Indian Dental Association, they are all being talked about everywhere. But we talk about so much about IAP in our fold. But even in my hospital, people doesn't know outside what is IAP. They, they don't. Now, because of, since I am there, they may know IAP, IAP. Okay, the, but maybe in my family, they may know about it. Outside, it's not here. So it's high time we should go to the community. We are embarking on many projects. And of, I believe with, the, with the, our involvement with the government of India, our involvement with the Women and Child Development Ministry, with Ms. Madam Smriti Rani, Mr. Mansur Mandeviaji, and other ministries coming up. And we have got a lot of helping hands from the ministry, government of India, ministry, the ministerial level. Uh, so we really look forward to much more involvement, being better heard in the public. And I, I must really be happy that we recently also I was um, approached and our Dr. Bagul Parekh and others from the International Pediatric Association in the, or in to, to Congress 2023 is coming up. So that could be the best time when IAP has to go into the, into the public in a big way. I am sure Dr. Bagul will be very happy to uh, be leading from the front for the great team. So friends, it's great time and I am so happy that Central Zone under the leadership of Dr. Um, Radha Krishna, Dr. Ravi Kumar, Dr. all the leaders here, Dr. Sudendranath and um, all the past guys, Dr. C. Krishna, uh, Dr. Ma um, Malesh, as well as Dr. Indrashekar Rao, Dr. Um, uh, Krishna Murthy, Dr. Sridhar, all the committee in the Dr. Hima Bindu, all are with the uh, our, uh, executive board members in the Telangana, Sri Shailam, as Vijay Kumar, and uh, as well as Dr. Um, uh, 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 the, the executive board members here, as well as Dr. Ashwant, who is the president elect, and all the team from PATS, as well as Telangana. Congratulations again to the great team. And once again, my hearty gratitude to Dr. Krishna um, for making it with uh, IAP. My greetings and uh, my best wishes to one, each one of you for a great time in the, that is enjoy the post-COVID era. And we are so happy that our practice is also picked up in a big way. So we are all busy and we are all on one side, our practice has picked up, our academy is picking up, everything is now rocking. So let's rock this way out for the next seven months. Once again, my best wishes, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your honorable message to the pediatricians gathered here. I acknowledge the presence of Dr. Alok Bandari, our Giant Secretary, National uh, Central IAP on the stage. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, friends, dignitaries on the dais and off the dais. And I'll speak something off the track. I'll just say that traditionally, doctors have been leaders of the society. Since time immemorial, Raj Vaidya was the most important person in any Raja's 
institution. So same way doctors are, we are the leaders of the society and it is our responsibility, we owe it to the society to give back. And amongst the doctors, pediatricians are the cream of the society, pedi medical college. In all the classes you see the toppers always branch out to pediatrics. So what essentially IAP is a congregation of elite and super elite filtered pure gray matter masses. But here I want to appeal that we are lacking in our numbers. All the people who are in pediatric practice must join IAP. So I request all of you to please join and persuade that IAP is there. International Pediatric Association is coming to India in the form of a big IPA conference after 50 years. Last we had in 74, none of us attended that, I think. And next, if we have after 50 years, again, none of us will be attending. So I request all of you to please come to uh, Ahmedabad and let us join IPA in big numbers. Thank you, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we are coming to the end of the program. Uh, we have few felicitations because they deserve them. Uh, first and foremost, We'll invite our uh, guest of honor, thunder of the evening, Dr. Sri Krishna Elagaru. Please, 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 sir. Yeah. There is a demand from there is a demand from the audience. Now I invite uh, Dr. Ramesh Kumar, President, Central AAP. Please, uh, we'll, we'll try to... Uh, we are running out of time. I request Dr. Uh, Ramesh Kumar, sir. Dr. Ramesh Kumar, sir. I invite uh, Dr. Dinesh, since Dr. Ramesh is uh, not here, I invite Dr. Dinesh on behalf of uh, Rainbow Hospital. Please, Dr. Dr. Dinesh. Dr. Dinesh. Yeah, please. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Kinjwadikar. Please move on fast, please. 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 Okay. Now I invite Dr. Dinesh. Yeshwan. 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 Dr. Dinesh. Yeshwan. Yeshwan. Now I request
Dr. Abhinay from Kims. If he's not there, I invite Dr. Farag Dikate. Yeah. Yeah, I invite Dr. Dandraj from Paramita Hospital. Dr. Dandraj. Yeah, please. Dr. Dandraj. Now we, you know, I invite Dr. Krishna Prasad from Ankur Hospital. Dr. Kundaridi, please. Kundaridi. Now, now, now I met Dr. Sanjay Sri Rampur. Our, uh, please. Dr. Vinit Saxena. Now I invite Dr. Vinit Saxena, our Honorary Secretary General. Dr. Vinit Saxena, Honorary Secretary General. Now I invite Dr. Samir Dalwai, our treasurer. Dr. Samir Dalwai. Dr. Usharani? Yeah, you here, Dr. Usharani. Our uh, scientific committee chairperson, Dr. Usha Kumar. Yeah, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Murli, the ready, please. Please, Dr. Murli, the ready. Dr. Murli, the ready, President, IAP Andhra Pradesh. Thank you. 
Now I invite our legend, who is none other than Professor Dr. Indrashekar Rao. He is the convener of ACVIAP, IAP, the most coveted, most, uh, most uh, honored post of uh, Central IAP. First time from Telangana and Andhra to become the convener of ACVIAP. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for accepting our uh, felicitations. Now I request Dr. RSV to say a word of thanks. Dr. Sri Krishna is our uh, joint organizing secretary. Over to RSV. Thank you. A big, big thanks to... A big thank you to all the dignitaries on stage, our chief guest, Dr. Ramesh Kumar, President IAP 2022, the President-elect, Honorary Secretary General, Joint Secretary, Treasurer, the Central IAP EB members of all the five states, President, Treasurer, Secretary of all the five states, the EB members of Telangana, EB members of IAP Twin Cities branch, along with the incredible support from all the delegates. Thank you. Thank you all for gracing this occasion and making the inaugural event a success. Thank you.
Give it another one. come here in the front so that you can also enjoy this beautiful evening. I can see the excitement here in the room. <laughs> so, Dhananjay Garu, please. So I think the room will also settle down only when they start listening to the singers now. <laughs> so what we can do is, till the time, I want everyone here present in the room. Can you hear me? Everyone, can you hear me? Yes, you're the only one who can hear me. 
Okay. So before I call the very talented singers here onto this stage, what I really want. So we're going to start with the original RD Parman team. As mentioned, Mr. Thakur Singh is on the saxophone. Mr. Prem Verma is on the guitar, is the guitarist for this evening. And the very talented band is here who are going to play the lovely melodious numbers for you all. Ladies and gentlemen, music as told by the very famous Greek philosopher Plato is that music is a moral law. It gives soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to our imagination, charm to sadness, and life to everything which we do. So on this note, I would love to start this beautiful evening with our band. I want you all to please make some noise for our band. Come on, give a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. So, all yours.
musical legends. So ladies and gentlemen, before I call the very melodious voice here on stage, आपके लिए कुछ है जरा एक बार इशियात कर दीजिए कम ऑन तुझे मोहब्बत करना नहीं आता तुझे मोहब्बत करना नहीं आता मुझे मोहब्बत के सिवा कुछ नहीं आता एक बार जोरदार वाह वाह तो कीजिए तुझे मोहब्बत करना नहीं आता मुझे मोहब्बत के सिवा कुछ नहीं आता जिंदगी जीने के सिर्फ दो तरीके हैं एक तुझे नहीं आता एक मुझे नहीं आता लेस एंड जेंटमेंट विद दिस आई वुड लाइक टू कॉल द सेलिब्रिटी सिंगर हु हैज अ मेलोडियस वॉइस हु कैन सिंग रेट्रो रोमांटिक टॉलीवुड डू यू वांट मी टू कॉल हिम ऑन स्टेज यस यस और नो सो लेट मी कॉल विद योर राउंड ऑफ अप्लॉज धनंजय Good evening, all of you. Hello, all. How are you? I hope you all are very busy. I know. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, doctors are always special to all of us. You are like angels. So I would. I, I have sung a beautiful song in Sare Nodu movie. I'm a Telugu playback singer. Uh, I would like to dedicate my, that song to all of you, and it is a Malay song. You all are amelis to all of us. I heard that so many singers are there here. Can you raise your hands? Oh, so many are there. Okay, let's warm up our voice first. Okay, you have to sing with me. Okay, first start. Gama pa. Let's let, 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 let me let hear your voice. Dava ma. Some more voice. Gamale mere sa. Wow. Beautiful. Oh yeah.
How many Hindi listening people are there here? Okay. Okay. Janam, 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 saath chal na yuhi Kasam tumhe kasam na ke mil na yuhi Ek jahe bhale do badan ho juda Meri ho ke hume shahi rehe na kabhi na kehe na alvida Meri suba Singers, singers are there, I know. Can you please sing with me? Undi porade, gunde ni dele. Amma ye te nila hunda 
I will sing a wonderful dance number. Are you guys ready to dance with me? Okay. This song is, uh, I have sung this, they have sung this song from the movie uh, Gopala Gopala. Tell us this song. Then step first, you have to identify the song, okay? What song is this? Srivali, na? Bajay Bajay? Yes, you are correct. Okay, now, Chalaman singer Sunna Rani, or Parat Lady Nato. La 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 Yes. 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 Andaru churan daya chupis thalu ye dolila Alale ala, ayanand lala Adala ile sado kola tala kola kola Mandiram cutting the Yapu, Niki Veda, Manchita Yala Chala Chala.
ఎనర్జీరు <laughs> మై సెల్ఫ్ సిమ్రన్ 
आप सबके लिए कुछ डांसिंग नंबर्स लेकर आई हूँ उम्मीद करती हूँ आप सबको पसंद आए एंड प्लीज आई वॉन्ट यू ऑल ऑन दी डांस फ्लो प्लीज चलिए so much thank you so much everyone come on everyone make some noise we have your favorite tracks coming ladies and gentlemen if you have any request and you want us to play that for you this evening you can please let us know and we'll play that for you all sure hello तू जानू मानू जो कहता है बेबी तेरी हो लगता है सामने मेरे सामने मैं सामने सामने 
Hello, hello. Hi everyone, good evening. I can see you're all enjoying this evening. You're all in good mood and you're all waiting to dance, right? Okay, I'll give you a few minutes time to warm up and come to the dance floor.
शुक्रिया करूं मेहरबानी दोस्तों जिंदगी हसीन है मगर सिर्फ उनके लिए जो जीना चाहते हैं क्योंकि प्यार करने वाले जानते हैं कि आन बान शान से जीना किसे कहते हैं है ना जवानी चांद में हसीन दिल रुबा मिले को दिल जवा निसार हो गया जवानी चांद में हसीन दिल रुबा मिले को दिल जवा निसार हो गया शिकार खुद यहाँ शिकार हो गया ये क्या सितम हुआ ये क्या जुलम हुआ ये क्या सितम हुआ ये कैसे कब हुआ न जानू मैं न जाने वो जवानी चांद में हसीन मिले तो दिल जवा निसार हो गया
जवान जान मन हसीन दिल रहा मिले तो कर जवान शिकार खुद यहाँ शिकार हो गए Now, 
let me Pass call it. Super, me call. Yeah. one of the okay, melodious, fabulous singer here on stage, Ramana Garu. Please, okay, sir, okay, sir. Ramana Garu, okay, sir, get to the chapat landi. Everyone, please make some noise for Mr. Ramana. Anni Bhartam, this dance floor is the youngest of the youngsters, the teenagers, and all of them. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Sir, 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 Mutya malle merci boye malle moka har mutt kunte murs kunta anta sikka mabbe masake sindile ko gaman che tera gal sindile uru nidaro sindile manchi sote manaku dar kindile mabbe masake Gaman ke tera gaal zindile, please come forward to the dance floor. Kuri se san na divana, sali sali gaun na dilona. Kuri se san na divana. Sali sali ga unda dilona, dubla utunde kundello na, jaragana pancham ni naragana pancham, sali ki talalu pancham ni vali dula pancham, vechha ga unda mu. Jai Bhagavan, 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 Jai Bhagavan,
పొద్దుగల పొద్దుగల్ల ఎవరి మగం చూశాను పొద్దుగల పొద్దుగల్ల ఎవరి మగం చూశాను పొలమును దొంగుతుంటే మైసమ్ము మైసమ్మ అరే పొలము దొంగుతుంటేనే మైసమ్మ నాకు బంగారం దొరికే నేను పొలము దొంగుతుంటేనే మైసమ్మ నాకు బంగారం దొరికేనే మైసమ్మ ఓ మైసమ్మ నన్ను పరిచయం చేసి నన్ను గాబరబెట్టి గాయలు గాకే మైసమ్మ చాలా పరిచయం చెయ్యకే మైసమ్మ మాయాదారి మైసమ్మ మైసమ్మ మనం మైసారం బోదామే మైసమ్మ అరే బండి బాయ బస్సు బాయ రేణి గుంటరేలు బాయ్ బండి బాయ బస్సు బాయ్ రేణి గుంటరేలు బాయ్ మళ్ళీ తిరిగి చూడబోతే గాలి మోడరెల్లి బాయ్ మళ్ళీ తిరిగి చూడబోతే గాలి మోడరెల్లి కోడి బాయ్ అరే కోడి బాయ్ అరే కోడి బాయ్ లక్ష్మది కోడి పుండు బాయ్ లక్ష్మది అరే కోడి బాయ్ లక్ష్మది కోడి పుండు బాయ్ లక్ష్మది లక్షన్న దారిలో నలంబాడి లాదబాయ్ లక్షన్న దారిలో నలంబాడి లాదబాయ్ దిగులాడి సంతలో నా పోతని గడి ఆడబాయ్ దిగులాడి సంతలో నా పోతని గడి ఆటల గట్టుబాయ బుట్టబాయి ఎలమదోల మందబాయ్ గట్టుబాయ బుట్టబాయ్ ఎలమదోల మందబాయ్ మళ్ళీ తిరిగి చూడబోజ గాలి మోటరల్లి బాయ్ తిరిగి చూడబోతే గాలి మోటరెల్లి కోడి బాయ్ అరే కోడి బాయ్ లక్ష్మది కోడి పుంజు బాయ్ లక్ష్మది అరే కోడి బాయ్ లక్ష్మది కోడి పుంజు బాయ్ లక్ష్మది అరే కోడి బాయ్ లక్ష్మది కోడి పుంజు బాయ్ లక్ష్మది కోడి పుంజు బాయ్ లక్ష్మది కోడి పుంజు బాయ్ లక్ష్మది committee members can we can we have you here on the stage please please attention one telangana song one minute one minute galgal chappulu galgal chappulla e ravika gal vere unnu andar telangana enjoy chestaru Good morning to all. One minute, one minute. Galgal chappul, start day. Galgal chappul, gajul jesta ne rango rango.
Check. Lungi dance. I know you don't have lungi, but you have to dance. <laughs> okay. Come on, everyone. You're on the dance floor. Mucho ko thoda round guma ke, anna je je sha sha sma laga ke. कोकोनट में लस्सी मिला के आ जाओ सारे मूड बना के पूछो को थोड़ा राउंड घुमा के अन्ना के जैसा चश्मा लगा के कोकोनट में लस्सी मिला के आ जाओ सारे मूड बना के ऑल द रजनी फैंस डोंट मिस 
अरे भंग का रंग जमा हो चका चक फिर लो पान चबाए अरे ऐसा छटका लगे जी आप पुनर्जन्म हो जाए ओ कई के पान बना रस वाला ओ कई के पान बना रस वाला चाहे बंद अकल का जाला ओ कई के पान बना रस डाला खुल जाए बंद अकल का डाला फिर तो ऐसा करे कमाल सीधी कर दे गल की काल ओ छोरा गंगा किनारे वाला ओ छोरा गंगा किनारे वाला ओ कई के पान बना रस वाला खुल जाए बंद अकल का डाला राम दुहाई कैसे चक्कर में पड़ गए हाय 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 कहाँ टांग फसाई मैं तो सूली पे चढ़ गए हाय हाय कैसा सीधा सादा मैं कैसा बोला बाला हाँ हाँ और कैसा सीधा सादा मैं कैसा बोला बाला जाने कौन करे में पड़ गए पड़े लिखो से पाला मीठी चूरी से
అడుగుతున్నారు చాలా సంప్రదాయమైన భక్తి గీతం మీ అందరి కోసం ఒక భక్తి గీతం పాడాలనుకుంటున్నాను ఈ భక్తి గీతం పాడాలంటే అందరు రింగులు తిరగాలన్నమాట అరే పొడుస్తున్న పొత్తు మీద నడుస్తున్న కాలమా పోరు తెలంగాణమా పొడుస్తున్న పొత్తు మీద నడుస్తున్న కాలమా పోరు తెలంగాణమా పోరు తెలంగాణమా కోట్లాది ప్రాణమా పోరు తెలంగాణమా కోట్లాది ప్రాణమా అరే పొడుస్తున్న పొత్తు మీద నడుస్తున్న కాలమా పోరు తెలంగాణమా పోరు తెలంగాణమా పోరు కాని ప్రాణమా చల్ ప 
పక్కన పట్టాది లేదు చూడాలి పిల్ల నాది నకిలీ సుగులు నీ పక్కన పట్టాది లేదు చూడమే పిల్ల నాది నకిలీ సుగులు పక్కన పట్టాది లేదు నీ బాబాగారు వచ్చేటి వేళ నీకు బంతి పూలు తెచ్చేటి तुझे मालूम नहीं तू अभी तक है हसी और मैं जवा तुझे कुर्बान मेरी जान मेरी जान मेरी जान सभी तुझे मालूम नहीं तू अभी तक है हसी और मैं जवा तुझे कुर्बान मेरी जो तुझ में है कहीं नहीं दिलों को जीतने का फन जो तुझ में है कहीं नहीं ये शौकिया ये बात फन जो तुझ में है कहीं नहीं दिलों को जीतने का फन जो तुझ में है कहीं नहीं मतरी मतरी आप में पा गया दो जहा मतरी मतरी आप में पा गया दो जहा मेरी जोर जबी तुझे मालूम नहीं तू अभी तक है सियाल में जवा कुछ में तेरी बात मेरी जान मेरी जान Oh, 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 oh,
मनमद राजा मनमद राजा पकड़ो मीता बुना दे बन्ने लुबे सी कंधला तोटी कत्ती मुदेरी बच्चा दे नी पट्टी नारा ले भाई पच्ची ने दाल तो किच्चे किच्चे इता कुड़ता दे नी पच्ची ने दाल तो पच्ची के दाल भाई ती ये ती इता कुड़ता दे मनमद राजा हे मनमद राजा हे मनमद राजा गाजवाग बिल्ला में गाजलो लगा दा गाजवाग बिल्ला में गाजलो लगा दा हर गाजवाग बिल्ला में गाजलो लगा दा नीचे ही साँप ले दा नीचे ही साँप ले दा माँ का जो तोड़ दे दा गाजवाग Ranu ranu tu ne sinna do, sinna do. Naun aur chudi bache sinna do, sinna de. Adha tan tu ne gorna do, gorna do. Adha tu bache na pilla do, pilla de. Adha bata man tu ne pilla do, pilla do. Adha tu bache na pilla de, pilla de. Ranu ranu. Tulu bala mu se tapati, chuchu le bala lu mana gati. Tulu bala mu se tapati, chuchu le bala lu mana gati. Nu pe ta puli, nu pe ta puli, nu pe ta puli ne ki na bolyo. Gandhi pe ta gandhi ne samno, nu pe ta puli ne ki na bolyo. Gandhi pe ta gandhi ne samno. Tulu bala mu se tapati, chuchu le bala lu mana gati. Tulu bala mu se tapati, chuchu le bala lu mana gati. Nu pe ta puli, nu pe ta puli, nu pe ta puli ne ki na bolyo. Gandhi pe ta gandhi ne samno. ऐसा राधंते विजयलक्ष्मी करो, ये लिंदु के राधंते, ये लम्ता कोड़ा, कुर्रालो, ये कुर्रालो, बिरे
for the beautiful ladies out here only they are going to dance please come please come
చాలా కష్టపడి డాన్స్ చేసి అలిసిపోయారు కదా మీరు అంతా కూడా ఐ నో యు ఆల్ ఆర్ టైర్డ్ సో ఎస్ అఫ్ కోర్స్ యు ఆర్ ఆల్ యూత్ దట్స్ వై వి శాంగ్ కుర్రాలో కుర్రాలు సార్ మీకు కొంచెం రిలాక్స్ అయ్యారు కాబట్టి ఒక మెలడీ సాంగ్ ఒక ఇళయరాజా గారి సాంగ్తో తర్వాత మళ్ళీ అదే ఊపి కంటిన్యూ చేద్ద